Blackstone Audio presents Moral Combat Good and Evil in World War II by Michael Burley Preface and Acknowledgements A friend once said that a moral history of the Second World War would be brief, unaware perhaps of the literatures devoted to just war, war crimes, humanity and warfare, and so forth, many of which deal with that vast conflict in a substantial way. As it happens, this book is surprisingly long, even though I have omitted several themes about which I wrote earlier books, notably on medical ethics, euthanasia, and Nazi racism. This is not another history of the Nazis, on whom there are so many books. It may help to explain what moral combat seeks to do. Historians can be territorial about others interloping into their discipline, even as they gaily plunder everything from anthropology via literary criticism to social psychology. While two philosophers, Jonathan Glover and Svetan Todorov, unwittingly planted the idea for this book, it is not a work of moral philosophy, nor, it should be said, a work either of international law or of military history. Building on work I did fifteen years ago, it is about the prevailing moral sentiment of entire societies and their leaderships, and how this changed under the impact of both ideology and total war, as well as what might be called the moral reasoning of individuals who were not as rigorous as professional philosophers, but who had to make choices under circumstances difficult to imagine. Modern government is not like the Tudor England portrayed in Robert Bolt's 1960s drama A Man for All Seasons. Complex modern economies determine who wins or loses in ways that were inconceivable in the 16th century. Although I certainly do not underrate the ability of key individuals to make fateful choices, especially when they are drained in mind and body rather than fresh as Larry, wherever possible I have tried to avoid the set-piece great man agonizing of a Heisenberg, Oppenheimer, Pius XII, or Speer, which so tantalizes dramatists, writing for the edification of audiences unwilling to see beyond the particular. There is also the matter of moral judgment. A lawyer or philosopher would write a different, perhaps more prescriptive book, using the past to dictate present or future conduct under the guise of writing about history. This book is different in that it deals with on-the-spot behavior, rather than how these things look in armchair hindsight. It may seem desirable in retrospect, righteously to lament the Allies' failure to track down Nazi or Japanese war criminals. But those who had been through five years of death and destruction tended not to see it that way, and were sickened by the thought of more of it. How one estimates that choice is irrelevant. It is what happened— partly in order to integrate Germany and Japan into Cold War alliances. My endeavor is emphatically one of history, which means that it has few recipes for future conduct, beyond those so platitudinous that they require scant reiteration like don't vote for extremist parties or invest hope in the rationality of mad dictators. This also means that any quasi-judicial commentary, of the kind judges dispense as they hand down sentences on convicted criminals, has been avoided. This is inessential to a book that does not confuse morals, study of historical phenomena like battles, emotions, field systems, tax records, or water mills, with the separate activity of moralizing. The latter as a friend once wrote, is to morality what artiness is to art, religiosity to religion, and sentimentality to sentiment. I have tried to make this book as detached as possible. It is not a work of moralizing enthusiasm. All of us would like to believe that we could not do some of the things, major or minor, by commission or omission, described in this book. We should all reflect whether this would have been the case had we been responsible adults living in the belligerent nations of the time. How many of us would press for sanctions while knowing they aren't going to work, or counsel radical military action without thinking through the human as well as geostrategic consequences? What actually impresses is that, in circumstances where the temptation to inhumanity must have been overpowering, 
a vestigial regard for decent or lawful conduct survived at all. Warfare among savages is often relatively less bloody because of its agnostic or ritualistic element of posturing. There is a lot of drumming, stamping, and shouting, but not much blood is spilled, at least if we discount the Aztecs. Since ancient and medieval times, civilized men have endeavored to mitigate the effects of war, notably through doctrines of just war, all ably expounded in a thoughtful book by Charles Guthrie and Michael Quinlan. These doctrines consisted of a series of injunctions about the lawful authorization of armed conflict and the relationship between ends and means, together with the need to exercise humanity, discrimination, and proportionality while waging war. These religious and philosophical exhortations often gelled with the severely practical outlook of warriors on ancient, medieval, or early modern battlefields, who knew that getting a substantial ransom was better than having a dead prisoner. Throughout, however, there was an extreme alternative, of war ad Romanum, where the enemy and his population could be enslaved and killed, allegedly in line with what was thought to be ancient Roman practice. Sometimes, in the Middle Ages, a red banner would be flown to indicate that chivalric norms were cancelled, and that the type of war visited on infidels or rebels would ensue. As an excellent collection of essays, edited by Michael Howard and others, reveals, even by the mid-seventeenth century, men-at-arms knew what constituted decent practice in warfare. While I do not think any war has ever been good, the Second World War, which killed fifty-five million people, was a necessary war against at least one regime which, uniquely, modernized barbarism into an industrial process, and another that visited cruelty and savagery on the many peoples of East Asia, from the Chinese to indigenous tribes on remote Pacific islands. That does not diminish the war against Italian fascist imperialism, or the moral problems raised by the Western alliance of desperation with the Soviet Union, which imposed communist tyranny on half of liberated Europe. Nor does it seek to excuse allied war crimes, although those should not be elided with what are uncharmingly called collateral casualties, which were not the objectives of an operation. To construe the D-Day landings as anything other than a noble enterprise, which the vast majority of French people welcomed, because various Allied bombardments killed tens of thousands of their compatriots, seems perverse. The British cabinet had grave reservations about this, but when they consulted the free French general Pierre Koenig, he replied that lives are lost in any war, and this was the price to be paid for liberation of his country. Around the margins there have been attempts to revise our general perceptions of the conflict. Some conservatives claim that Britain and the U.S. should have let Hitler and Stalin slog it out so that the victor, assuming they both did not lose, would have been too exhausted to take over either the whole or half of the European mainland. This line of argument reflects mutual Anglo-American animosities, to the effect that Churchill and Roosevelt somehow tricked the U.S. into war against Germany, or that the war's ultimate beneficiaries were the Soviets and the Americans, who liquidated the British Empire and dominated a divided Europe. It also adopts a narrowly strategic view of the issues involved, taking realism to the level of amoralism. Now, while I have sympathy with the view that in some foreign policy circles it is always 1938, with even clowns like Venezuela's president Hugo Chavez compared with Hitler, this argument ignores the existential threat Nazism posed to the human spirit as a whole. Was our rich civilization supposed to culminate in that abnegation of everything decent, humane, or joyous in our condition, ushering in an era of heroic scientizing barbarity? Given Hitler's fanatic volatility, it is also unlikely that he would have left the Anglo-Saxons alone, once he had secured mastery of the Soviet Union up to the Urals. As this book tries to show, the Nazis and their partners in crime— tried fundamentally to alter the moral understanding of humanity in ways that deviated from the moral norms of Western civilization. They did this by locating their murderous depredations beyond law, but within a warped moral framework that defined their purifying violence 
as necessary and righteous. While this strategic revisionism reflects an extreme isolationist agenda, a more pervasive fear of armed force has resulted in a dubious moral relativism, exemplified by Nicholson Baker's pacifist tract, Human Smoke, in which all belligerents were as bad as one another. Human smoke involves cutting, pasting, and juxtaposing random snippets of historical evidence to insinuate this conclusion, generally impressing critics who have no knowledge of what they are reviewing. He implies that because Churchill may have drunk too much, or because Eleanor Roosevelt was an anti-Semitic snob in her youth, they were on a par with a dictator who murdered six million Jews. The leaders of the English-speaking democracies allegedly went to war to benefit a sinister arms-manufacturing military-industrial complex, a view which much appealed to extreme U.S. isolationists in the 1930s, and which resonates with the international left nowadays. This exercise in extreme moral relativism and crude conspiracy theory is sometimes excused on the grounds that the author is a novelist, daringly experimenting with forms that resemble a child's scrapbook. In reality, any half-competent historian would have no difficulty assembling a small book in which Hitler appeared to be defending German human rights, or a directory of every leading Nazi's best Jewish friends. This would be meaningless as history, which involves evaluating complex streams of evidence in their overall context, and then exercising discrimination and taste regarding events and persons. For rather more local reasons, some German historians are bent on inculpating Allied bomber crews in war crimes by the not very subtle method of allowing the German terminology of mass murder to leach into this context. Japanese conservatives have for a long time practiced what they call anti-masochistic history, which insists that from 1931 to 1945 Japan sought to liberate Asia and the Asians from European colonialism, when in fact they enslaved them. Partly for these reasons, I find myself defending the Allied war effort, whatever reservations one may have about the conduct of the Soviets. Some patriotic myths are not only useful, but true. So were the virtues which accompanied them. These issues are not easy, and all I have tried to do is provide a rough map through intractable terrain, which others may wish to pursue with greater refinement. I have never got the hang of employing research assistants. However, at an advanced stage, Hugh Bichonneau offered to check facts, and to help unravel some of the more tortuous sentences. This editorial work proved incredibly helpful especially since he is a bona fide military historian who knows more about TMPFFGGH than I ever will do, even though my late father was a wing commander in the wartime RAF. That's trim, mixture, pitch, fuel, flaps, gills, gyro, and hydraulics for fellow non-initiates. I am privileged to be one of the foreign members of the Academic Advisory Board of the Institut für Zeitgeschichte in Munich, Germany's leading contemporary history research center, where doctors Johannes Hörte and Christian Hartmann kindly kept me abreast of their important researches on the German army. The admirable Professor James Kurth of the U.S. Naval War Academy reminded me not to neglect the Navy, though I may not have done it justice. I have benefited from the suggestions of George Walden, Max Hastings, and Frederick Raphael. Max let me have an advanced draft of his book on Churchill and probed me with an embarrassing range of interesting questions which I struggled to answer. George gave me his book on morality and foreign policy, which became a model of how to approach these issues. Freddie kept up a running correspondence on appeasement with a sort of bracing ferocity. From the Academy I received some very useful bibliographical recommendations, from Professors Christopher Coker, Robert Jellatley, and David Stafford. The staff at both the Imperial War Museum and the London Library helped find materials that were relevant to the book. Arabella Pike, Annabel Wright, Helen Ellis, Peter James, and Tim Duggan at Harper Collins have my gratitude for making my last four books happen smoothly on both sides of the Atlantic, as does my agent, Andrew Wiley, to whom I return un abraccio. James Pullen has been an exceptionally good point man in dealing with foreign publishers. 
This is the fifth book Peter James has fine-tuned with his characteristic attention to detail. Kathy Arrington expertly found some arresting illustrations. Last but not least, I owe so much to my adorable wife, Lyndon, who has successfully created an environment in which I can do this work over sustained periods. Sadly, after enriching my understanding of the imaginative literature of this period, my dear friend Adolf Wood died before seeing many of his suggestions in print. I wrote this book a few hundred yards from the rectory where Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery grew up. It is separated by a road from the park where on 15 October 1940 over a hundred Londoners were killed when their waterlogged trench shelters took a direct Luftwaffe hit. This bomb was one of the 2,500 which rained down on Lambeth to cut bridges and railway lines across the Thames, but which damaged or destroyed four-fifths of housing stock, too. In the wake of this single incident, only forty-five bodies were recovered intact. The remains of the rest are still under the park. The railings around the adjacent junction are made from steel stretchers kept for such an eventuality, although the underground station was being used to store barbed wire rather than as a shelter. They are a tangible reminder of the Second World War, not as patriotic myth, but as grim reality, as much for so many civilians as the uniformed combatants. Michael Burley, Kensington, September 2009 Chapter 1 The Predators 1. New Roman Empire Europe's newly wrought post-war frontiers were first breached by the aging poet Gabriele D'Annunzio, a flamboyant icon of Italian nationalism, when he seized the Adriatic city of Fiume. Fiume had been part of the multinational Austro-Hungarian Empire before the Great War, but its status had been left undefined in the post-war settlement negotiated at Versailles. It remained a predominantly Italian outpost, set amid a Slavic sea, and was salt in the wound of what the Italian nationalists called a mutilated victory, their beggar's reward for belatedly joining the Entente side, in 1915. On 12 September 1919, D'Annunzio arrived overland at the head of 120 war veterans, whom he called his legionnaires, to forestall U.S. President Woodrow Wilson's wish to designate Fiume a free city. The local contingent of Allied occupation troops, under the command of an Italian officer, tamely surrendered the city to D'Annunzio. The seizure of Fiume resonated among the Italian population, and the radical party government of Francesco Nitti in Rome judged it prudent to acquiesce in the spectacle of the old poet and his volunteer band endeavoring to rewrite Europe's post-war settlement. D'Annunzio sought to refashion the lives of the 50,000 inhabitants of Holocaust City, as he dubbed his new domain. He addressed admiring crowds from a balcony, crowds which bade, Anoe, the world belongs to us, or the meaningless chant, Eia, 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 Alala. La, la. Along with the wartime shock troops' anthem, Giovanezza, these would pass into the repertory of Italian fascism. So, in more elaborate ways, did his attempt to reconcile a new national religion with traditional Catholicism, and at least the idea of a corporatist state based on group vocation. Thirteen months later, the Kingdom of Italy and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes signed the Treaty of Rapallo which created the Free State of Fiume, promptly recognized by the USA, France, and Britain. D'Annunzio, however, refused to accept the treaty and had to be evicted from the city by the Italian army in what entered fascist mythology as the Bloody Christmas of 24 through 30 December 1920. This aging man of will had a younger epigone in Italy's turbulent post-war domestic politics. The introduction of universal male suffrage in 1913, which gave the vote to Italy's many adult illiterates, disrupted the previous system, based on rival elites alternating in power to dispense pork bell rewards to their clientels. The largest of the new mass political parties were the Catholic Democrats and the Marxist Socialists, 
although the latter soon split with the formation of a new Italian Communist Party. The Great War had created a sense of mass entitlement, a feeling that all the death and suffering had to be for something. Among those who had been exempt from the war, industrial unrest blighted the factories of the northern Milan-Turin-Genoa Triangle, even as swaths of the northern countryside were also blighted by agrarian militancy, which translated into socialist gains in municipal elections. Landlords quaked as red flags were hoisted on modest municipal buildings. The red years, Bienio Rosso of 1919-20, provided an opportunity for Italy's nascent fascist party, founded in Milan on 23 March 1919 by Benito Mussolini, a former teacher, socialist agitator, and war veteran. Mussolini, who dared to extend his reading habits beyond the prescribed texts, to such infidels as Nietzsche, had finally broken with the comrades in 1915, over his insistence that Italy abandon its wartime neutrality. His fascist movement was like a faith whose heretical spirit combined the virtues of aristocrats and democrats, excluding the stolidly prudent bourgeois virtues between. The specter of Red Revolution transformed Mussolini's deracinated band of black-shirted students, bohemians, and war veterans into the willing tool of powerful interests. In the absence of salvation by the state, landowners hired fascist squads, consisting of thirty to fifty men, under a leader known by the Abyssinian term Ras, chief, to rough up or kill socialist communist activists, and to wreck the physical infrastructure of the leftist parties and their labor unions. Bernardo Bertolucci's movie 1900 gives a very vivid sense of these depredations. In mid-1921, a parliamentary commission reported the destruction in the previous six months of 119 labor exchanges, 59 cultural centers, 107 cooperatives, and 83 offices used to coordinate day laborers, as well as libraries, print shops, and self-help societies. Accustomed to absorbing and emasculating populist firebrands, Italy's old elites were confident that fascism was a tool they could use to forestall Red Revolution, following which it would be merely a matter of political fireworks. After a puff of smoke and a whiff of sulfur, nothing would remain. For his part, Mussolini realized that the Italian liberal state was a facade, a mask behind which there is no face, scaffolding behind which there is no building, a force without a spirit. In that climate of mutual cynicism, the ruling elites tried to co-opt the fascists into the dominant liberal nationalist bloc by offering Mussolini first the deputy premiership, then the premiership itself. They believed he would be content to be a figurehead, while they would continue to govern Italy by tried and tested methods. They failed. Although the fascists were sparingly represented in the Italian parliament, the illusion of strength, especially in the north where they took over entire towns, and doubts about the loyalty of the army, led King Victor Emmanuel III to invite Mussolini to form a government in October 1922, after the king had declined to introduce martial law to crush the insurgent black shirts. Initially, Mussolini and three colleagues were the sole fascists in a cabinet of fourteen. As was true throughout the fascist period, the three traditional sources of power remained intact. The royal armed forces, the Catholic Church, and the monarchy. In important respects, they also acted as checks on Mussolini's desire to make the Mediterranean an Italian or Roman sea, and to break out of what he saw as a geopolitical cage, whose bars were Gibraltar and Suez. Mussolini made sure there were not many other domestic restraints. Fascism abolished the freedom of the press and political pluralism. It created a not especially effective or numerous secret police, which institutionalized the use of paid informers and wiretapping. But after the regime nearly fell over the slaying of socialist deputy Giacomo Matteotti, opponents were sent into internal exile rather than killed. To bolster his hold on power, Mussolini also introduced a fascist Grand Council, and a three hundred thousand man black shirted militia, the Milizia Voluntaria per la Sicurezza Nazionale, MBSN, into the state apparatus. 
Belligerence was the signature of fascism. Angry war veterans were prominent, but so were those who for reasons of age had missed the war experience, united in the belief that political violence was cleansing and ennobling. Discipline was celebrated and fetishized, while entire swaths of life were militarized through metaphorical battles for births, drainage, the lira or grain, and by enveloping some 6,700,000 children and youths of both sexes within paramilitary formations. Mussolini had been a leading socialist journalist. Surely the preeminent British historian Alfred Cobbin was right when in 1939 he described Italian fascism as government by journalism, meaning a rather desperate seeking after public opinion. What Catholic intellectuals like Luigi Sturzo dubbed fascism's idolatrous veneration of the state was designed to counteract the pervasive campanilismo of a society where most people's horizons did not rise beyond the elegant church towers of their village or town and the amoral familism practiced by the clans living in their shadows. It also sought to reforge human nature an uphill task in the land of Bella Figura. Mussolini was openly contemptuous of what he called this army of mandolin players. Instead, he wished to shape a race of armed barbarians with the single-mindedness of medieval Dominican friars to bring about a latter-day Roman Empire, the obvious historical template, although his historical metaphors were surely mixed. However, attempts to fanaticize Italians through the cults of fascist movement martyrs and of the omniscient duce, leader-slash-guide, or through membership of totalitarian organizations, ran into pervasive loyalties to the church and the family, as well as the localized client networks of each town or region. The movement's attempts to create a new man by exhortation were also derided by the pragmatic cynicism of Italy's self-styled brave gente, or fine people, and fascist meritocracy soon dissolved into the pervasive corruption and nepotism. As a subspecies of nationalism, war was the chosen means for making Italians into fascists and for achieving great power status. As Mussolini said during the Spanish Civil War, when Spain is over, I'll think of something else. The character of the Italians must be recreated through battle. For Mussolini, nothing could beat combat in transforming consciousness, while the rigors of new colonies would consolidate and perpetuate this martial spirit. Fascism itself was always activist and aggressive, while charismatic leadership required regular coup de théâtre to counteract the impression of mere management of affairs. War and imperialism were seen as the means of forging the elusive new man, who would enable Mussolini to complete his domestic revolution, which had compromised with the old elites. But the elites who cramped the dictator's ability to implement the society he desired also checked his wilder foreign policy gambits when they courted the risk of war. The core dynamic of the fascist period was that Mussolini believed international war would enable him to carry out a domestic revolution against those who had installed him to preclude one. For over a decade, fascism's uniformed swagger was not reflected in Italian foreign policy, which was conducted by the traditional diplomatic elite from their new home in the Palazzo Chigi. The need to consolidate the regime at home and Italy's dependence on imported coal, oil, iron ore, and chemical fertilizers inhibited military adventures. This was a backward peasant country, with only a fifth of the total industrial potential of Germany and half that of Japan. A third of the population were illiterate or semi-literate, while at tertiary level there was a market preponderance of arts graduates over engineers. When war did eventually break out, there was a mass exodus into the universities, which sheltered young middle-class men from conscription until the age of twenty-six. True, in 1923, the Italian navy bombarded and occupied Corfu after the Greek government had prevaricated over the murder of four Italians engaged in resolving a border dispute between Greece and Albania. But, after a threatened British naval intervention, Mussolini accepted Greek financial reparations and withdrew his troops. Although Italy regained Fiume and concluded a friendship treaty with the new multinational kingdom of Yugoslavia, the city remained a primary object of fascist animosity. 
covert subversion was conducted by supporting Macedonian and Croat fascist exiles, based in Italy, since the Italian elites feared that overt aggression would involve Yugoslavia's patron France. Another outlet for fascist aggression was in Africa. In the mid-1920s, Italian forces pushed out from the narrow coastal strip of Tripolitania, taken from the Ottoman Turks in 1912, to conquer what, in conscious echo of the Romans, became known as Libya. Desert concentration camps were used to isolate from the rest of the population guerrillas who were resisting the Italians. Similar brutality was used to ensure control of Italian Somaliland in the Horn of Africa. At the same time, Mussolini kept Italy at the European top table. At Locarno, in 1925, Italy became one of the co-guarantors of Germany's western frontiers with France and Belgium. In March 1933, the Duce floated a four-power directorate to regulate European affairs without the diffuse involvement of the League of Nations, founded after the Great War, a scheme intended to win leeway from further aggression in Africa. For Mussolini, the appointment of Hitler as German Chancellor in 1933 represented both a threat and an opportunity. It was a threat because Nazi machinations in Austria menaced the authoritarian Dolfus regime, which looked to Italy and the papacy for ideological inspiration while raising the ominous prospect of German armies at the Brenner Pass. The opportunity chiefly lay in seeking license for overseas aggression in return for collaborating with the other powers in containing Germany. Hitler and Mussolini first met in Venice on 14 June 1934. It was not a meeting of minds, largely because Mussolini dispensed with an interpreter for sessions in a language he only intermittently grasped when delivered in Hitler's guttural South German accent. Despite Hitler's pleasantries about the subtle light in Italian Renaissance paintings— Mussolini grew weary of an interlocutor he compared with a gramophone that played only seven tunes. Hitler came away mistakenly convinced that Mussolini had granted him a free hand in Austria, and a month later Austrian Nazis, acting with Hitler's connivance, murdered Chancellor Engelbert Dolfus. Mussolini had to inform Dolfus's wife and children, who were staying with him, what had happened to her husband and their father. Privately, the Duce referred to Hitler as a sexual degenerate, associating him with the homosexual leaders of Germany's brown-shirted Sturmabteilung, S.A., murdered on Hitler's orders shortly after that Venice meeting. This was the room purge of stormtroopers disgruntled with Hitler's dispositions. But his public comments were restrained, and he sent only a token detachment of troops to the Brenner Pass. Then, seemingly seeking support to prevent Anschluss, the term for Austro-German Union, forbidden under Article 80 of the Treaty of Versailles, Mussolini turned to the French. Foreign Minister Pierre Laval hurried to Rome despite the fact that in October 1934 Italian intelligence had connived at the murder in Marseille of the Yugoslav King Alexander by Croatian fascists, an incident in which Laval's predecessor, Louis Bartou, had been a collateral fatality. This led to the so-called Streza Front, an agreement made on 14 April 1935 in the town of that name on the banks of Italy's Lake Maggiore by Mussolini, Laval, and British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald. The declaration reaffirmed the Locarno Treaties and declared that the independence of Austria would continue to inspire their common policy. The signatories also agreed to resist any future attempt by the Germans to change the Treaty of Versailles, a unified front promptly undone by the British, who concluded a naval agreement with Germany that sanctioned an expansion of its fleet beyond the limit set at Versailles. So eager was Laval to strike a deal that he readily conceded what Mussolini was really seeking, the go-ahead for Italian military aggression in the Horn of Africa. There, Italy had been massing large-scale forces in its East African colonies of Eritrea and Somaliland, bordering on Abyssinia. Mussolini also, mistakenly, believed he had secured British complicity on the basis of peripheral soundings at Streza. It was an easy mistake to make. When a journalist at Streza asked Ramsay MacDonald about Abyssinia, he replied, My friend, your question is irrelevant. In a sense it was, for the conference had been primarily convened to forge a common front against Hitler in Europe. But that was not what Mussolini understood. 
Mussolini took irrelevant to mean that the British did not care about Abyssinia. After all, they had not done anything about Japanese adventurism, from which Mussolini and Hitler learned the trick of not declaring war, while presenting aggression as defensive in purpose. When, following the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, the British deployed reinforcements to the Mediterranean fleet, an outraged Mussolini ranted about going to war with Britain, much to the horror of King Victor Emmanuel and his service chiefs. By contrast, although Germany and Japan had previously been arming the Abyssinians, Hitler declared his neutrality in the Italo-Abyssinian War, while publicly forswearing any ill intent toward Austria. He even offered to supply Italy with coal, should the League of Nations impose sanctions. French refusal to support British military action led to a policy of more carrot than stick. Britain's mixed signals reflected various contradictory concerns. There was a sober refusal to dissipate forces that might one day be needed in any one of three possible global theaters. Britain also wished to engage Mussolini in any potential alliance against the more substantial threat represented by Hitler. On the other hand, while the British public were opposed to war, they believed in the League of Nations, and insisted that infractions of international law should be punished, while remaining passionately opposed to rearmament. The French and British tried to assuage Mussolini's appetites by offering him stretches of empty desert, which he dismissed as lunar landscapes and sand pits. Next, the League of Nations suggested that Abyssinia become a League mandate, with recognition of special Italian interests. But mere sops could not divert Mussolini from his chosen course of action. Mussolini could plausibly present the invasion of Abyssinia, along with Liberia, the only remaining independent state in Africa, as being a resumption of a catch-up quest for empire. It was also revenge for the humiliating defeat Italy had suffered at Attawa in 1896, when an Italian army had been wiped out by Abyssinian tribesmen. Cost what it may, I will avenge Attawa. Mussolini informed the French ambassador to Rome. Using more contemporary arguments, Mussolini claimed that Abyssinia would absorb the Italian rural poor, hitherto lost to North America at an alarming rate, who would feed themselves and generate a surplus for the Italian metropolis. These landless laborers and sharecroppers would become lords of all the coffee, cotton, and wheat they surveyed, with Abyssinians doing the hard labor. There were even rumors of oil which was never found, but ironically lay undiscovered beneath the Italian colony of Libya. There was also talk of a civilizing mission, of bringing order out of tribal chaos, a view that resonated with Evelyn Waugh and other conservative Roman Catholics beyond Italy. Although in reality it had been Emperor Haile Selassie's success in forging a centralized state, in defiance of rival warlords that inclined Mussolini to act sooner rather than later, the Italians claimed they were going to liberate Abyssinia's slaves, and also to deliver the country's six million Muslims from Christian tutelage. During the war, Radio Bari pumped out pro-Muslim propaganda, while afterwards Mussolini built a grand mosque in Addis Ababa and sponsored Abyssinian Muslims on the Hajj to Mecca to reward the 35,000 Muslim troops who had fought for the Italians. 100,000 troops crossed from Eritrea into Abyssinia, on 3 October 1935, and fifty members of the League of Nations condemned Italian aggression against one of their number. Half-hearted sanctions were imposed, which excluded the trucks the Italians needed for the invasion, as well as oil without which they could not move at all. The British also declined to close the Suez Canal to Italian shipping. The invasion of Abyssinia did not disillusion those who thought that Mussolini could be used to restrain Hitler's excesses. Three months into the campaign, the French press revealed secret talks between the British Foreign Secretary Samuel Hoare and his French opposite number Laval to agree in a scheme devised by the Foreign Office's Robert Bansitart, which offered Mussolini two-thirds of Abyssinia, while leaving Haile Selassie with a rump state and a corridor to the sea. These terms, devised without consulting the Abyssinians, were to be backed up with petroleum sanctions if Italy refused them. Fortuitously for Mussolini, Laval and Hoare were compelled to resign when details of the scheme became public. Vansittart fulminated against the self-indulgent moralism that had scuppered his attempt to keep the two European dictators apart. 
Mussolini decided to accelerate the Italian campaign by replacing the overcautious local commander with General Pietro Badoglio, who in 1922 had wanted to deploy the Italian army against the fascist threat to march on Rome. Badoglio was instructed to use any means to destroy Abyssinian resistance, including large stockpiles of chemical weapons that had been shipped via the Suez Canal to Eritrea and Somaliland. Three types of chemical weapons were used. Eperite, arsine, and phosgene gas, all illegal under the 1925 Geneva Protocols. They were delivered in artillery shells or dropped as bombs or sprayed from aircraft. They either seeped beneath the skin to cause internal lesions or suffocated the respiratory systems. They contaminated the ground, plants, lakes, rivers, and livestock. An Abyssinian leader, Ras Imru, reported that, On the morning of 23 December, we saw several enemy planes appear. We were not unduly alarmed, as by this time we were used to being bombed. On this particular morning, however, the enemy dropped strange containers that burst open almost as soon as they hit the ground or the water, releasing pools of colorless liquid. I hardly had time to ask myself what could be happening, before a hundred or so of my men who had been splashed with the mysterious fluid began to scream in agony as blisters broke out on their bare feet, their hands, their faces. Some who rushed to the river and took great gulps of water to cool their fevered lips— fell contorted on the banks and writhed in agony that lasted for hours until they died. Among the victims were a few peasants who had come to water their cattle, and a number of people who lived in nearby villages. My chiefs surrounded me, asking wildly what they should do. But I was completely stunned. I didn't know what to tell them. I didn't know how to fight this terrible rain that burned and killed. In justification, Italian propagandists broadcast stories of atrocities committed against Italian prisoners. These exaggerated instances of crucifixion and emasculation, as well as the use of dum-dum bullets, named after the arsenal in British India when they were first developed, and the misuse of Red Cross symbols to camouflage arms dumps and troop concentrations. Thus empowered, the Italians bombed Red Cross facilities with relative impunity killing a number of international aid workers. Within seven months, the Italians proclaimed the conquest of Abyssinia, but in reality local resistance went on for many expensive years. It also proved remarkably difficult to lure Italian peasants as colonists, and the conquered kingdom cost much more to maintain than it ever produced. Ten million Italians volunteered their wedding rings to make up for the gold bullion draining away to keep a huge army in the wastes of Abyssinia. Mussolini then compounded the problem through his active support of the nationalist side in Spain's civil war. He had multiple reasons for doing so, which went beyond Hitler's more straightforward approach of exchanging support for strategic raw materials. To Mussolini, a nationalist victory was ideologically preferable to the elected government, which was dominated by socialists, although he made no great efforts to bolster the fascist elements in the nationalist coalition. A sympathetic nationalist Spain would ensure Mussolini's navy-free passage through the straits separating Gibraltar from Spanish Morocco. Finally, at a time when Britain and Germany were exploring a durable rapprochement, Italian and German aid to the nationalists would wreck the Anglo-French-inspired non-intervention framework and thereby further polarize the powers into hostile ideological camps. This would leave Italy, so Mussolini believed, considerable room for profitable maneuver. German and Italian military assistance was coordinated through so-called advisors based in Spain. Germany's Condor Legion acquired a reputation for ruthlessness after it bombed the historic Basque capital of Guernica, killing two or three hundred people. Thanks to Pablo Picasso's great chiaroscuro painting of the atrocity, it has received more notice than Italian air raids on Barcelona in March 1937, which killed a thousand people and left two thousand more injured. The Italians made a more substantial contribution than the Germans, sending not only aircraft, but also ships and fifty thousand fascist militia and regular army troops posing as volunteers. After the Italians had been humiliated in the Battle of Guadalajara that March— Mussolini directed his submarines to wage what amounted to a campaign of piracy against all shipping in Spanish waters, 
regardless of what flag they sailed under. Deniability could be preserved only by abandoning the survivors of torpedoed ships to their fate. Italy's multiple breaches of international law, whether in Abyssinia or Spain, and their condemnation by the Western powers convinced Mussolini that humanitarian arguments were being used hypocritically to inhibit the legitimate rise of the virile nations of Italy and Germany. Through a gentleman's, sick, agreement, Italy recognized Germany's right to dictate Austrian foreign policy, and Germany recognized Italy's conquest of Abyssinia. High-level contacts between Germany and Italy quickened, even as Hitler dispatched Joachim von Ribbentrop as ambassador to London seeking to draw Britain into the alliance with Germany that Hitler wanted. While there was an obvious ideological congruity between the two dictators, cold-blooded calculations prevailed on both sides. Hitler needed Mussolini's Mediterranean antics to distract Britain and France from his ambitions in Central Europe, where Versailles had helpfully created a patchwork of weak states— while Mussolini needed Germany to complicate Central Europe so that they would tolerate his activities in the Mediterranean. In October 1936, the two leaders embarked on a series of agreements which came to be known as the Rome-Berlin Axis. After a speech Mussolini delivered on 1 November, in which he spoke of Germany and Italy as an axis around which all European states, animated by a desire for collaboration and peace, can revolve. He was not the first to coin the term, but his use of it has ensured its future employ to describe all such sinister affinities. The Italian armed forces adopted a version of the German goose step, which Mussolini claimed was really the Passo Romano, and the regime augmented racial legislation, pioneered in Abyssinia, with measures against Italy's tiny Jewish minority, despite the fact that a third of Italian adult Jews, as members of the Italian bourgeoisie, were themselves enthusiastic fascists. The emergence of an anti-democratic bloc was not restricted to Europe, for in November 1937, Italy joined the Anti-Comintern Pact, concluded a year earlier by Germany and Japan, and directed against the Communist International. Anything that disrupted the status quo was good, like a blast of cold air into a torpid room. The Italian regime more explicitly hoped that Japan would dissipate and neutralize the global strength of Britain's navy, to which end Italian propagandists hastened to Tokyo to explain the fascist regime and to counter the Japanese elite's anglophilia, while Foreign Minister Count Chiano whetted Japan's interest in negotiations by supplying it with stolen plans for Britain's far eastern bastion of Singapore. In December 1937, the same month when Germany and Italy formally switched their support from the Chinese nationalists to the Japanese, Italy belatedly followed Germany's 1933 withdrawal from the League of Nations. Although these were not military alliances, they did represent the further self-definition and self-isolation of a general ideological camp that held the democracies in contempt, acknowledged no rules other than those of the jungle, and had a track record of aggression that included egregious breaches of international law. 2. Rising Sun The 25-year-old Prince Hirohito succeeded to the Japanese imperial throne in the early hours of 25 December 1925. Born to rule and comprehensively educated for the role, in the previous six years Hirohito had acted as regent owing to his father Taisho's dementia. The malevolent associated Taisho's neurological degeneration with Japan's parallel transformation into a democratic, modern society and a respected member of the international order in East Asia. After Taisho's death, the young emperor took possession of the three sacred regalia, a sword, jeweled necklace, and mirror, signifying courage, benevolence, and wisdom. Days later, he adopted the era-signifying name of Showa, meaning illustrious peace. Would that it had been auspicious. Three years later, in November 1928, over seven million dollars was spent transforming this slight, stooped enthusiast of bridge, golf, and marine biology into the living god of Shinto mythology, the statist version of Buddhism that had been assiduously propagated after the mid-nineteenth-century Meiji Restoration. 
The emperor was not like the old European monarchs who ruled by divine right, but a god who had assumed human form within the privileged and pure local cosmos of Japan. Hirohito himself was more enamored of the British constitutional monarchy of George V, which he had witnessed on a European tour. But in Kyoto, he dutifully lay down in a fetal position to merge mystically with the sun goddess Amaterasu Omikami, the mythical progenitor of the Japanese imperial line. Dutifully, because from the age of twenty, the rationalist Hirohito had expressed skepticism about whether he or his ancestors were living deities. He suppressed these youthful doubts in the interests of what Plato called a noble lie. Likewise, although educated Japanese knew about theories of evolution, they also subscribed to the idea of the divine origin of the Yamato race. The divine emperor was the focus of the Kokutai, the cardinal principles which bound Japan's state and society together, and which, because the Japanese were the most morally pure and selfless people on earth, elevated them above other lesser races. A little bit of that imperial divinity was invested in them all by virtue of the devotion and loyalty they showed to the emperor. Hirohito was also the armed forces commander-in-chief, a role that complicated his relations with civilian politicians. Although a mass conscript army had been created to obliterate endemic local warlordism in the 19th century, paradoxically the military was suffused from top to bottom with old-fashioned samurai values. A taciturn man who employed his high-pitched voice sparingly, Hirohito was far removed from the populist demagogues coming into their own in post-war Europe. Mussolini and Hitler were mob orators who relied on the illusion of speaking for the inner spirit of their mass audiences. By contrast, Hirohito never spoke to his own subjects, who were expected to cast down their eyes when he passed, even when he was traveling by car or train. Fastidious rituals, impeccable taste, and exquisitely crafted poetry contrasted with the odor of sweat that clung to the vulgar European dictators. In some respects, Imperial Japan better resembled the Germany of Wilhelm II rather than Hitler, insofar as it enjoyed the rule of law and had a functioning diet or parliament. On the other hand, like the Nazis, the Japanese regime glorified war and the rural past, even though the military strength of both societies was a reflection of their modern industrial economies. Both also entertained myths of racial purity, although they applied their racism to each other. Even when they were allied, the Japanese still saw the Germans as gaijin, while Hitler and his associates subscribed to every cliché about little yellow men. Both powers had barged their way onto the big stage with stunning military victories, that defined national identity. Imperial Germany fought three very successful wars between 1862 and 1871, and held off the Triple Entente of Britain, France, and Russia until 1918. Japan defeated China in 1894-5 and Russia in 1904-5, and made stunning gains in northern China in 1931-2 and 1937-8. Both societies had a long history of inordinate respect for martial values and had overcome internal divisions by revolutions from above. In the Japanese case, there was an aristocratic house of peers and a diet elected by universal male suffrage after 1925, although a tiny group of elder statesmen, the Genro, advised the emperor on who should be prime minister, of whom there were nine between 1937 and 1945, to coordinate the competing bureaucratic, business, army, and navy elite factions. These elites were in turn bound by complex aristocratic clan structures and had to pay lip service to public opinion. The army was based on the Prussian model, a spell in Germany was de rigueur for young officers, while the more prestigious navy copied the British. Generally speaking, in these years Japan was open to Western influences and a dedicated player in the complex diplomacy of East Asia and the Pacific. But there were also accumulated resentments. During the Great War, Japan had learned that conflict paid as it picked off German colonies, 
only to discover afterwards the temporary nature of the indulgence that had been shown by Germany's European enemies. Thereafter, the Japanese were treated with condescension and sometimes hostility by Westerners, who sought to deny this Asian Prussia the hemispherical hegemony that the U.S. claimed for itself in the Americas. The greatest provocation was that the West seemed determined to frustrate Japan's ambitions in what the Japanese regarded as the vast failed state of China, racked by endemic warlordism. The Japanese attitude towards mainland China was marked by a cultural inferiority come racial superiority complex, vaguely reminiscent of how the English used to view the French. The Chinese may have had a finer culture, but they were lacking in martial spirit. All of these Japanese sentiments had both domestic and foreign implications at a time marked by economic troubles, labor unrest, rapid urbanization, and the emergence of socialism and female emancipation in a historically hierarchical and patriarchal society. Modernity, invariably associated with foreign influences, was always going to unsettle a deeply conservative rural society, however much it might have benefited from imported industrial technology. An angrily righteous, reactionary right, generously represented in the officer corps, railed against every manifestation of westernized decadence and western dominance, and against the wealthy political and business elites that it regarded as corrupt and unpatriotic. The Imperial Way sect within the officer corps believed that their incorruptible selves should replace the political parties and the Emperor's self-interested advisers. Their worldview had other moralizing elements focused on Japanese society as a whole. These austere army officers, they were paid little more than were clerks in Japan's corporate combines, viewed with horror the eroticism grotesquerie and nonsense that gained ground in Japan during the 1920s and 1930s. These social evils were symbolized by the short-skirted and bobbed Modangaru, or Mogu, flapper, and her male Moba, with whom the girls held hands and kissed in public. Rightist ideologues such as Kita Iki combined imperial ultra-loyalism with militarism and state socialism. Kita propagated the need for an overseas empire beyond Formosa, Korea, and the toehold Japan had secured in southern Manchuria, in northeastern China, as a solution to a future population crisis he estimated at 250 million. He was executed by the secret police in the wake of a failed coup in 1937. Rich in coal and other resources, Manchuria was a big, bleak place— roughly the size of France and Germany combined. Many Japanese nationalists saw it as the answer to chronic rural overpopulation in the Japanese home islands. Instead of a mass fascist-style party, hundreds of secret societies proliferated with sinister names like the Blood Pledge League. Their anger mounted when the Depression forced cutbacks in Japan's military budget— an anger fed by demeaning U.S. and Australian immigration restrictions against Asians in general, which the Japanese bitterly resented. If the white nations were not going to allow Japanese immigration, then they could hardly object if the Japanese emigrated to China. Lastly, the Depression simultaneously hit the agricultural sector, from which the army drew most of its recruits, while diminishing the great power's ability to react to unilateral Japanese action in China, which the army saw as the solution to Japan's economic plight. One outpost of radical right sentiment was among the officers of the Kwantung Army, stationed in Manchuria, who felt they were the living executors of the 80,000 men who had perished fighting the Russians in Manchuria in 1904-05. They were garrisoned in a small coastal enclave to protect Japanese commercial interests, and a 600-mile railway line that stretched north into the interior. It was the sort of remote, lonely location where wild schemes incubated. The Kwantung soldiers sensed an opportunity in the simultaneous breakdown of international cooperation over China and that country's descent into chaos. They deemed it necessary to act in the window of opportunity before the nationalist forces grew too powerful 
and while the great powers were turned inward on their own economic problems. The Chinese resisted all attempts by the increasing number of Japanese and their subject Koreans settled in Manchuria to exploit the area's economic resources in an organized way. Irritation at Chinese attempts to frustrate Japanese domination mounted. In the summer of 1928, Kwantung officers blew up a train conveying a powerful Chinese warlord. The Japanese scattered the corpses of some Chinese prisoners around the scene to misattribute authorship of the assassination, a tactic the Nazis would subsequently employ in Poland. Although this plot failed to achieve its wider goals, Emperor Hirohito played a worrying part in covering up what amounted to an act of unilateral aggression by insubordinate army officers in a remote outpost. Further clashes in which the Chinese were alleged to have harassed Koreans and Japanese reignited tension a couple of years later. In September 1931, two senior members of the Kwantung Army, Colonel Itagaki and Lieutenant Colonel Ishiwara, caused small explosions at a major junction on the southern Manchurian Railway near a Chinese military base at Mukden, or Shenyang. Its innocent denizens were falsely blamed for the incident. The Japanese government sent an intelligence officer to rein in the army, but he managed to forget his mission in the course of extended visits to a restaurant and a geisha house in the company of one of the main plotters. The Kwantung army pressed ahead with its rampage, going on to bomb and occupy the industrial center of Jinzhou. The emperor explicitly sanctioned these acts of military insubordination, which also involved the dispatch of reinforcements from Korea, even though the plotters had an obvious domestic agenda. The agenda was, when we return to the homeland this time, we shall carry out a coup d'etat and do away with the party political system of government. Then we shall establish a nation of national socialism with the emperor as the center. We shall abolish capitalists like Mitsui and Mitsubishi and carry out an even distribution of wealth. We are determined to do so. Encouraged by the mass media, the Japanese public were swept by war fever. Especially popular were the three Kwantung army troopers who blew themselves up to destroy a strategically crucial section of barbed wire, although their officers may simply have equipped them with inadequate lengths of fuse. Six films were made about this incident, which was also fettered in innumerable Three Human Bombs songs. The deceased men also adorned human bomb brands of sake and bean paste sweets. Partly because Japanese fatalities in Manchuria were very low, there was much scope to dwell on individual acts of heroism, as well as on the alleged cowardliness of the Chinese. Manchurian Incident Bidan, or epic tales of the heroism involving Mukden, lauded men like Commander Koga as exemplars of Bushido the way of the samurai warrior. Koga led his men into a series of ever more suicidal actions, many of them designed to rescue the imperial flag from capture by the Chinese, whom he slaughtered in droves. The sacrifices of humble women on the rural home front were the female analogue of these stirring tales of the Japanese officer class. Next, in 1932, the Japanese organized a sideshow to distract outraged Chinese attention from their own activities in the north. They employed Chinese criminal gangs to attack five Japanese Buddhist monks in Shanghai to justify landing marines in China's largest city. When Chinese forces resisted, the Japanese sent in bombers and nearly 50,000 reinforcements. On one day alone, they dropped 2,500 bombs, a spectacle witnessed by the city's large number of Western residents. After the Chinese forces withdrew, the Japanese went berserk destroying property and bayoneting captives at a race course. Five hundred thousand Chinese temporarily fled the city, which, after international mediation, was demilitarized when the Japanese withdrew. While world attention was distracted by the plight of Shanghai, the Japanese installed Puyi, the last Qing emperor of China, as ruler of what they dubbed Manchu Kuo, although one American suggested it should have been called Japan Chu Kuo. Many ordinary Japanese thought that the Manchurian treasure house was vital to Japan itself, 
for fashionable imperatives of economic self-sufficiency underlay the rhetoric about blood spilled in earlier wars. Manchu Kuo joined the Yen bloc and received enormous Japanese inward investment, which went into a burgeoning military-industrial complex. During the 1930s, more expansive ambitions were popularized by such organizations as the Great Asia Association, founded in early 1933. Using the deceptive language of restoring harmony, this envisaged a much larger Japanese-dominated Asian bloc in which raw materials imported from liberated European colonies would be turned into manufactured goods exported by the Japanese metropolis. While the army was principally concerned with China and the Russian threat from Mongolia, the Imperial Navy had long been obsessed with its fuel supplies. This problem led the Navy to view the U.S. as the primary potential opponent in the wider Pacific region. The Army's unilateral action in Manchuria enabled its leaders to tilt the balance in Japanese domestic affairs away from civilian political parties. In the 1930s, governing was a risky affair. Acts of terrorism by radical young officers and their ultra-nationalist civilian admirers were a useful tool in this process, for the Army and Navy leaders could claim that only they could keep these hotheads in check. Assassinations and attempted coups in which the Blood Pledge League and the more benign-sounding Cherry Blossom Society were leading players enabled the military to marginalize the political party presence within successive cabinets. Threats of resignation by the service ministers were used to deconstruct cabinets they did not like. From May 1932 onwards, civilian politicians were relegated to minor roles when senior military figures installed an admiral as prime minister in a cabinet that contained only five representatives of the parties against ten senior officers and bureaucrats. Thanks to a devaluation of the yen, exports boomed and successive governments increased military spending until it was twelve times higher in 1938 than in 1931. Ineffectual condemnation by the League of Nations of Japan's aggression in China only heightened Japanese outrage at what it saw as foreign arrogance. Common images included that of a samurai warrior severing the restrictive ball and chain of the League of Nations, much as the Germans railed against the shackles of Versailles. Limp League condemnations of Japanese actions and the possibility of sanctions were portrayed as acts of white aggression, permitting the Japanese to pose as racial victims. This contributed to Japanese self-isolation, with a corresponding urge to break out through further acts of defiant violence. Interestingly, even Hitler's Germany condemned the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, and, as late as 1936, General Walter von Reichenau was in China negotiating a $100 million barter arrangement based on the exchange of raw materials for arms, iron, and steel. Japan left the League of Nations in March 1933 rather than bow to what was piously called the organized moral opinion of the world. The Kwantung army struck southwards in May, first into the province of Jehol between Manchukuo and the Great Wall of China, and then further south towards Beijing. As part of his strategy of appeasing the Japanese in order to fight the Chinese communists, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek agreed to the Tanggu Truce, a deal whereby Beijing would not be attacked in return for the Chinese demilitarization of a huge area containing six million inhabitants. Chinese officials concluded the truce with the guns of two Japanese destroyers trained on the building where they stood. Four years later, in July 1937, Japanese forces took advantage of a further incident with the Chinese to launch a full-scale punitive invasion of northwestern China. The use of the euphemistic term incident was deliberate, because by not admitting it was a war, the Japanese hoped that the U.S. would continue to supply Japan with oil. In the eyes of the Japanese, they were entitled to occupy and rule any bits of China they managed to detach. The emperor himself resolved that, along with his present duties, the China garrison army shall chastise chink forces in the peking Tianjin area and pacify strategic points. The absence of any clear national authority in China was adduced to absolve the Japanese from observing the laws of war. 
On 5 August, an undersecretary in the Army Ministry issued a decree saying, It is inappropriate to act strictly in accordance with various stipulations in treaties and practices governing land warfare and other laws of war. The decree soon bore evil fruit. Several hundred thousand Japanese troops were moved to China in pursuit of an ill-defined quest for a knockout blow, knowing they were not bound by the rules of war. Many of them were reservists in their thirties and early forties, who had long lost the habit of military discipline, which in the Japanese army invariably took the form of slaps in the face. By late October the Japanese had bombed and shelled Shanghai into surrender. Its defenders and fearful civilians fled to the nationalist capital of Nanking, about 180 miles along the Yangtze, pursued by Japanese soldiers who, without proper logistical support or sufficient military police, provisioned themselves from the despised civilian population. They started killing civilians long before they reached Nanking. The day before the city fell, Japanese pilots strafed a U.S. gunboat called the Panay which was being loaded with American diplomats and residents for evacuation down the Yangtze to Shanghai. A day later, Japanese troops entered Nanking, after the opium-addicted Chinese commander had ordered his troops to vacate the city, with himself the first to leave, through suburbs he ordered to be set on fire. There were lantern parades in Tokyo when the news of the fall of China's capital arrived. Bereft of leaders, Chinese troops tried to surrender sometimes after hastily exchanging their uniforms for ill-assorted civilian garb. Once inside the city, the Japanese disregarded any distinctions between combatants, civilians, and prisoners of war, which they rarely took anyway, and proceeded to indulge in an extended orgy of violence. For three months they were allowed to burn, murder, pillage, and rape in Nanking and its outlying villages. Looting was the most explicable crime, since the peasant soldiers of the Japanese army were poor and wanted things to send back home, and the seventeen military policemen in the city were hardly in a position to stop it. The killing is less easy to understand. Although Japanese soldiers had a sense of right and wrong, there was no transcendental moral code to offset the absolute dictates of officers, who in turn were the unquestioning servants of the emperor. If they said kill, you killed. On one night alone, some seventeen thousand men and boys were slaughtered to ensure that a military parade attended by Hirohito's fifty-year-old uncle, Prince Asaka, would pass off without incident. Massed Japanese troops shouted Banzai, meaning ten thousand years, in the prince's honor outside the former Kuomintang Nationalist headquarters. Chinese were killed in every conceivable manner, including being crucified, savaged by dogs, bayoneted to save ammunition, or beheaded. Officers competed to see who could kill the largest numbers before their swords became too blunt. Lapidary Japanese reports said that such and such a unit had disposed of thousands of prisoners, failing to note that they were often tied up with telegraph wire in batches of fifty to make it easier to bayonet, burn, or shoot them. Racism towards the chinks was compounded by the view that their surrender had been absolutely dishonorable. Also, Japan's peasant soldiers were themselves so routinely abused by their officers and NCOs that the extreme violence may have been like the venting of accumulated frustrations. Moreover, a society which treated women as third-class citizens was unlikely to have any regard for women from inferior races who were there to be abused especially if the Japanese were drunk, which they often were. On one night alone, approximately a thousand women, of all ages, were gang-raped by Japanese soldiers, and then killed with no more emotion than one would bring to dispatching farm animals. This practice was halted only by the wholesale importation of prostitute comfort women, mainly from Korea. Chinese and Japanese statistics for the victims of this massacre range from two to over three hundred thousand, although a more recent estimate is in the region of one hundred thousand or fewer. Japanese diplomats protested to Tokyo, concerned about the international condemnation the massacre had provoked, and even Germany expressed concern about the Hunnic storm 
that the Yellow Peril had unleashed. But orders from the War Ministry and from the Commander-in-Chief General Iwane Mutsui made not the slightest impression on the middle and junior officers in Nanking. Shamefully, Mutsui and eighty of his staff officers were themselves transferred back to Tokyo for having tried to stop the genocide. In the wake of these conquests, the Japanese decided on regime change in China by unilaterally refusing to recognize the government of Chiang Kai-shek, which had moved to Hankow. This precluded an early resolution of the Chinese-Japanese War. In a further sign that the conflict was about to be internationalized, the British and Americans commenced secret naval staff talks. Abandoning long-standing German assistance to the Chinese nationalists, Hitler recognized Manchukuo in 1938. Germany and Japan had been drawing closer since 25 November 1936, when they had agreed to the Anti-Comintern Pact, although they had nothing to fear from domestic communist subversion, and in the end the German foreign minister, Konstantin von Neurath, forgot to sign it. The agreement was the brainchild of Ribbentrop and his friend Lieutenant Colonel Hiroshi Oshima, the military attaché in Berlin, who had developed open admiration for Nazism long before he became Tokyo's ambassador to Germany. As Germany abandoned its support for China, recalling military advisors and ending arms shipments, so Japan began to revise its view of Germany, especially in the wake of the Anschluss and the 1938-9 Czechoslovak crisis. Yet Japan refused to join the May 1939 Italo-German Pact of Steel, and was appalled by that August's Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, reconciling Germany and Russia, which it learned about only at the eleventh hour. Although Japan subsequently joined Germany and Italy in the Tripartite Alliance in September 1940, it was an alliance with few practical consequences, and in April 1941 it was Tokyo's turn to shock the Germans when it concluded a neutrality pact with the Soviet Union. This effectively signaled that Japanese sites were fixed southwards, towards the colonies of the European nations conquered by Hitler whose helplessness made them tempting targets despite the risk of war with the U.S. Like Germany and Italy, Japan acted according to its own national interests, a stance fully reflected in the virtual absence of military coordination between Germany and Japan during the Second World War. 3. The Restless Reich Like the Italian fascists and Japanese militarists, the German National Socialists regarded war as a release from what they called the lingering disease of peace, a peculiarly pathological view of the condition most human beings aspire to. They would have agreed with the great Prussian historian Heinrich von Treitschke, who claimed that war was morally sublime. It was where the enthusiastic hurrahs of patriotic boys were transformed into the steely determination of men. For Hitler's own reminiscences of the trenches— dictated nearly a decade after the event, abounded with literary clichés, even if they were much the same as those used by the future long-serving British Foreign Secretary and, briefly and disastrously, post-war Prime Minister Anthony Eden. Hitler had served as a runner, clattering along the slippery duckboards of the Western Front before being blinded in an Allied gas attack and invalided to a Pomeranian hospital. In that eastern backwater, Hitler experienced the emotional deflation of Germany's capitulation, the primordial catastrophe that shaped his vengeful destiny. It was more than a defeat, for, in his view, the collapse had been brought about by internal subversion. In the minds of many cultural pessimists, this was the culmination of an erosion of values characteristic of the modern industrial urban era in general but this collapse was simultaneously an opportunity to inaugurate a new era in which the laws of nature would reign supreme, and collective considerations would supersede the bounds of custom, church, and family. Ideology and morality, the private and the political, were to be subsumed into a single imperative based on the community, whose core values were ethnically specific and expressed through such atavistic notions as healthy popular instinct. This would replace the Judeo-Christian concept of conscience, and there would be no more subversion based on the thinking of the Jews, Marx, Freud, and Einstein. To make this seem less revolutionary, traditional values like bravery, diligence, duty, honor, loyalty, obedience, sacrifice, and soldierly fortitude 
were enlisted to support it. The mythologized legacy of Prussia was used to conjure up an ideal of state-building. In Mein Kampf, Hitler wrote, Prussia, in particular, demonstrates with marvelous sharpness that ideal virtues alone, not material qualities, make possible the formation of a state. The material interests of a man can always thrive best as long as they remain in the shadow of heroic virtues. Prussia, the germ cell of the Reich, came into being through resplendent heroism and not through financial operations or commercial deals, and the Reich itself, in turn, was only the glorious reward of aggressive political leadership and the death-defying courage of its soldiers. Starting with the day of Potsdam on 21 March 1933, Hitler would have himself depicted as the lineal successor of Frederick the Great and Bismarck, neither of whom would have warmed, one strongly suspects, to the vulgar little Austrian corporal. All these appeals to traditional values and historical example were the tasty sauce that disguised the smell of the rancid meat beneath. The Treaty of Versailles had imposed on Germany constraints that patriotic Germans and nationalist fanatics like Hitler regarded as tantamount to the degradations of a colony. This gained a nasty racist edge when the French deployed black colonial troops in the Rhineland to break local resistance, although most were North African Arabs and Vietnamese. Loyalty became the supreme honor of the SS man, as his belt buckle proclaimed. A term like shame could also be given specific accents, so that it became race shame, or, less literally in English, race defilement, Rassenschande, that is, the pollution of a superior race through sexual congress with another, and in particular the Jewish other. This was also reflected in a reversion to public punishment, as race defilers were forced to go about with placards round their necks, or were denounced on the poster columns of the vile Nazi magazine Der Stürmer. Soldierly virtue was perverted into the fanatical belligerence of SS political soldiers, who became soldiers of destruction, a transformation of values that leached into the regular army and police. Finally, Although Nazism sought to transcend both utilitarianism and what was often referred to as the swindle of humanitarianism, it was responsible for the crassest utilitarian calculations about the social cost of human life, which gave rise to sterilizing or murdering people, according to a eugenic calculus. Sharp-eyed officers saw some use in the corporal, who otherwise resembled a lost dog in the aftermath of the Great War. Fluency with spoken words, all vehemently expressed, ensured that Hitler was never psychologically demobilized, as he wrapped the war's ghosts around him like a metaphorical cloak. His first job was to give political talks to decontaminate restive soldiers who were turning to radical socialism. The vital experience of discovering his unique demagogic voice smoothed his path into extreme nationalist politics— where previously a crankily professorial type of speaker had addressed meetings in a style more appropriate to academic seminars. After resolving a few uncertainties regarding desirable alliances, by the early 1920s Hitler had decided that Germany needed Lebensraum in the East, that is, land and material resources to support a dynamic, racially homogeneous population fitted for the fight for survival against other races. The war confirmed a bleak outlook that had already been formed on the mean streets of Habsburg Vienna, notably that a conscience or guilt were impediments to seeing the underlying processes of existence starkly. Hitler's desire to conform human existence to the laws of nature, cruelly conceived, had inevitable ethical implications. No one can doubt that this world will someday be exposed to the severest struggles for the existence of mankind. In the end, only the urge for self-preservation can conquer. Beneath it, so-called humanity, the expression of the mixture of stupidity, cowardice, and know-it-all conceit, will melt like snow in the March sun. Mankind has grown great in eternal struggle, and only in eternal peace does it perish. Some call the basic axioms that emerged a world view— but that probably overdignifies a mind littered with crudely understood aspects of Darwin or Nietzsche, refracted through the prism of the violent, subjective prejudices of a personality in arrested adolescence. Underlying the whole was what contemporaries call active nihilism. 
Central to his outlook was the quest for space in which the Aryan German race would thrive. That would inevitably entail war without end, as other powers were hardly likely to be passive spectators. Besides, if he simultaneously introduced philoprogenerative policies, state-subsidized attempts to boost the birth rate, then these additional space-deprived Aryan Germans would surely require more territory, necessitating further wars. A policy based on such racial demographics would never be satisfied merely by restoring the 1914 status quo ante, as most German conservative nationalists desired. In another break with the old riot, Hitler abandoned the Wilhelmine quest for places in the sun, where he felt the white man would atrophy. Traditional imperialism only engendered conflicts with the British, with whom Hitler sought an amicable division of the global spoils. Similarly, he sacrificed the Tyrolean Germans to win Italy as an ally in the Mediterranean. He also categorically rejected another episodic gambit of the right under the 1918-33 through 33 Democratic Weimar Republic, namely that the two pariah states of Germany and Russia should club together at the expense of Poland, arguing that a tree does not ally itself with the mistletoe that will kill it. For Hitler was certain that expansion must be towards the wider German East, conquered and settled by Germans in the Middle Ages, before the space was engulfed by a Slavic flood. A simulacrum of what Hitler desired had briefly arisen in the wake of the 1917 Russo-German Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, but this had fallen victim to Imperial Germany's supposedly mysterious collapse in 1918. A mystery, that is, until one introduces what Hitler regarded as a supranational force more powerful than any single state, international Jewry. The Jew, as Hitler invariably had it, was the shape-shifting force behind every deleterious development imaginable, from high finance, via Bolshevism, to prostitution and white slavery. Although Hitler was haunted by fears of bodily fluids, blood, miscegenation, and putrefaction, combating the Jew as cosmic maggot was a noble matter of doing the Lord's work, for the Führer had a growing sense of providential mission that compensated for the nullity of his existence. The solutions he envisaged were correspondingly surgical. In April 1920, he announced his inexorable resolve to strike the evil at its root and exterminate it root and branch, adding a year later, one prevents the Jewish corruption of our people, if necessary by confining its instigators to concentration camps. This was the core of his domestic agenda, defined by the need for a dictatorship to ensure that Germany's racially determined wartime collapse of morale was never repeated. But the Jews had also taken over Russia, displacing the thin Germanic ruling classes. Although Hitler held the Jews responsible for the murderous regime of terror by Lenin's Bolsheviks, he also thought this scum of humanity had no ability to organize the predominantly Slav population to resist Germany's drive towards a continental empire. While as a full vicious ensemble these manias were extreme and marginal throughout most of the 1920s, elements of them were commonplace among nationalistically minded Germans, who increasingly rejected the Republican system. The Weimar Republic's fragile stability was destroyed by worsening economic conditions, which exposed irreconcilable differences of outlook between the major parties and the interests they represented over how to deal with them. While successive governments floundered, the predominantly Protestant middle classes lurched to the right, collapsing both liberal parties as well as the plethora of single-issue protest parties that had multiplied in the wake of the hyperinflation crisis of the early 1920s. Nazi electoral support rose as the economic crisis deepened. Reaching 18% of the vote in September 1930 and 37% in July 1932. Fear of social demotion was as potent as, indeed perhaps more potent than, having hit rock bottom in the soup kitchens and dole queues. By now the Nazis' use of political violence had reached its apogee, with 18 dead and 68 wounded following a clash known as Bloody Sunday between Nazis and Communists in Hamburg Altona. Communist violence enabled the Nazis to pose as defenders of public order against a firebrand-bearing Bolshevik menace, even though their own muscular cadres in the brown-shirted S.A. relished a brawl. They also publicly rhapsodized about Jewish blood spurting from a knife wound, or shouted, Germany awake, let Jewry croak. 
Although the Nazis played the democratic electoral game, their attitude towards even the most heinous activities was symbolized by Hitler's vow to pardon five SA stormtroopers who, in August 1932, were convicted of kicking a communist miner to death in front of his mother in the Silesian town of Potempa. After the failure of successive establishment figures to solve the deepening economic and political crises, Germany's elites engineered Hitler's ascent to the chancellorship, confident that they could contain him and the revolutionary forces he represented, just as their peers in Italy had believed a decade earlier. The Nazis' final electoral surge reflected their success in depicting their movement as a natural force, uniquely capable of overcoming Germany's bitter domestic divisions as the necessary prelude to writing its humiliating international position. A fringe party, led by a naturalized foreigner, managed the feat of making the Republic itself seem alien, artificial, corrupt, and decadent, the tool of the country's enemies, who in their latest scheme, the 1929 Young Plan, regulating reparations payments, sought to keep Germany in hock until 1988. Something more profoundly irrational was also abroad beneath sinister manipulations of language that in the interim had become the common coin of democratic politicians. The Nazis' use of drum and trumpet, light and luridly colored symbols, resulted in what the satirist Karl Krauss called cerebral concussion. A sophisticated modern society reverted to the habits of fire worshippers, beating their tom-toms around a tribal chief who expressed dangerous thoughts they could not articulate themselves. Hitler presented the Germans with transgressive temptations, which many of them grasped with eager hands. Carefully constructed propaganda and his own vaulting rhetoric ratcheted this relationship up to a more exalted plane, as the Führer did nothing to discourage the view that he was the race nation's redeemer or savior, godlike if not actually a god like Hirohito in Japan. Several Germans testified to the miracle-working effects of his glance or touch, while significant numbers of Protestants were prepared to remodel Jesus as an honorary Aryan. Hope sprang eternal as Hitler presented an autographed photograph of himself to a school for the blind, which was doubtless eager to receive it. Although the Nazi party had its thuggish paramilitary element, it also appealed to the sober Protestant middle classes, who had experienced the catastrophe of inflation and concomitant family and social breakdown earlier in the 1920s. Though they formed the critical and decisive mass of Nazi supporters, they construed themselves as individuals of culture and ethical refinement, even as they were groomed into militarized professions. Being a lawyer or physician no longer entailed being an individual with a vocation in an autonomous, self-regulating profession. Now it meant being a servant of the folkish national racial collective, with good and evil determined by whatever bolstered or subverted its interests as defined by the Führer. Mere ambition was often responsible for an auto-radicalization that was difficult to distinguish from outward conformity. Consider, for a moment, the young Sebastian Hoffner's experiences at an ideological training camp for aspirant lawyers at Uterbok, a garrison town in Brandenburg, which he attended in the autumn of 1933. Attendance was compulsory if one sought a career in law, a grail-like ambition in such middle-class circles. Life in the camp seemed to have no rhyme or reason beyond endless cleaning and marching, long periods of boredom interspersed with sudden cranks on the big mechanical wheel by which they were trapped. Students who belonged to the S.A. and wore its brown uniform set the collective tone, so that even anti-Nazis were soon marching around singing anti-Semitic songs. The aspirant lawyers found songs derived from the anti-monastic Klostersturm of the 1525 Peasant War especially rousing. We want to cry out to the Lord God in heaven, hey ya ho ho that we want to beat the priests to death, hey ya ho ho Up and down, man for man, place the red cock on the monastery roof. One evening Hoffner and his colleagues were listening to the radio when, as he put it, the marching band halted with boots poised in midair. The program was interrupted to announce that Germany had left the League of Nations. Under a large portrait of Hitler, one by one the law students stood as the national anthem and the Nazi Horst Wessel lied were played, each extending his arm in the Hitler salute. Although he and a few others had the taste of doing something disgustingly degrading, 
Hoffner duly raised his arm like the rest. He began to mouth the words that the others sang with gusto, like someone in a church who does not know a hymn. Every one a Gestapo man to the other. The guilty pleasure of identifying prominent Jews bubbled to the surface of public life. Even so fastidious a figure as the soon-to-be-exiled author Thomas Mann found himself half-approving the sudden denial of oxygen to Jewish writers and critics. The Jews. It is no great misfortune, after all, that exiled critic Alfred Kerr's brazen and venomous Jewish-style imitation of Nietzsche is silenced, nor that the Jewish presence in the judiciary has been ended. Secret, disquieting, intense thoughts. Nonetheless, things that are revoltingly malevolent, base, un-German in a higher sense, remain. But I am beginning to suspect that the process could well be of that kind that has two sides. A few days later he wrote, I could to some extent go along with the rebellion against the Jewish element, were it not that the Jewish spirit exercises a necessary control over the German element, the withdrawal of which is dangerous. Left to themselves, the German element is so stupid as to lump people of my type in the same category and drive me out with the rest. Germans who were not thugs needed things expressed in terms of moral and religious restoration, after the cultural and sexual indulgences of the Republic, when the youth of Germany had allegedly gone to hell in a handcart. The absence or death of fathers in the war contributed some substance to this charge, as did the well-known artistic excesses of the capital. Tedious low-grade provocation, sometimes involving homosexuality or transvestism, rebounded on its authors, for whom it was truly Goodbye to Berlin, the title of a contemporary novel by the camp English author Christopher Isherwood. In Hitler's first national broadcast after assuming the chancellorship, he declared, the national government will therefore regard its first and foremost duty to re-establish the unity in spirit and will of our folk. It will preserve and defend the foundations upon which the power of our nation rests. It will extend its strong protecting hand over Christianity as the basis of our entire morality, and the family as the germ cell of the body of our folk and state. It will establish reverence for our great past and pride in our old traditions as the basis for the education of our German youth. Thus it will declare merciless war against the spiritual, political, and cultural nihilism. Germany must not and will not drown in anarchistic communism. Nazi Germany's opening foreign policy gambits emphasized legitimate national grievances such as the abused human rights of several ethnic German exclaves and a continued desire for international peace. They could do little else, given the country's enforced lack of armaments and such strategic vulnerabilities as the demilitarization of the Rhineland under Articles 42 and 43 of the Versailles Treaty. Hitler was not inclined to continue in the tradition of the Republic's dogged attempts to renegotiate Versailles. He made this clear by his approach to the Geneva Disarmament Conference, ongoing when he came to power, and the most neuralgic issue since the 1932 resolution of reparations by the American Young Plan. In May 1933, Hitler airily proclaimed that we view the European nations as a given fact, and that he had no desire to turn French or Poles into Germans. But then he chronicled the miseries inflicted on Germany since Versailles, claiming that there had been 224,000 suicides in the years 1918 through 33, and preposterously attributing all of them to national humiliation. Turning to the issue that concerned him, he argued that either the other powers should disarm, as they were obliged to do under the League of Nations Covenant, or Germany should be allowed to rearm to redress the glaring anomaly. The German government will reject no ban on arms as being too drastic, if it is likewise applied to other nations, he said. But he warned, should the other powers seek to coerce Germany with threats of sanctions or talk of war, then he would have no hesitation in withdrawing from the League of Nations. This was his firm intention anyway, but it played well in formerly imperial Prussian Potsdam to wrap his design in the self-pitying rhetoric employed by his Weimar predecessors. In October... Hitler withdrew Germany from both the disarmament talks and the League of Nations, timing the decision for a Saturday when he assumed his European counterparts would be away at country house parties. 
a plebiscite on Germany's peace policy won an overwhelming popular majority, cunningly using international criticism of his actions to justify an appeal for a popular mandate. By these means, Hitler's maneuvers not only consolidated domestic support at the expense of the Social Democrats, but also laid the grounds for rapid rearmament. In a decisive break with the entire thrust of Weimar foreign policy, Hitler next concluded a ten-year non-aggression pact with Poland. While the pact was notionally aimed at the Soviets, its main and intended effect was to weaken France's influence in Eastern Europe. Unilateral pacts were useful to disrupt the alliance structures of others, and could always be abrogated later. The pact with Poland was particularly startling, as it tacitly recognized the borders that sundered Germany from East Prussia, as well as Polish possession of large parts of Pomerania, the former Prussian heartland. Not everything went smoothly. Hitler and Mussolini were rivals for the political affections of different constituencies in Austria, namely the Austrian Nazis and the clerical authoritarians gathered around Chancellor Engelbert Dollfuss. For many Austrians, the Dollfuss regime presented them with the familiar dilemma of supporting or tolerating a lesser evil to forestall something infinitely worse. After the Dollfuss government had deported the Nazi party's star lawyer, Hans Frank, for subversive activities, Hitler tried to undermine the Austrian winter tourist trade. Simultaneously, Austrian Nazis embarked on a year-long terror campaign involving multiple bombings of such targets as a jewelry store, cinemas, coffee houses and trains, as well as a hand grenade attack on a Christian youth organization. In July 1934, Hitler tacitly supported an Austrian Nazi putsch, in the course of which the charismatic young Austrian chancellor was slain. Only the previous month, Hitler had publicly taken responsibility for killing the leadership of his brown-shirted SA followers, as well as the former chancellor, Kurt von Schleicher, and sundry Catholic opponents, and anyone who happened along when the murderers struck. And he was widely believed to have had a remote hand in the assassination of Dollfuss. The Austrian government's nationwide crackdown on Nazi activists, 4,700 of whom were interned in a camp at Wurlersdorf, alongside 550 socialists, fueled Hitler's indignation, even as his own domestic opponents disappeared into his new network of concentration camps. International suspicions were further raised when Germany's 1934 budget revealed a 90% increase in spending on armaments, including provision for an air force prohibited by the Versailles Treaty. Funds were also provided to create a peacetime army based on mass conscription, which was also banned. Instead of trying to conceal these measures, as his Weimar predecessors had done by concentrating on a covert professional nucleus and dispersing key military activities to the Soviet Union, Hitler exaggerated his achievements so that his opponents would not dare attack him. He was not concerned about the diplomatic repercussions, which included French attempts to revive a little entente in East Central Europe, and Russia's mutual assistance pacts with France and Czechoslovakia. In fact, he used the Franco-Russian agreement to argue that the Locarno treaties had been vitiated by one of the main signatories. At the same time, the expiration of the League of Nations' fifteen-year mandate over the coal-producing Tsarland removed the one major lever it had over Germany, after a plebiscite produced an overwhelming vote for the Tsar to revert to Germany. With the Tsar safely in German hands, Hermann Göring could boastfully exaggerate the power of the German Air Force while on 16 March 1935 Hitler introduced conscription for an army that had now risen to over half a million. The League of Nations met to condemn Germany's actions, and even contemplated sanctions. However, although the British protested, they did not cancel or even postpone a visit to Germany by Foreign Secretary Sir John Simon and his undersecretary, Anthony Eden, who accepted false reassurances by the Führer at face value. Nonetheless, at Streza, the British joined France and Italy in vowing to oppose, by all appropriate measures, any unilateral cancellation of treaties, a warning that encompassed any remilitarization of the Rhineland, a vital part of the Franco-German frontier settlement at Locarno that had been guaranteed by Britain and Italy. Hitler immediately succeeded in weakening this Stresa front by concluding a naval treaty with the British that allowed Germany to tear up the limits imposed on its fleet at Versailles. The new treaty permitted him to triple existing naval tonnage to 35% of the British. 
the Stresa Front, was pronounced dead by Mussolini in January 1936, after the outbreak of the Italo-Abyssinian War, an opportunity taken by Hitler, as we have seen, to reoccupy the Rhineland, on Saturday, 7 March 1936. The timing of Hitler's coup de théâtre was influenced by reports of domestic unrest about rising food prices, the result of allocating foreign currency to buy arms-related raw materials. It has become commonplace to argue that this was the moment when the British and French could have stopped Hitler in his tracks, especially as his troops had hardly any ammunition and had to be augmented with policemen wearing military uniform. Leaving aside the fact that the Rhineland was indeed Germany's backyard, intervention was never realistically on the agenda. Even of those who later advertised themselves as anti-appeasers, like Labour's foreign affairs spokesman, Hugh Dalton. The French were not prepared to act alone, and the British lacked the means to join any military action, even had they possessed the will. What little will there might have been was undermined when Hitler immediately offered 25-year non-aggression pacts to France and Belgium, while suggesting he might rejoin the League of Nations. To round off his bloodless victory, an election was held on the sole issue of approval of the recovery of national sovereignty, which resulted in a 98.9% yes vote. Joint intervention in the Spanish Civil War brought warmer relations with the Italians, with Foreign Minister Ciano and Hitler signing secret October Protocols in Berlin in 1936. Although Hitler was cautious about the depth of German military involvement in Spain, he dominated the partnership from the outset, exaggerating the Bolshevik ideological affinity of leftist Popular Front governments in Spain and France. Since the Anglo-German naval agreement had not developed into the deeper understanding Hitler had hoped for, he dispatched Ribbentrop as ambassador to London, in the belief that this more dynamic emissary could secure a wide-ranging accord. But while Ribbentrop sought to persuade the British to give Germany carte blanche in Eastern Europe in return for non-interference in their empire, Hitler simultaneously explored other options. The most important of these was the November 1936 anti common turn pact with the Japanese. Once Hitler realized that Britain was not going to abandon France for a special relationship with Germany, he dismissed the two nations as being alike in their decadent weakness, a view nurtured by every report from Ribbentrop in London, especially after losing what the Nazis hoped would be their trump card, when the well-disposed King Edward VIII abdicated to pursue the demi-mondaine Wallace Simpson. Hitler concluded that there was more long-term value in his relationship with fascist Italy. He could not have both because any alliance with the British would have propelled Italy into the arms of the French. The rapid buildup of the German army between 1934 and 1936 was accompanied by a reorientation in thinking about how it might be deployed in future, a change influenced by the greater availability of tanks and officers who had thought about how to use them. In a memorandum drawn up in December 1935, General Ludwig Beck argued, Strategic defense can only be successful if it can also be carried out in the form of an attack. For this reason, an increase in offensive capacity represents a simultaneous strengthening of defensive capacity. In addition, Beck noted the importance of armor to ambitious targets, where the infantry would race to consolidate what the tanks had won. What those ambitious targets might be was broached by Hitler in a long and tense meeting on 5 November 1937 with Foreign Minister Neurath, War Minister Werner von Blomberg, and the three service chiefs, Werner von Fritsch for the Army, Hitler's henchman Göring for the Air Force, and Erich Raeder for the Navy. Notes taken by Hitler's military adjutant, Colonel Count Friedrich Hosbach, recorded how Hitler turned a meeting intended to resolve disputes about funding allocations into a lengthy tour d'horizon of grand strategy, where he felt more comfortable. This was not, however, before concentrating minds by ruling out both autarky and reintegration into the world economy in favor of expanding the economic base for rearmament through an expansion of living space, or Lebensraum. Although his musings did not correspond with how events eventually unfolded, and soft-pedaled his fundamental aim of winning living space at the expense of Russia, they began with the throwaway hypothesis that, force with its attendant risks— is the basis of the following exposition. 
He went on to explain the drawbacks of waiting until the rearmament program bore full fruit in 1943 through 5 before launching wars of aggression, without putting a precise chronology on action for the more proximate future. Contingencies 2 and 3 involved an opportunistic strike against Czechoslovakia alone, or Austria as well, should France become preoccupied either by civil strife or by a war with another neighbor. The point of these ventures was to improve our politico-military position by the acquisition of additional resources and military manpower, especially as three million people would be subject to compulsory emigration. Hitler saw Contingency 3 arising as early as 1938 from a possible Anglo-French war with Italy in the Mediterranean. Generals Blomberg and Fritsch raised so many objections that sullen annoyance began to show on their leader's face. A few weeks later, Foreign Minister Neurath also objected that such a policy could lead to world war, and that the goals could just as well be achieved through diplomacy. Hitler brushed this aside with claims that he had no more time, an allusion to his fear that he might soon die of cancer. After being reassured by the Führer that at all costs he would avoid a two-front war, German military planners went back to the map tables. Operation Red against France was downgraded in favor of Operation Green, a strike into Austria and Czechoslovakia, with a smaller force taking up a defensive posture in the West. Ribbentrop encouraged Hitler to believe that he might pursue such an option, as the ambassador was convinced that the British would not risk a fight for the existence of its world empire for the sake of a local Central European problem. France would not act if it lacked British backing. In February 1938, Hitler took advantage of a sexual scandal to replace Blomberg and appointed himself commander-in-chief. He also got rid of Fritsch, leaving Göring as the most powerful service chief, and replaced the nervous Neurath with Ribbentrop, who shared his own sense of urgency. While Hitler took upon himself the delicate handling of Mussolini, with the results we have seen, he delegated to Göring the task of undermining Austrian Chancellor Kurt von Schusnig, Dolphus's successor. Under the July 1936 Austro-German Agreement, which Schusnig imagined was definitive, Austria was supposed to act broadly in accordance with Germany's interests, while taking due cognizance of the views of Austria's national, that is, Nazi, opposition. In February 1938, Schusnig agreed to desist from persecuting Austria's Nazis and to appoint their chief spokesman, the Viennese lawyer Arthur Zeiss Inkart, to the key portfolio of Interior Minister. Zeiss Inkart was known to travel regularly to Berlin for instructions, and Schusnig bravely, or rashly, decided to risk a sudden plebiscite to give popular backing to Austria's continued desire for independence. Given that those under twenty-four years of age were disenfranchised, to exclude the generally Nazi-supporting student population, Hitler had grounds for concern that the vote would not go Germany's way. While Prince Philip of Hesse was dispatched to secure Mussolini's complicity, Göring threatened Schusnig until he resigned in favor of Zeiss Inkart. While the Austrian president prevaricated over his appointment, Zeiss Inkart sent a telegram, which Göring had drafted for him, inviting a German occupation. The telegram arrived in Berlin almost an hour after Hitler had already ordered Operation Otto, the fraternal invasion of his homeland. Arriving in his hometown of Linz, an emotionally overwrought Hitler authorized the Anschluss, an immediate union with Germany. Appalling cruelties were openly committed against Jews by triumphal and vengeful Nazis. So many Jews committed suicide in Vienna that the municipal gas company temporarily interrupted supplies to Jewish customers. A week before, on 3 March 1938, Hitler had received the elegant figure of Sir Neville Henderson, Britain's ambassador to Berlin. The ambassador epitomized everything Hitler disliked about the British, with his tasteful suits, claret-colored pullover, and trademark red carnation. Anderson brought what the British thought Hitler wanted, namely colonies, in return for a deal in Central Europe. He slyly cautioned that the Belgians, French, Italians, and Portuguese should not learn about the substance of these discussions. Wisely, for most of the colonies he was offering were in fact French. In addition to indicating an understanding over Austria and Czechoslovakia as a means of pacifying Central Europe, 
The British were prepared to carve up Africa so that Germany would have colonies, although not those it had ruled under the Wilhelmine Empire. To Henderson's dismay, a scowling Hitler dismissed Britain's attempts to interfere in Central Europe. He would not presume to interfere over Ireland, he said, and then expressed an honest indifference to the prospect of colonies, adding that the issue had caused too much fuss with Britain and France already. The interview convinced Hitler that he might be able to extract more from such willing interlocutors. Perhaps he recalled an earlier interview in November 1937 with the future Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax, in which the noble lord had signaled British willingness to countenance changes in the Versailles settlement, provided they were reasonable agreements, reasonably reached. Chapter 2 Appeasement 1. States of Mind the Anglo-French statesmen and diplomats who had to respond to the aggressions of the predators were haunted by the mass carnage they had witnessed during the Great War, and by the prospect of cities being razed by indiscriminate bombing. Nightmare visions of Verdun and the Somme, albeit translated into allied corpses floating in the Channel, would continue to haunt statesmen and generals until D-Day. Even before the Great War, the German-Jewish painter Ludwig Meidner had depicted the bombardment of cities. In its aftermath, novelists, with H. G. Wells's Shape of Things to Come, 1936, among the most popular works, ratcheted up these anxieties further. Newspaper, and especially newsreel coverage of bombing in Barcelona, or Jinzhou, gave substance to such foreboding. Guilt and fear shaped the Anglo-French policy of appeasement, though not in the sense evoked by Guilty Men, a contemporary polemic that was published only after the policy's failure became manifest. Its authors included the future MP Michael Foote, whose Labour Party opposed rearmament. The team's agent absconded with the royalties. Survivor guilt was pervasive among those who experienced the wastage of youthful promise and talent a view that, inadvertently, accorded greater salience to poets and sculptors than to clerks and butchers' boys. Modern war involved mass conscript armies, rather than professionals paid to assume such risks on society's behalf, exacting a human cost on sectors of society that had never paid it before. The heaviness of the burden was apparent in the case of Neville Chamberlain, the conscientious ministerial workhorse who, as Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1931 onwards, strongly influenced British defence and foreign policy, even before he became Prime Minister, in May 1937. When he recalled Norman Chamberlain, his cousin, best friend, and fellow Birmingham councillor, killed with his entire company in 1916, Chamberlain wrote, I feel a despicable thing beside him. But war service, or the sadness of losing relatives and friends to the carnage, was not an infallible guide to how politicians and others viewed policy choices, or the prospect of war, as the examples of the veterans Hitler, Mussolini, and Churchill indicate. The Austrian and the Italian exulted in war as a means of national or racial regeneration. But while Churchill was still stirred by the drama of war, after his brief period of service in France, he was mindful of the hell where youth and laughter go. A view of war as an instrument of regeneration was unthinkable to the leaders of the democracies, for whom war was a catastrophe for civilization as a whole. Chamberlain resorted to unusually strong language, hateful and damnable, when he spoke reluctantly of the need for rearmament, at the expense of the alleviation of suffering the opening out of fresh institutions and recreations, the care of the old, the development of the minds and bodies of the young. All the amenities that a liberal civilization was capable of bestowing would be wasted on inert gray metal and brass casings, whose ultimate function was to kill and maim. Since one in five British and Irish peers and their sons died in the war— it is hardly surprising that many members of the aristocracy were anxious for Anglo-German reconciliation. Quite apart from a minority, epitomized by Lord Londonderry, who more explicitly admired Nazism's discipline, or shared his fear of Bolshevism and anti-Semitism. Though only Benny, the Duke of Westminster, 
cherished a secret book called The Jews' Who's Who. A sense of guilt extended to the former wartime enemy, although Chamberlain had showed no signs of it when he caught sight of savage-looking German prisoners in their cages on a four-day trip he made to the Somme after the war. While many had agreed with the call that the Hun must pay, with Edward Wood, the future Lord Halifax, a firm advocate of tough terms, the continuation of the naval blockade after the armistice, which had starved German civilians to secure compliance with Allied peace terms, inclined some to feel pity for the defeated foe. The political economist John Maynard Keynes wrote an influential polemic on the wider economic effects of Versailles, which gave some factual basis to that view. Sympathy for the vanquished Germans was joined by mounting disgust at the apparently vindictive French, who tenaciously sought to disable German might, despite that country's transition from autocracy to republican parliamentary democracy. Winston Churchill was one of the few to point out that the Allies' treatment of Germany in 1919 contrasted favorably with the terms Imperial Germany had dictated to Russia at Brest-Litovsk two years earlier, when the boot was on the other foot. Then there was the future. The desire to avoid war was conditioned by widespread fear of bombing that resembled, in its irrational terror, a later generation's dread of nuclear weapons. Literary fictions with titles like War Over England reflected the usually amiable Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin's gloomy certainty, aired in 1932, that the Channel was no longer a bulwark, and the bomber would always get through. Figures were extrapolated wildly from the modest casualties that bombing had caused in the Great War, and then exaggerated further by multiples based on new technical capabilities— and projected onto inflated figures for German aircraft production, without regard to the fact that Luftwaffe bombers were primarily designed to provide tactical support for armored formations. In fact, it was not until 1940, when the Nazis acquired forward air bases in occupied France, that they could launch the air attacks that Britons dreaded throughout the 1930s. Fear of a single massive strike, delivered by waves of aircraft eclipsing the sun, and the mass panic this would cause on the ground was widespread. When it came, the blitz was more like a damp squib than the annihilation subsequently visited on German cities. Although they never admitted their error or took responsibility for the consequences, pacifist organizations irresponsibly propagated lurid visions of bombs and chemical weapons wiping out entire populations. Although in 1938 Germany was not capable of doing any such thing, this nightmare fantasy haunted Chamberlain as he flew back from his second meeting with Hitler at bonn Gottesberg, where he had just pleaded that if the Fuhrer invaded Czechoslovakia, he should not bomb Prague. According to Secretary of State for India, Lord Zetland, I remember him saying that as he saw spread out like a map beneath him the mile upon mile of flimsy houses which constituted the east end of London, he could not bear to think of their inmates lying a prey to bombardment from the air. It is important to remember the feelings of dread, as well as sheer nervous exhaustion which afflicted the participants in the drama of appeasement. As one of its opponents in cabinet, Duff Cooper, recorded in his diary, every morning one wakes up with a feeling of sickening anxiety, which gradually gives way to the excitements of the day. Chamberlain had to take pills to enable him to sleep more than a few hours each night, and came close to a nervous breakdown at the height of the Munich crisis, when war seemed a couple of hours away. 2. A Popular Policy Appeasement is indivisibly associated with Chamberlain, its most obdurate proponent, although many rats had to get off the sinking ship to leave the captain in such splendid isolation. A passive form of appeasement shaped the collective outlook of the governing class of the day, before hardening into the active policy that Chamberlain pursued to the point where it had all the inflexibility of an ideological conviction or religious belief. It evolved from longer traditions and habits of mind, the instinctive preference of a satiated imperial nation for which mere maintenance of empire came at a cost, which regarded peace as indispensable to commerce, and whose people, having gained their democratic voice, expected social progress rather than war. The Great War had discredited conventional balance-of-power politics based on alliances. 
The public mood was one of no more wars, a sentiment that extended into such veterans' associations as the British Legion, together with its French and German counterparts. The Church of England recanted its jingoist excesses in 1914 through 18 with the wholesale adoption of militant pacifism. An antipathy to rearmament and naive belief in collective security, as symbolized by the League of Nations, was especially evident on the left of the political spectrum. The left may have deplored what the Nazis did to the Social Democrats, but so powerful was their detestation of merchants of death and militarism that they opposed even prudent rearmament while declaiming against fascism, thus demonstrating a conceptual failure to grasp what was uniquely vicious about Nazism. When Labour and the Marxist left passionately adopted the cause of the Spanish Republicans, they managed to advocate, as a more skeptical Hugh Dalton pointedly remarked, arms for Spain but no arms for Britain. Dalton would shortly outwit the Labour leftist Stafford Cripps, thereby ensuring that the party belatedly supported rearmament, although until early 1939 it opposed even a modest degree of conscription. The conservative right had its own problems, including those who saw only the positive side of the new order in Germany, such as keeping bumptious or Bolshevik Jews in their place. All of which is to say that Chamberlain was captive to popular sentiment, rather than a leader like Churchill, who bore grim things. 3. A Realistic Wrong Policy the 1920s were characterized by belief that with its empire, Britain could be semi-detached from Europe, its role confined to that of a part-time umpire in a game of cricket that Continentals had never played. Since the RAF's aerial policing could deal with colonial insurgents on the cheap, there could be major cuts in spending on the Army and Navy. The overall defense budget fell from £519 million in 1920 to £123 million, in 1929, when Chancellor Winston Churchill perpetuated the Ten-Year Rule, introduced in 1919, which assumed that no major war would take place for ten years, and which became the basis for decisions by the Committee on Imperial Defense. By extending it for a further ten years, he was able to justify swinging cuts in the Navy. Such economies were intended to realize a wider peace dividend— in the form of improved education, health, pensions, and public housing, designed to cauterize domestic labor unrest, or as tax cuts for the industrious middle classes. Defense cuts appealed to those who passionately believed in disarmament as the key to a safer world, even if it was fiscal conservatives rather than League of Nations zealots who wielded the knife. The other side of the coin was the promiscuous moralizing of the League's supporters, the bane of British service chiefs, who did not want to be dragged into endless wars through the League lobby's manipulation of public sentiment. Finally, the onset of the Depression served to focus loyalties on the dependable cocoon of empire, with Britain opting for imperial preference trade tariffs at the 1932 Ottawa Conference, further distancing itself from Europe's endemic quarrels. In an ideal world, the Austro-Hungarian Empire would never have been supplanted by a patchwork of quarrelsome successor states to which neither Britain nor France was prepared to offer military assistance, just as no one looking at the mess of the Middle East would so casually have wished away the Ottoman Empire. That lack of interest was also natural for a governing class that often knew more about the Afrikaner, Maasai, or Pathan than about Britain's geographic neighbors, among whom they merely holidayed, soaking up the glorious past and ignoring the contemporary reality of everyone but hotelier and waiters. It was also the view from the self-governing dominions, whose leaders could point to the massed graves of Australians, Canadians, and South Africans, to caution against Britain going to war over a minor European country. Although Australia had only five million people, it had suffered more Great War dead than the USA. Moreover, both Canada, with its Québécois, and South Africa, with its white-majority Afrikaners, had to negotiate delicate domestic political issues before they could contemplate realizing the doctrine of common belligerence. But then there was Britain's nearest neighbor and former wartime ally. After failing to receive an Anglo-American guarantee of security against Germany, France's leaders fitfully attempted to bolster the League of Nations, 
before reverting to the view expressed by Foreign Minister Louis Bartou, that it's alliances that count. Specifically, the French hoped that a cluster of alliances with four of the Eastern European successor states, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Romania, and Yugoslavia, would compensate for the loss of their pre-war alliance with Tsarist Russia. In fact, these alliances were contradictory and untidy, as well as riddled with revanchist animosities, and were never accompanied by any serious joint military planning for an eastern front. The effectiveness of these alliances was substantially undermined when the 1925 Locarno Treaties guaranteed Western European frontiers without securing those of Germany's eastern neighbors. Continuing in the heady spirit of Locarno, in 1928, French Foreign Minister Aristide Briand and a less enthusiastic U.S. Secretary of State, Frank B. Kellogg, persuaded several states to sign up to a declaration against sin, the treaty for the renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy. Meanwhile, France's relative demographic decline, which became glaring in the 1930s as the loss of young men in 1914 through 18 made itself felt in a declining birth rate, led to the construction of the Maginot Line from 1929 onwards a vast system of fortifications, tunnels, railways, and gun emplacements covering the Franco-German border intended to permit the field armies to achieve greater concentration. Such a tangible statement of a defensive mentality led France's Eastern European allies to doubt its willingness to act should Germany attack them. Finally, domestic fears of communism meant that the 1932 non-aggression pact with the Soviets never developed into military cooperation. Bartu, its most committed exponent, died alongside the King of Yugoslavia when the latter was assassinated in 1934. Belated attempts to re-involve Russia in Eastern Europe always broke down because of the unwillingness of France's local allies, especially Poland and Romania, to allow Soviet forces transit for a lunge against Germany. Once in, they would never be out. Domestic turmoil also impacted on foreign policy. When Hitler sent troops into the Rhineland in March 1936, France had the misfortune of a caretaker cabinet led by the elderly radical Albert Sarrault. The cabinet met to listen to General Maurice Gamelin expatiate about the strength of Germany's armed forces, even as Germany's generals trembled at the thought of French reprisals. The advent in 1936 of a popular front government encompassing socialists and radicals and propped up by the communists, may have resulted, despite pervasive pacifism, in increased arms spending to fight international fascism. But the domestic chaos and strife that the coalition presided over led many on the political right to espouse the facile formula Better Hitler than Blum, the moderate French socialist leader. After the demise of the Popular Front government, the radical Édouard Daladier made the fateful choice of dropping Foreign Minister Joseph Paul Boncourt, who had a clear-eyed understanding of the threat from Germany. His replacement, Georges Bonnet, may have been intelligent, but many thought him devoid of a moral center in an age when politicians were supposed to have one. A self-styled realist, Bonnet believed that the Eastern alliances might drag France into war. Soon after his appointment, he revealed his essential views in an interview with Paris Soir. Don't let us go in for heroism. We are not up to it. The English will not follow us. As foreign minister, I am determined to play my part fully, and it consists of finding a solution before the minister of war has to take one. France can no longer allow herself a bloodletting like that of 1914. Our population figures are going down every day. And finally, the Popular Front has reduced the country to such a state that it must get ready for a sensible convalescence. A rash movement might be fatal. Britain faced the most widespread potential conflicts, with Japan in the Far East, Italy in the Mediterranean, and Germany over Central Europe. The cardinal principle, as starkly stated by the Defense Requirements Committee, was to avoid a situation in which Britain might simultaneously clash with all three. Worldwide British interests were not matched by the resources to defend them, especially after the leaders of the self-governing dominions emphasized that they were not going to be dragged into a war over some obscure European country. 
That view was shared by the British government. Following the assassination of Dolfus in 1934, Foreign Secretary Sir John Simon said, Our foreign policy is quite clear. We must keep out of troubles in Central Europe at all costs. July twenty years ago, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which lit the fuse to the Great War, stands out as a dreadful warning. While Germany was recognized to be the most dangerous long-term enemy, in the shorter term Japan and Italy were the more immediate threats, especially as these were naval powers capable of menacing vital British overseas interests. In Western eyes, Japanese aggression in Manchuria came at the worst possible time, in the depths of the Great Depression. The lawless chaos of China meant that many in the U.S. and Britain, who were not overtly sympathetic to Japan, were disposed to a six-of-one, half-a-dozen-of-the-other view. Japan was modernizing Manchuria, where it was a bulwark against the Soviets. Where else was it supposed to range? Australia? The Japanese cunningly described their actions in Manchuria as self-defense, while continuing to subscribe to the wider Washington Treaty System governing relations in the Pacific region. Western acquiescence in Japanese actions weakened with the bloody feint in Shanghai, which literally made Japanese aggression visible from the rooftops of the International Settlement Enclave, and the proclamation of an independent Manchukuo, a flagrant violation of the status quo. There was also an inherent tension between the ideals of the League of Nations and the Great Power's insistence on retaining regional spheres of special interest. What the Japanese were doing in Manchuria was little more than what the U.S. practiced in Cuba, Mexico, or Nicaragua. The U.S. may have been loud in its moral condemnations of Japanese aggression, but President Herbert Hoover set policy. These acts, by Japan, do not imperil the freedom of the American people, the economic or moral future of our people. I do not propose ever to sacrifice American life for anything short of this. We will not go along on war or any of the sanctions, either economic or military, for those are roads to war. While the U.S. Secretary of State, Henry Stimson, demanded that the League, to which the U.S. did not belong, should be vocal in condemning Japan, the British recognized that although their material interests in the Far East were greater than the Americans, they lacked the local forces to defend them. The nearest major fleet would have to steam from Malta, into seas all too likely to be dominated by Japan. In these circumstances, the British opted for the thankless policy of trying to retain the goodwill of China, Japan, the League of Nations, and the U.S. The British also hoped that the face-sensitive Japanese might bow to the force of international public opinion, rather than suffer ostracism. Britain endeavored to support Chinese requests that the League do something, but not to the extent of precluding a liberal turn in the Japanese government, a non-existent possibility promoted by Britain's pro-Japanese ambassador in Tokyo. The 1932 Lytton Report, commissioned by the League, condemned China for harming Japanese interests and Japan for illegal changes to the territorial status quo. As a compromise solution, the report proposed an autonomous Manchuria, but with generous representation of Japanese advisers in its government. As a token rap on the knuckles, the British supported a four-week arms embargo declared by the League against both nations, at which the Japanese withdrew their ambassador from the League's Geneva headquarters. The U.S. did not manage even a brief embargo, and kept arms and oil flowing to Japan. Foreign Secretary Simon's less-than-glorious handling of this Far Eastern crisis, and a public perception that the League had been betrayed, resulted in Baldwin replacing him with whore while Eden was appointed Minister of State for League Affairs. British conservatives often admired Mussolini, although Churchill was being Machiavellian when he dubbed him the Roman genius and the greatest lawgiver among living men. Unlike Hitler, whose fitful charm did not conceal lurking resentments that power never assuaged, the Duce was socially vivacious. Apart from their indulgent view of the Italian dictatorship's prodigies of domestic efficiency, British politicians regarded Mussolini as indispensable to the Streza framework for constraining Hitler. There was a price to pay. In return for his cooperation, Mussolini assumed he had British and French tacit consent for his ambitions in Abyssinia. 
He may have been right about Pierre Laval, whose keenness on an understanding with his fellow lapsed socialist was already reflected in the Franco-Italian-Rome agreements of January 1935. Throughout the subsequent period, France was probably more concerned with Italian aggression in the Mediterranean than it was about Hitler. While many British politicians were contemptuous of Abyssinia, Tory Foreign Secretary Simon's wife was a vociferous campaigner against its slave trade, public sentiment meant that they could not explicitly support Italian aggression. Enthusiasm for the League of Nations, as manifest in the League-organized 1935 peace ballot, was largely responsible for the Baldwin government's support for League coercion of Mussolini after the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, even though the British fervently hoped that the French would not cooperate in imposing sanctions. Unfortunately, the sinuous Laval did cooperate, and the League duly mandated sanctions. In the Foreign Office, the permanent undersecretary Robert Bansitart hastened to ensure that they did not include denying Italy oil, fearing that Mussolini might launch some retaliatory mad-dog attack on the British. Simon's successor, Samuel Hoare and Laval, met secretly in Paris to plot how best to sell out Abyssinia, in the tradition of great powers disposing of the territory of lesser nations. But they were forced to resign when details of their talks were exposed in the French and British press. Public opinion had fully ingested the doctrine of national self-determination, hoisted on Europe by President Woodrow Wilson at Versailles, and the U.S. press also lambasted the deal choosing to overlook the fact that U.S. oil exports to Italy had surged since the war started. Britain now contrived to aggravate Mussolini by threatening oil sanctions, then dropping them when the French tried to link their support for sanctions to the maintenance of a demilitarized Rhineland. As we have seen, Hitler was to take advantage of Anglo-French disarray following the 1935 Anglo-German naval agreement to ignore the advice of his generals and to send his troops into the Rhineland. The Nazis have become so synonymous with absolute evil that it requires considerable effort to understand how foreign statesmen reacted to them at the time. Diplomats provided the equivalent of Kremlinology in their regular assessments of who was up or down, moderate or rabid in the regime. Following two British ambassadors who disliked the Nazis, Neville Henderson was sent to Berlin. He was judged something of an expert on dictators because of experience in monarchical Yugoslavia. But he was also chosen because he was a good shot, a shared interest that led to a friendship with Goering. The Nazis also raised the perennial problem of how far the domestic character of a regime should influence the way other states reacted to it. British statesmen may have deplored the persecution of the Jews, or, as in Chamberlain's case, merely registered that it was happening. But even Churchill, who spoke on this issue more than most, was adamant that a country's internal affairs were its own. The realities of the case, however, did not fit into the tidy internal-external dichotomy. German persecutions created the international problem posed by Jewish refugees, in Britain's case exacerbating tensions in its mandate of Palestine. An even more difficult problem was the extent to which a nation's international conduct could be predicted from its domestic policies, hardly an exact science, despite the certainty with which historians sometimes dress up hypothetical reconstructions of alternative outcomes. British statesmen believed that if Hitler tore up Versailles in a controlled and consensual way, Germany would then become a powerful member of the European concert. At worst, if Mein Kampf was to be believed, he might at some future point turn on Russia which senior conservatives like Baldwin did not regard as a disastrous outcome. Britain's power was still considerable, as acknowledged by the alliance Hitler offered it. It seemed inconceivable that he would turn on Britain itself. British policy towards Germany after the advent of a Nazi regime was dominated by the ongoing question of disarmament, which had survived the change of government. Such talks are invariably characterized by deception and hypocrisy, with obsolescent arms offered up while potent weapons are retained. The Geneva talks, commenced in 1932, continued until October 1933, when, for the second time, Germany withdrew. The British were sympathetic to German arguments about the unfairness of unilateral arms limitations, despite general agreements to disarm. 
Hence, they wanted Germany to be allowed limited rearmament, while urging France to scale down its own forces. The French refused to do this without security guarantees that the British were not prepared to give. Churchill was among those who wholly agreed with the French, seeing a strong France as essential to Europe's peace. He liked Lord Grey's witticism that, though armed to the teeth, France was pacifist to the core. The first part of that proposition was, in fact, false. A year before the Nazis came to power, Churchill had wondered what spirits animated all these bands of sturdy Teutonic youths marching through the streets and roads of Germany with the light of desire in their eyes. He doubted whether they were interested in the abstruse formulas of disarmament negotiators, the capacity to imagine the diabolic, which perhaps required having a little of the devil in himself, was one virtue that distinguished Churchill from his more grounded colleagues. They were like electric plugs equipped with the obligatory green earth, incapable of sparking. Before the Great War, he had been forcibly struck by the engine-like movements of the German army on maneuvers he attended. Later, he explicitly drew attention to the dictatorial nature of the new German government and the public pugnacity it encouraged, and expressed fear of the use to which it might put the prodigies of Krupp of Essen, the armaments manufacturers. His perception was accurate. The Germans used the talks as a convenient cover to begin the first and most risky expansion of their own armaments, and abandoned them once the period of vulnerability had passed. After Hitler had sent troops into the Rhineland, Baldwin attributed as much blame to the persistently intransigent French as to the Germans, while invoking Charlemagne to illustrate the elasticity of frontiers. Anthony Eden took the lead in discerning higher objectives within a new situation he affected to call deplorable. This was the appeasement of Europe as a whole that we constantly have before us. In other words, long before Chamberlain became prime minister, British leaders had adopted the view that Hitler's violations of treaties could be overlooked in the interests of the greater good of a general peace. They were supported by public opinion, which could not see why German troops should not enter Cologne or Essen. As a taxi driver told Eden, I suppose Jerry can do what he likes in his own back garden, can't he? In fact, the British army was in no position to act, and the mood in the commons was anything to keep out of war. As Baldwin said of the Tory backbenchers, the boys won't have it. Labor and liberal boys agreed. Echoing the government's tendency to put an optimistic spin on every strategic defeat, the headline in The Times was A Chance to Rebuild. Under its editor, Geoffrey Dawson, The Times became the government's clack, suppressing stories that exposed the duplicitous nature of the dictators. Hitler's own tactics made it difficult to respond decisively. The moment he had moved his troops, not overtly against the French, be it noted, the Führer immediately expressed his desire for an air pact, non-aggression pacts, and Germany's return to the League of Nations, and raised the prospect of negotiations about a new demilitarized zone to which Germany would contribute territory along with Belgium and France. Equity dominated another area of policy, for many of the British could not grasp why Germans should be denied the Wilsonian principles of national self-determination that the Allies had enshrined elsewhere. Quite apart from the sinister nature of his government, this was to regard Germany's physical size, economic might, and population as if they were of little or no account. Since the British prided themselves on the moral underpinnings of their foreign policy, they were peculiarly susceptible to appeals couched in the rhetoric of human rights, a language Hitler knew how to manipulate, although this is often forgotten in the cold light of his colossal inhumanity. He, too, could express abhorrence about bombing babies, although he was to have hundreds of thousands of them murdered. The susceptible included Ambassador Henderson, a man who always emphasized the moral aspect of policymaking, even if he took his role of getting beneath Germany's skin too literally. He conceived his responsibility to include selling the virtues of Nazi Germany to Britain, although the only virtue he could find to sell was the discipline and physical fitness of young people in labor-front camps. Regularly thwarted in his quest for a personal meeting with Hitler, Henderson struck up a friendship with Goering, hunting horns evocatively lowing over the twilight corpses of deer they had shot. 
He was also full of sympathy for the German predicament after Versailles. In a retrospect, written in 1940, shortly before his death from cancer, he wrote, The basic fault, in my humble opinion, of the Versailles Treaty was its failure to accord Germans the same right of self-determination which had granted Poles, Czechs, Yugoslavs, and Romanians. At that time, the Austrians and Sudeten Germans had clamored for union with Germany, but the higher moral principles were waived in favor of political and strategic considerations, which could not admit of any accretion of territory for a defeated but always potentially dangerous Germany. 4. Character It would be wrong to pretend that crucial changes in personnel did not have a bearing on the transformation of appeasement from a cast of mind into a doctrine or dogma, or from a passive reflex into an active policy. Britain acquired a prime minister with little direct experience in foreign affairs, but with considerable pretensions to expertise in them. Age sixty-eight on succeeding, without a general election to the highest office, Neville Chamberlain was unlikely to change his views. His manner has attracted much criticism from middle-class historians, who ape the snobbery of Chamberlain's upper-class contemporary detractors. The unkind compared him with a coroner. Although his shy manner was surprisingly well suited to the conversational style of the newsreel interview, where the chilliness and contempt he exhibited in parliamentary debates was temporarily abandoned, and he became what Lilliput magazine called a beautiful llama, an accurate description of his face when viewed full on. Everything in Chamberlain's career, as Lord Mayor of Birmingham, as Minister of Health, and as the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who had shepherded his country through the Depression, made him reluctant to gamble the emoluments of peace for the risks of war, even the fuddy-duddy language being revealing. Perhaps competition with a rich, famous, and successful father, and with his half-brother Austin, who in 1925 had won the Nobel Peace Prize for his achievements at the Locarno Summit, explained Chamberlain's iron belief in the virtues of dogged hard work based on mastery of each brief an approach that carries many to the point where rarer gifts are needed than those he possessed. His role in Britain's longer-term defense is often cited in mitigation, but the short-term weaknesses, which surely counted in this context, were at the root of his foreign policy. Compared with Germany's speed in rearming, Britain was slow to leave the starting line and to decide fundamental priorities. As Chancellor, Chamberlain had a keen appreciation that financial stability was a strategic asset in itself, especially as the U.S. refused to give credit to countries that had defaulted on Great War loans. Indeed, so little did he esteem the windy moralizing of the U.S. that in 1934 he believed Britain should ally itself with Japan. He had an understanding of the dynamic nature of modern armaments for what was the point of spending huge sums of money on stockpiling weapons that could rapidly become obsolete. Chamberlain believed strongly in the deterrent effects of air power, to which he insisted on devoting the lion's share of the resources that a public disinclined towards rearmament were prepared to allot. But there was a catch, for that stance also necessitated a reduction of meaningful continental military commitments. In 1935 and 1937, the Treasury— which ultimately called the shots in Whitehall, decreed two sets of cuts in the budgets of the infantry forces that might be deployed to the continent. A point seldom made in Chamberlain's defense is that he did not share Churchill's belief that Britain should seek to match Germany bomber for bomber, to achieve a purely deterrent effect. Instead, Chamberlain switched resources to building up a fighter force, a defensive measure that could be more easily sold to the public and which, compared to bombers, came in at a quarter of the cost per aircraft. This would ward off an initial German onslaught before both sides fought a long war of attrition, which Imperial Britain would win because of its superior economic resources. In reality, both he and Baldwin were too much in dread of a largely imaginary German bomber onslaught which the Luftwaffe was certainly not capable of launching from German bases at the time they pursued the policy of appeasement. Ironically, the main proponent of bombers, although for imperial deployment, was Lord Londonderry, Baldwin's air minister, who has gone down in history as an upper-class crypto-Nazi. 
Appeasement was the corollary of this belated attempt at rearmament, something to tide the country over the danger period identified by its defense and intelligence chiefs. It had something of the making-do, unsystematic approach that appeals to the English temperament, although it also evolved into fashionable opinion across the entire range of the British establishment, from all souls via the Church of England to the Times newspaper. Beyond this was the smart London society of Channons and Cunards, with their cynically silly flirtations with such scintillating charlatans as the German ambassador Ribbentrop, a man most top Nazis regarded as an idiot, given the London posting to get him away from Berlin. After one London cocktail party had relocated to Berlin, they joked that SS chief Heinrich Himmler resembled a department manager at Harrods, unaware that they themselves were lightweight jetsam bobbing towards a catastrophe. Foreign policy was not such a precise science as structuring a country's armaments or economy for war. Therefore, it was the stage to which many politicians aspired. In the view of his detractors, Chamberlain never lost the air of a provincial seeking to shine in the big city. However, even allowing for envious snobbery, there was a great deal of truth in Duff Cooper's characterization of Chamberlain's outlook. The dictators of Germany and Italy were like the Lord Mayors of Liverpool and Manchester, who might belong to different political parties and have different interests, but who must desire the welfare of humanity and be fundamentally reasonable, decent men like himself. This misconception lay at the root of his policy and explains his mistakes. Chamberlain argued, correctly, that in a totalitarian system it made sense to speak to the man at the top. What he could not see was that his mastery of municipal politics, or of a complex ministerial portfolio like public health, took him only from A to B, rather than to Z, when it came to dealing with personalities and forces that lay completely beyond his comprehension. Although Chamberlain's diaries show he was fully aware that Hitler and Mussolini were political desperados, his belief that people of goodwill everywhere fundamentally desired peace led him to imagine that the dictators must, deep down inside, share such sentiments. Everything could be resolved, he once told the Soviet ambassador, by sitting round a table going through Germany's grievances with a pencil, a view which failed to encompass Hitler's wider geo-racial vision. He dismissed the view that they were entirely inhuman. I believe this idea to be quite erroneous. There was, however, no consistency in this belief, nor was it prudent to use diplomacy to discover Hitler's inner humanitarian. One minute Hitler was a lunatic, the next he was someone Chamberlain could do business with, and whose flattery he courted. Churchill's view, derived from such informed observers as Frederick Voigt of the Manchester Guardian, that Nazism involved the fetish worship of one man, could not be reconciled with Chamberlain's unimaginative rationalism. Of course, like many rationalists, he was not devoid of his own irrational beliefs. He invested extraordinary faith in dubious evidence that ordinary Germans or Italians did not want war any more than the British discounting the fact that in dictatorships their views would usually be registered only by the secret police. We are all members of the human race and subject to the like passions and affections and fears and desires, he said. There must be something in common between us, if only we can find it. Chamberlain's faith in reason as the universal panacea led him to believe that if reasonable demands were made, then they could be reasonably accommodated. Unfortunately, the dictators reasoned that the reasonable would also meet outrageous demands, as they duly did, going on to make the further assumption that the reasonable were decadent and would never confront them. Foreign Secretary Eden resigned in February 1938, after three years in the post, over being second-guessed about policy towards Mussolini. The BBC chose not to broadcast an interview with him afterwards, lest it upset the policy of appeasement that seems to be written into the corporation's DNA. Thenceforth, Chamberlain effectively shared the role of foreign secretary with Lord Halifax, who could speak only in the upper house. They had been coordinating their own alternative foreign policy, especially whenever Eden was absent on official business, preferring such dubious emissaries as Austin Chamberlain's widow Ivy, 
or Chamberlain's Eminence Grise, Sir Horace Wilson, to reach out to Mussolini. The Unitarian Prime Minister trusted the High Anglican peer, whose gravedigger's face suggested honor and high-mindedness, a man truly born to rule, with all the expectations this large assumption entailed under the social codes of the time. Halifax rebuked one of the few bishops, Hensley Henson of York, who dared to criticize Archbishop Cosmo Lang's persistent faith in Mussolini despite the Abyssinian venture. Little or nothing in Halifax's smooth progress to the top equipped him to deal with Europe's déclassé dictators, either. He was sincerely sly. They had the cunning of Al Capone. His memoirs describe, with pious, self-deprecating smugness, his smooth ascent via Eton, All Souls, and Delhi, where he was viceroy, all achieved through luck and nepotism, and padded with the usual tedious Oxbridge legends of deaf college porters and solecisms handling the port, which make Englishmen seem like retarded bores. These witty banalities of a man in arrested adolescence have more immediacy and insight than his pedestrian accounts of the events leading to war. Rather revealingly, whereas Halifax routinely forwarded the letters of Nazi sympathizers to Special Branch, he always exempted those written by members of his class, such as the Marquess of Tavistock. The cabinet's Big Four of Chamberlain, Halifax, Hoare, and Simon were routinely supported by the majority of yes-men, as Duff Cooper called them, around the cabinet table. The fact that both Simon, 1931 through 5, and Hoare, June through December 1935, had themselves been foreign secretary, added further weight to their views. Chamberlain's own flaws are abundantly evident from his contemporaneous diaries, although they went predictably unremarked by the royal family, who were among his greatest admirers. Trite nursery-room maxims such as, If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, were combined with belief in his own mission as Europe's savior. This last conceit, which translated into his lone voyages to Germany, may have been connected with his awareness that at some point before autumn 1939 he would have to venture a general election, and a foreign policy triumph might have clinched victory. The testy logic with which he defended his views immunized him from criticism. He viewed the maverick Churchill as erratic and unstable, Eden as a vain glamour boy, and the Foreign Office as a narrow caste that spent too much time with foreigners. There was also an unattractive vanity that sought solace in every carefully noted fan letter, be it from a king or a credulous old lady requesting a chip of his umbrella to insert in a reliquary. An old man's vanity partly explains why he made so many basic mistakes, although the people colluded with him. In June 1937, a few weeks after he had become Prime Minister, Chamberlain outlined his views on British foreign policy for representatives of the Dominions, who were invariably a constraint on Britain's ability to commit itself in Europe. As a former Chancellor, with a businessman's faith in the ameliorative powers of trade, Chamberlain argued that Germany might welcome measures to ease its current economic difficulties, problems largely caused by breakneck rearmament. He had high hopes of Hjalmar Schacht, the German finance minister. Typically, he invested in Schacht's when Schacht's were on the way down, a view that conformed with that of the city of London, which sought to protect the money it had invested in Germany. He thought that Germany's ambitions were limited to reunion with Austria and the deliverance of ethnic Germans marooned in the uncongenial environments of Czechoslovakia, Lithuania, and Poland. These were large assumptions, based on accepting the ethnic rationalizations for Hitler's policies, without considering the possibility that the Führer might covet the arms industries and labor of these countries for further acts of aggression, an odd oversight in a man with a background in business and economics. That October, he, and the Foreign Office, encouraged Halifax to see Hitler, after he had received an unrelated invitation to a hunting exhibition. Halifax conveyed the crucial message that we were not necessarily concerned to stand for the status quo as today. If reasonable settlements could be reached with the free assent and goodwill of those primarily concerned, 
we certainly have no desire to block. The term primarily concerned held an ominous ambiguity for Hitler's smaller neighbors. At lunch, the former Viceroy of India became dimly aware of incompatible values as Hitler's rambling conversation drifted from his favorite film, Gary Cooper in Henry Hathaway's Lives of a Bengal Lancer, to the problem of Indian nationalism, perhaps seeking to connect with a guest he thought looked like an English parson. Shoot Gandhi, Hitler said, and if that does not suffice to reduce them to submission, shoot a dozen leading members of Congress, and if that doesn't suffice, shoot two hundred and so on until order is established. Halifax claimed he gazed at Hitler with a mixture of astonishment, repugnance, and compassion, and did not strain himself to disagree before dutifully returning home to put indirect pressure on newspaper cartoonists who had attracted Hitler's ire. Armed with Halifax's assessment of the Führer, in November Chamberlain expressed the essence of his government's approach in a weekly letter to his sister Ida. I don't see why we shouldn't say to Germany, give us satisfactory assurances that you won't use force to deal with the Austrians and Czechoslovakians, and we will give you similar assurances that we won't use force to prevent the changes you want, if you can get them by peaceful means. If appeasement was an alternative to U.S.-style isolationism, an easier option when two oceans rather than the English Channel intervened, then it also meant Britain behaving like a busy-bodying schoolmistress, a national flaw that has endured beyond the precipitate diminution of British power since Suez. Thus Britain came to practice third-party diplomacy, ultimately denying representation to those whose fate was being determined. Although the British affected the stance of an empire, the long-held view that no single power should dominate the continent meant that Britain also became a player. Its attempts to stipulate the rules of the game in Central Europe were accompanied by a refusal to contemplate alliances or the use of military force to ensure that Hitler acted with the respect for the international proprieties the rules sought to uphold. Unlike Churchill, the appeasers refused to accept that Hitler was pursuing a deliberate plan of aggression, concentrating his sights on a single limited target at a time, but always seeking ultimate domination of Central Europe. Unlike Churchill, too, many of the appeasers were disdainful of the League of Nations as a possible forum for frustrating, rather than merely denouncing, outright aggression. They saw themselves as realists, although their own chimerical quest for a general European peace settlement, without alliances or threats of war to strengthen their own hand, was incredibly idealistic, too. What Churchill would call the pursuit of Futile Good Intentions 5. Nazi Germany on the March, 1938-1939 through 1939. The tactics Hitler was prepared to employ towards an independent foreign state became abundantly evident with the Anschluss of 10-11 through 11 March, 1938, when, as it happened, official London was entertaining the former Ambassador Ribbentrop newly promoted to foreign minister. Filled with accumulated hatred of the British, Ribbentrop must have savored the moment. Even the accommodating Halifax had been moved to protest against Germany's denying Schusnig the right to hold a plebiscite in his own country, and had warned that, if war should start in Central Europe, it was quite impossible to say where it might end or who might not become involved. After lunch on the 11th, Chamberlain emphasized to Ribbentrop his Sincere wish for an understanding with Germany. His mood changed when incoming cables reported that Schusnig had caved in to intimidation and would resign. Later that day, Halifax remarked, What was happening was an exhibition of naked force, and the public opinion of Europe would inevitably ask what there was to prevent the German government from seeking to apply in similar fashion naked force to the solution of their problems in Czechoslovakia, or to any other where else they thought it might be useful. Chamberlain was drawing a slightly different conclusion, although the loyal Halifax would help him reach it. Master Hitler's use of intimidation and force in securing the Anschluss led Chamberlain to contemplate the sort of rebuke one might have delivered to a schoolboy who had stolen, rather than asked for, an apple from an orchard. We gave you fair warning that if you used violence to Austria— you would shock public opinion to such an extent as to give rise to the most disagreeable repercussions. 
yet you obstinately went your way, and now you can see for yourself how right we were. But it is no use crying over spilt milk, and what we have to do now is to consider how we can restore the confidence you have shattered. By any measure, even the tone of this admission was pathetic. While aware at some conscious level that a bullying Germany understood only force, Chamberlain pursued such will-o'-the-wisps as Italian cooperation in restraining Hitler. This approach lost him Eden, who was also alienated by the Prime Minister's disdain for U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's guarded offers to involve the U.S. in European affairs. Chamberlain's policy took little cognizance of how events and ideological affinity were drawing the two dictators together, as the Duce's enthusiastic sanctioning of the Anschluss demonstrated, with the further prospect that smaller states would be drawn to the Axis like iron filings to a magnet every time the democracies advertised their own weakness. The alternative strategy, most forcefully represented by Churchill, was to form a grand anti-Nazi alliance, based on Britain and France, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Greece, Romania, and Turkey, with the Soviets presumed as members. That would enforce compliance with the League of Nations Covenant, a document to which Churchill attached great importance. His approach had practical drawbacks, notably the reluctance of neighboring states to allow the Red Army transit rights over their territory. But these were not the objections that most concerned Chamberlain and Halifax, who, having identified the likely course of events, proceeded to frustrate the wisest reaction to them. At a meeting of the Cabinet's Foreign Policy Committee on 18 March 1938, Chamberlain supported Halifax's view that such an alliance would fuel German fears of being encircled, dismissing the view that German hegemony over Central Europe would be the prelude to picking a quarrel with France and ourselves. Writing to his sister, Chamberlain resented having been badgered and pressed by opponents both in and outside his own party to give a clear, decided, bold, and unmistakable lead, show ordinary courage, and all the rest of the twaddle pressures designed to vex the man who has to take the responsibility for the consequences. While no one should underestimate the pressures Chamberlain was under, such burdens are born for a purpose. Chamberlain prided himself on his intellectual dexterity. He had thought of Churchill's scheme before the latter had even broached it with him. Emphasizing his own practical disposition, he asked if Churchill had studied any maps. Following the Anschluss, Czechoslovakia was beyond salvation, while Russia was a hundred miles away. He would not guarantee Czechoslovakia, or underwrite French guarantees to it either. It was better to go back to Hitler to establish exactly what he wanted from Czechoslovakia, a state Chamberlain thought had been cobbled together from scraps and patches. Chamberlain's focus on Czechoslovakia was warranted, as within two weeks of Hitler's glorious introitus into Austria— he was plotting the Czech state's piecemeal disintegration. A Czech-language German radio station, called Truth Prevails, the motto of the Czech state, beamed anti-Semitic and anti-Czech propaganda from what had been Austria towards Czech peasant supporters of the Agrarian Party, which shared many of the ethnic Germans' prejudices towards Prague. These three and a half million Sudeten Germans were the largest minority in a successor state that included Magyars, Poles, and Ruthenes, as well as the dominant Czechs and Slovaks. All four minorities exhibited the national egoism that the Czechs themselves had visited upon the Habsburg Empire before 1914. Germany was not the only neighbor casting a greedy eye over Czechoslovakia, which was why Hitler entertained the Hungarian regent Admiral Miklos Horthy on a five-day official visit to Germany in late August 1938, on the pretext of attending the launch of the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen at Kiel. What Hitler actually intended was to whet the Hungarians' appetite for part of Czechoslovakia. Although the Czechs had their British aficionados, they did not inspire the British imagination in the way the more romantic Poles did. Seeking to inspire sympathy for the threatened nation, even Churchill had to dredge up good King Wenceslas from his otherwise capacious historical repertory. Chamberlain was not alone in regarding Czechoslovakia as an artificial construct, although at least he got its name right, unlike some Tory MPs, who in their interventions referred to Czechoslovenia, a British political class that had wrestled with Irish nationalism for over a century, 
affected a lofty incomprehension toward issues of national identity and minority rights in Central Europe. The Sudeten Germans were discriminated against in petty ways by the Czechs, although they tended to attribute structural weaknesses in their regional economy exclusively and unfairly to alien rule from Prague. Their glass and textiles were hit more severely by the depression among the neighboring states than Czechoslovakia's industrial core. As a leader of a state with 80 million people, Hitler worked himself into a rage at the thought of three and a half million ethnic Germans being pushed around by seven million Czechs. Although it was the belief that Czechoslovakia was a geopolitical spear at Germany's back that really concerned him. The leader of the Sudeten German Party, Konrad Henlein, was Hitler's chosen local instrument, his viceroy, as the Fuhrer put it with imperial pretentiousness, although Henlein's objectives were initially restricted to regional autonomy rather than embracing pan Germanism. This stance gradually became irreconcilable with Czech nationalism and democracy. By the late 1930s, Henlein's orders came from the German foreign ministry via Ernst Eisenlohr, Berlin's minister in Prague, who might have done his job with less enthusiasm had he known that Hitler was prepared to have him assassinated to justify German intervention. Henlein's role vis-à-vis -vis the Czechs according to secret instructions, was always to demand so much that we can never be satisfied. In other words, egged on by Hitler, the Sudeten Germans always negotiated in bad faith with a Czech government that also strung talks along, in the hope of an external deliverance that never came. Ethnic German demands were given a plausibly humanitarian gloss in the resolutions of the Sudeten German party at a conference in Karlsbad, but their insatiable scope was apparent beneath that surface. As well as calling for regional autonomy, the conference sought complete freedom to profess adherence to the German element and German ideology. In a letter to his sister, Chamberlain bleakly gave every reason why it was impossible to defend the Czechs against German aggression. During discussions with the French in Downing Street in April 1938, Daladier talked up the military capabilities of the Czechs, while countering Halifax's claim that Stalin's purges of his officer corps had emasculated the Soviet armed forces. They still had a vast air force, he said. In response, Chamberlain warned of the perils of bluffing at cards. It might be true that the chances against war were a hundred to one, but so long as that one chance existed we must consider carefully what our attitude must be, and how we should be prepared to act in the event of war. After adding that the British public opinion would not countenance any move that might risk war, Chamberlain ended on a personal note. The Prime Minister had taken part in one war, and he had seen how impossible it was for anyone to come out of a war stronger or happier. It was therefore only in the case of unavoidable necessity that one should submit to it. Double negatives abounded in Britain's final evasive assurances to the French. While Germany would be warned of the dangers of violent action, both Britain and France were to exert pressure on the Czechs to accommodate reasonable Sudeten German demands. In May, unfounded rumors of German military activity near the Czech border resulted in Czech forces deploying to fortifications in the Sudetenland. Two Sudeten Germans fleeing Agar on a motorbike were shot dead by Czech frontier guards. The chance coincidence of a large group of British diplomatic personnel taking a train from Berlin to go on home leave triggered rumors of imminent war. France and the Soviet Union reasserted their commitments to the Czechs, with Britain leaving its options opaque. False claims in the foreign press that Hitler had given way to threats of war, rescinding movements that had never taken place, brought his long-harbored hatred of the Czechs to boiling point. He reversed an earlier decision not to use force against the Czechs, resolving, I am utterly determined that Czechoslovakia should disappear from the map. Moreover, he instructed his naval chiefs to augment their forces rapidly with ships and submarines that could be used to deter Britain, while ordering infrastructure supremo Fritz Tote to rush construction of a west wall designed to neutralize the Maginot Line. Hitler had resolved to attack the Czechs by 1 October, before the autumn mud sucked down his armor and winter nights impeded the scope of the Luftwaffe. The conflict between Germany and the Czechs over the Sudeten Germans was among the first to be covered by live international radio broadcasters, and was a feature of the David and Goliath duel between Radio Journal in Prague and the massive resources of Deutsche Rundfunk. 
Indeed, it has been plausibly argued that the Czechs were negligently tardy in setting up a German-language station to counteract the tidal waves of hysterical propaganda which German propaganda minister Josef Goebbels's men beamed towards the Sudeten Germans. Elegant talks by the now-exiled Thomas Mann, broadcast by a German-language station called Urania, managed by enthusiastic Jews in Prague, was not the best way of influencing the farmers and workers of the Sudetenland. The Czechs were also too indolent to charm the hordes of foreign correspondents who came to their capital. By contrast, the Sudeten German press chief was a former jewelry salesman who spoke English with a Cockney accent. When there was some obscure contretemps in a remote village, he would immediately be on the telephone spinning the story to credulous foreign journalists. The Germans deployed Sentiment's entire armory, including fake atrocities and streams of pathetic refugees, to blackmail the British and French into putting more pressure on the Czechs to give way. What a grotesque sight it was to see soldiers with bayonets carrying ladies' coats and cushions, typewriters and other office material, all tied to their rucksacks, as they marched through the streets like peddlers. No sooner would Radio Journal report that German university administrators in Prague had not been forced at gunpoint to sign declarations of loyalty to the state, than Goebbels's propagandists would have invented a fresh incident. As Edward R. Murrow, who covered these events for CBS, remarked, this was the age when nation hurled invective unto nation. In this atmosphere of mounting crisis, which he had single-handedly engineered, Hitler was the first to dispatch a personal envoy, his wartime company commander, Captain Fritz Biedemann, to London bearing promises of peaceful intent. The mission came to nothing, but the tactic proved catching. In August 1938, Chamberlain sent the retired industrialist Viscount Runciman on what was described as a fact-finding mission to Czechoslovakia, but of which an American journalist wrote, the hangman with his little bag came shuffling through the gloom. The hangman also brought his wife along. Within minutes of detraining, Lady Runciman was heard to fulminate against Bolshevik influence in Czechoslovakia, a bad omen for the success of the mission. That Runciman was immediately courted by the Sudeten German aristocracy did not bode well either, as there were few facts to find while fishing and shooting on their estates. Runciman's real purpose was to pressure the Czechs into promptly meeting Sudeten German demands. In that same month, Henderson informed Halifax of ever larger German military exercises, as well as other measures indicating that the country was going on a war footing. Meanwhile, British opponents of appeasement were receiving a stream of unofficial German visitors disillusioned with the Nazi regime. The latest representative of German opponents of Hitler was Ewald von Kleist Schmenzen a deeply religious conservative Pomeranian Junker, who, with his co-conspirators, including General Ludwig Beck, thought that Hitler was driving the army into a European war it could not win. One of Kleist Schmenzen's remarks flew in the face of British suppositions about moderates and extremists in the Nazi regime. There is only one real extremist, and that is Hitler himself. He is the great danger, and he is doing it on his own. The problem with Kleist, and for that matter an earlier visitor, Karl Gerdeler, was that their revisionist demands, especially towards Poland, seemed more extreme than Hitler's. These men seemed to epitomize the Prussian militarists whom the British were all too familiar with from the Great War. As Sir Alexander Cadogan, permanent undersecretary in the Foreign Office, noted of Gerdeler, he had already sent us a program which we couldn't subscribe to too much like Mein Kampf, and that rather put me off him. The German opposition were, naturally enough, contrastingly vague about concrete plans for an anti-Nazi coup. Chamberlain retreated to his official residence at Chequers to ponder conduct that lay outside his moral horizons. He quickly dismissed Kleist and his fellow resistors as being like the Jacobites at the court of France in King William's time although he simultaneously confessed to feelings of generalized unease about the turn events had taken. What he did next reflected his conviction that Britain was not militarily ready to fight Germany, a view confirmed by his defense advisers. Since he could not stop Hitler invading Czechoslovakia, there was little prospect of a successful German conservative coup, 
as Hitler would be basking in a military triumph, a view that took no account of how the German people actually regarded the prospect of war. Had the Czech crisis really been about minority rights, it should have been resolved when President Eduard Benisch called the Germans bluff by conceding the Karlsbad demands. Of course, this was not what Hitler wanted. Henlein was immediately instructed to break off further talks with Prague. He used as a pretext a minor riot in Morovska, Ostrava, during which a policeman had hit a Sudeten German politician. All eyes at this point were focused on the Nazi party rally in Nuremberg, as it happens the last ever held. Anderson was in attendance, helpfully warning the British government that Hitler was so mad he might do anything. Useful information if one were planning to do nothing by way of response. Goering set the mood on 10 September, calling the Czechs a vile race of dwarves without any culture. Nobody knows where they come from, and behind them, together with Moscow, there can be seen the everlasting face of the Jewish fiend. Hitler waited until the concluding session to deal with the Czechoslovak crisis. The situation in this state has become unbearable, as is well known. In a political context, three and a half million people there are robbed of their right to self-determination, in the name of the right to self-determination as construed by a certain Mr. Wilson. In an economic context, these people are being ruined methodically, and hence are subject to a slow but steady extermination. The misery of the Sudeten Germans defies description. The Czechs desire to destroy them. In a humanitarian context, they are being oppressed and humiliated in an unprecedented fashion. He professed to be livid about this, and about the intolerable impertinence of the May War Scare, adding, I am a National Socialist, and as such I am accustomed to strike back at any attacker. This speech indirectly triggered riots in the Sudetenland, which led the Czechs to impose martial law. The Sudeten Germans demanded a plebiscite to resolve their existential dilemma, a suggestion that had been aired in the Times, the House Organ of Appeasement, a week before in a leader that regarded the disintegration of an artificial Czechoslovakia with equanimity. Some weeks before, Chamberlain had decided upon what he melodramatically termed his Z-plan, although in the initial version he planned to dispatch Runciman to see Hitler, rather than going himself. Runciman wisely demurred. With the intensification of the crisis, Chamberlain sent a message to Hitler. I propose to come over at once to see you with a view to try to find a peaceful solution. I propose to come across by air, and am ready to start tomorrow. He presented this bizarre gambit to the cabinet as a fait accompli. 6. Gentlemen and Gangsters At Heston Aerodrome, Chamberlain told the BBC, the Führer's ready acceptance of my suggestion encourages me to hope my visit to him will not be without results. He landed in Germany on 15 September, after what had been his first major flight at nearly seventy years of age. That week he had been reading a biography of George Canning, written by one of his own academic admirers. This led him to conclude that one should issue no threats until they could be carried out, the view of his own military advisers. Against the urgings of Churchill to declare war if Hitler used force, Chamberlain had resolved that the most vital decision he might ever take should not be passed into the hands of the ruler of another country, and a lunatic at that. After a long train and car journey to the Berghof, the Führer's alpine retreat at Berchtesgaden, the vista from the lunatic's vast window, which had impressed ex-Prime Minister Lloyd George a few years before, proved disappointing because of low-lying mist. In the letters he used as a diary, Chamberlain made a series of predictable private observations about Hitler's nondescript physical appearance, incorrectly comparing him with the house painter he once was. Here he followed a snobbish trend established by Halifax, who had once nearly mistaken Hitler for a footman, letting the lazy optic of social class substitute for thinking hard about such a dangerous opponent. There was no ice-breaking small talk because Hitler was more the master of the tirade and the monologue. The two men talked alone except for Schmidt, the interpreter, which meant Chamberlain lacked an independent record in an austerely furnished salon with a couple of bottles of mineral water on the table that Hitler did not offer his elderly guest. 
Hitler knocked Chamberlain straight off course by claiming that, since three hundred Sudeten Germans had been killed by the Czechs, he could not agree to Chamberlain's wish to defer the local, Czechoslovakia, in favor of Anglo-German generalities. After the German dictator had expressed his indifference to the prospect of war, Chamberlain conceded Hitler's right to incorporate the Sudeten Germans into Germany. Even though Chamberlain thought he was merely conceding a theoretical principle, this was to stray far beyond the matter of autonomy or home rule, and it was done without any consultation with the British cabinet, the French, or the Czechs themselves. On the basis of these talks, Chamberlain reported to the cabinet that Hitler's aims were strictly limited. There was more, for apparently Hitler was no longer a lunatic, but someone whose opinion was to be valued. Accurately identifying the British Prime Minister's own flaws, Hitler had let it be known that he had liked Chamberlain, whose own account of the Fuhrer's flattery was revealing. I have had a conversation with a man, Hitler said, and one with whom I can do business, and he liked the rapidity with which I had grasped the essentials. In short, I had established a certain confidence, which was my aim, and in spite of the hardness and ruthlessness I thought I saw on his face, I got the impression that here was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. So one might think, if one had not bothered to ascertain that the three hundred dead ethnic Germans Hitler had made theater from were entirely fictitious. Moreover, a day after meeting Chamberlain, Hitler authorized the formation of a Sudeten German Freikorps, a paramilitary force consisting of men who had fled conscription into the Czech armed forces. With headquarters at Bayreuth and officers drawn from the SA, the Freikorps numbered 34,500 men in a fortnight. The funding came from the German military budget. Although they were notionally intended to protect Germans against what even Goebbels privately conceded was non-existent Czech provocation, their real function was to destabilize Czechoslovakia with incidents on both sides of the border. Nothing much being done by Prague. Despite this, we'll make a really big meal out of Czech terror. The temperature must be raised to boiling point, wrote Goebbels in his private diary on 18 September. That meant burning down a Czech customs post, as well as arson attacks on German-owned sawmills and spas. After coming under SS control on 30 September, the Freikorps' remit was extended to abducting exiled German communists and Czech officials— who were illegally smuggled over the German border. At the airport, Chamberlain bade his German hosts a fond au revoir. On the radio recording of this event, Ribbentrop can be heard uttering an ironic laugh. From across the Atlantic, Roosevelt had a much clearer understanding of what was at stake when he warned Chamberlain, If a chief of police makes a deal with the leading gangsters, and the deal results in no more holdups, the chief of police will be called a great man. But if the gangsters do not live up to their word, the chief of police will go to jail. Some people are, I think, taking very long chances. A patrician himself, Roosevelt had at least seen a few gangster movies in his day. A protracted series of Anglo-French follow-up conversations took place at Downing Street on 18 September 1938. For as Chamberlain was inclined to believe that Hitler's aims were limited, Daladier had his honest doubts. Despite being from a far more deeply provincial background than Chamberlain, the Bull of Vaucluse had grasped the essence of the Nazi leader. He was convinced in his heart that Germany was aiming at something far greater. It was clear from Mein Kampf that Herr Hitler did not regard himself in the light of a second emperor, William II but that he was aiming at dominating Europe as Napoleon had done. He was a popular chief with something of the religious authority of Mohammed. Although that was a mixed-up way of putting things, it was a great deal more accurate than Chamberlain's petty snobberies about decorators and his fastidious bureaucrat's concern with playing by the rules. The French agreed with the cession of the Sudetenland, but they managed to get the British to guarantee a rump Czechoslovakia. On 21 September... The British and French governments presented their terms to the Czechs, with the explicit warning that France would not help them if the terms were refused, because in that eventuality the British declined to support them. Although the Czech Prime Minister had asked for an ultimatum to sell these capitulations domestically, 
the Czechs were taken aback by the brutality with which Anglo-French diplomats roused them from their beds in the early hours to deliver the grim tidings. In Prague, British and French embassy officials pressured Benish into the early hours to secure his assent. Half a million Czechs listened to the news as it was broadcast from loudspeakers in the trees around Prague's Wenceslas Square. Chamberlain returned to Godesberg to bring Hitler the glad tidings and to wrap up a much broader settlement. Hitler now dealt him a body blow by refusing to claim his winnings in the prescribed manner. He wanted the problem resolved one way or another by 1 October. To dramatize his timetable, Hitler depicted Czechoslovakia as a vast prison from which the German, Hungarian, and Polish inmates were straining to escape. Large numbers were bandied around that would not have survived careful audit. Over a hundred thousand Sudeten Germans allegedly had fled to Germany since the present crisis began, leaving depopulated villages where abandoned children wandered about. The frontier had become a lawless zone where there were nightly shooting incidents. In the course of the meeting, Hitler was handed timely intelligence of a further twelve German hostages having been shot in Eger. These were outright lies. Hitler agreed to give Chamberlain an outline of what he wanted. The Czechs had to get out of the Sudetenland by 28 September, or he would go to war, commencing mobilization at 2 p.m. Hitler's willingness to countenance war perplexed Chamberlain, who was also furious that his patient work in preparing a peaceful solution had been rejected by an interlocutor who had reverted to being a lunatic. He rallied slightly on receiving news of Czech mobilization and his own cabinet's insistence that enough was enough a view relayed on unscrambled telephones, which resulted in Hitler staying his hand. In further discussions, Chamberlain forced cosmetic changes in what they agreed to describe as a memorandum rather than Hitler's original proposals. Hitler scribbled in a few alterations with a pencil to give Chamberlain the impression he had achieved something. Chamberlain agreed to present the memorandum to the Czechs in his capacity as intermediary between Germany and Czechoslovakia. After bidding Hitler Auf Wiedersehen, Chamberlain flew back to Heston. A waiting BBC reporter was perplexed to find the plane's door jammed shut, so that he could not immediately interview the Prime Minister. When he emerged, Chamberlain said, I will only say this. I trust that all concerned will continue their efforts to solve the Czechoslovak problem peacefully, because on that turns the peace of Europe in our time. He hastened to sell the German leader's proposals to his own cabinet, with Runciman on hand to help resolve the technical difficulties of deciding how population densities would determine the session of a given area. An old man's vanity was sometimes evident. In his presentation to the cabinet on the evening of 24 September, Chamberlain stressed the rapport he had established with Hitler, who he claimed had some respect for him, too. He thought he had now established an influence over Herr Hitler, and that the latter trusted him and was willing to work with him. He was inclined to take Hitler at his word when he claimed to be solely interested in racial unity rather than ruling racially undesirable Czechs and Slovaks. Also evident was a certain messianic intent, the lure of one comprehensive settlement of all Europe's woes. The Sudeten issue was subtly marginalized in the interests of a broader Anglo-German understanding, the necessary precondition for a general settlement in Europe. At a second session of the cabinet on the morning of 25 September, first Hoare and then Halifax, Chamberlain's most reliable colleagues, balked at the British coercing the Czechs to accept the Gotisberg deal. Halifax had been chided by Cadogan the previous night, and had lain awake tormented by his high Anglican conscience. He thought that Hitler has given us nothing, and that he was dictating terms, just as though he had won a war but without having had a fight. Testy notes were passed along the cabinet table. Your complete change of view since I saw you last night is a horrible blow to me, scribbled the Prime Minister, indicating that he might resign if the French went to war. I feel a brute, but I lay awake most of the night tormenting myself and did not feel I could reach any other conclusion at this moment on the point of coercing Czechoslovakia, came the reply. Night conclusions are seldom taken in the right perspective, flashed back N.C. Nor were the French, who were in Downing Street on the night of 25 September, as ready to renege on their commitments to the Czechs as Chamberlain presumed they were when the discussions were extended to include them. 
The French Prime Minister demonstrated a moral conscience, firmity of purpose, and realism about where Hitler was heading that was evidently absent from his allied hosts. Daladier questioned whether the prospect of German bombing was as terrible as everyone imagined, pointing out that despite massive nationalist air superiority, Franco was no nearer winning the civil war. The French Prime Minister was ashamed of what he and Chamberlain had forced the Czechs to accept already, referring to himself as a barbarian. He had done this because of what he had witnessed as a soldier in the Great War. Showing more guts than any of his British interlocutors, Daladier continued, It was a different thing to give Herr Hitler the possibility of saying to his people that, without firing a shot, Great Britain and France had handed over to him three and a half million men. This would not suffice for him. Monsieur Daladier asked at what point we would be prepared to stop and how far we would go. The Czechs were, however, human beings. They had their country and had fought at our side. We must ask what they thought of all this. Perhaps formulae of conciliation might be found, although he feared that all conciliation was only preparing the way for the destruction of Western civilization and liberty in the world. There was one concession, however, he would never make, and that was that marked on the map, which had for its object the destruction of a country and Herr Hitler's domination of the world and all of that we valued most. France would never accept that, come what might. The session included the disagreeable spectacle of Sir John Simon, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, followed by Chamberlain, seeking to undermine Daladier's faith in his own country's defense capabilities. Simon imagined he was back in court, quizzing a shifty witness rather than speaking to the French Prime Minister. Chamberlain warned of the nightmare of bombs raining down on Paris. It would be poor consolation if, in fulfillment of all her obligations, France attempted to come to the assistance of her friend, but found herself unable to keep up resistance and collapsed. He also doubted whether Russian military aid to the Czechs would amount to much. In a final abdication of responsibility, Chamberlain remarked that we were not the people to whom the proposals, Hitler's, had been addressed, and we could not therefore accept or reject them. Our role was confined to transmitting them to the Czechoslovak government, as we had done. As a result of pressure from within his cabinet and from his French ally, Chamberlain resolved to dispatch Sir Horace Wilson to Berlin with an offer of an international commission and a threat that if France supported Czechoslovakia against a German attack, Britain would go to war. After Hitler rose and launched a tirade at Wilson's first attempt to deliver this message, the envoy had to return a second time to hear explosions like, Germany was being treated like niggers. One should not dare treat even the Turks like that. The Führer added, On 1 October I shall have Czechoslovakia where I want her. If France and England decided to strike, let them strike. He did not care a farthing. As Hitler escorted him out, using epithets about Mr. Chamberlain and Sir Horace that could not be used in a drawing room, Wilson somewhat weakened the main point by whispering to Hitler, I will still try to make those Czechos sensible. Hitler ordered the preliminaries to full mobilization once the civil servant had left. War was becoming a grim hourly prospect. In France, white-colored posters went up calling a million reservists to the colors. Gas masks were issued to the British population, and the fleet mobilized. In his deservedly famous Autumn Journal, the northern Irish poet Louis McNeese described the scenes outside his London apartment. Hitler yells on the wireless, the night is damp and still, and I hear dull blows on wood outside my window. They are cutting down the trees on Primrose Hill. They want the crest of this hill for anti-aircraft. The guns will take the view, and searchlights probe the heavens for bacilli, with narrow wands of blue. Cellars were converted into bomb shelters, and ordinary people pondered various DIY solutions to the prospect of massive bombing. Anti-aircraft guns, barrage balloons, and searchlights appeared around London landmarks, while local authorities excavated trenches in public parks. Staff at Lambeth's Imperial War Museum, recently ensconced in a former lunatic asylum, drilled with captured Great War German helmets. Feelings in Germany were little different. When Hitler ordered a motorized division to parade through Berlin for three hours, bystanders scowled or scuttled into doorways. 
On the evening of 27 September, Chamberlain delivered a lachrymose speech on the BBC about the nightmare of preparations for war because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. He made much of Hitler's feelings of indignation, offering to meet him a third time, if I thought it would do any good. Hitler left the door slightly ajar to a last round of talks, too, when he wrote to Chamberlain that night. The 28th September saw a stream of foreign diplomats bustling into the Reich Chancellery, which resembled a military camp. The Wehrmacht commanders, due to invade Czechoslovakia, were supposed to be coming to lunch. War was very close that day, so much so that Goering, who knew about war, rebuked the belligerent civilian Ribbentrop for constantly pushing for one, sarcastically offering to take the foreign minister up in the first combat plane. In the event, Chamberlain dispatched his ambassador, Lord Perth, to see Mussolini, who at the eleventh hour persuaded Hitler to delay mobilization for twenty-four hours, so that there might be a final conference. This was a request that Hitler could not refuse, especially as the Czechs were excluded, and the citizens of the Reich capital seemed so unenthusiastic for war. Late that afternoon, Hitler invited Chamberlain, Daladier, and Mussolini to Munich. Uncharacteristically high emotions were on display in the House of Commons when Chamberlain dramatically announced this development, a fortuitous solution to the deflationary ending to his speech that he had planned to deliver. In the public gallery, Queen Mary wept openly. Tears filled Baldwin's eyes. But the politician Jan Masaryk and the poet Stefan Zweig were among those who remained stony-faced as they scented betrayal. Churchill commented bitterly, And what about Czechoslovakia? Does no one think of asking their opinion? Churchill stayed seated as the House rose to applaud, although he congratulated Chamberlain afterwards. Enormous gusts of public goodwill accompanied Europe's statesmen on their respective odysseys. Reveling in the attention, Mussolini set off by deluxe train. Daladier and Chamberlain took off from Heston and La Bourget amid much backslapping from their many admirers. For experienced statesmen, Chamberlain and Daladier made remarkable errors. They clearly let emotion speed them on their way, instead of seeking to delay their trip, to allow calm discussion of alternative possibilities based on a thorough assessment of whether Hitler was in a position to fight a major war at that time. Charismatic diplomacy replaced cold-blooded analysis. They left their respective foreign ministers at home, while Hitler and Mussolini had Ribbentrop and Ciano in attendance. Mussolini spent the night on a train discoursing to Ciano about the decadence of a people who had cemeteries and hospitals for cats and dogs, before boarding Hitler's train at Kufstein to go over their joint agenda with the aid of models and maps. In contrast, the British and French leaders walked into the conference without having conferred. They did not insist on appointing a chairman, a role Mussolini assumed but did not perform, or agreeing an order of business. They had no briefing books to anchor the discussions in cold fact. They consented to seating arrangements that put Hitler and Mussolini together while separating the French and British. The conference itself was a chaotic shambles lasting thirteen hours, which suited only the adrenalized Hitler. At Chamberlain's insistence, the Czechs were eventually allowed to station two representatives in an adjoining room. Hitler already had the measure of Chamberlain, so he concentrated his attention on the French leader, professing a long-held desire to see Paris that had been frustrated by the Great War, a theme the French premier warned to, as he had risen from private to captain in that conflict. Chamberlain's punctilious desire to resolve questions of financial compensation for Czech businessmen or farmers who would forfeit assets in the Sudetenland finally got on Hitler's nerves. The main meeting broke into a series of conversational groups as experts were brought in to resolve technical issues. Mussolini affected a lordly lack of interest in the parliamentary atmosphere of the conference, except whenever he intervened to resolve a difficulty with a flash of genius. The proposals, drafted by Hitler but presented by Mussolini, were agreed quickly enough, with enough tactical retreats from the Gottesberg Memorandum to secure assent to a modified form of that deal. The Germans agreed to delay their occupation of the majority German areas of the Sudetenland from 1 to 10 October, while plebiscites would resolve the fate of more ethnically mixed areas. These changes took care of the more sensitive consciences in Whitehall. 
This fix-up was presented to the waiting Czechs, who were not given the opportunity to demur, as Europe's general peace was at stake. Chamberlain's indifference to the Czechs was on display when he failed to stifle a yawn during their only encounter. With the Czech difficulty resolved with surprising alacrity, Chamberlain sought out Hitler to proffer a document about a wider settlement, ranging from aerial bombing to the war in Spain. He warmly appreciated Hitler's words, he thanked Herr Hitler for these assurances, he would not keep Herr Hitler any longer, are some of the casual phrases that reveal where the whip-hand lay. After Hitler expressed an exasperated, Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, hardly bothering to glance at the document, they signed the ironic-sounding communique. Chamberlain had not informed the French about this separate venture. 7. Les Cons As they left Munich, the two Western leaders were impressed by the immense throng of ordinary Germans manifestly relieved at the successful talks. More crowds awaited them at home. At Heston, where Richard Dimbleby was on hand to cover the event for the newsreels, Chamberlain flourished the piece of paper he and Hitler had signed. Echoing Disraeli's words upon returning from the 1878 Congress of Berlin, he claimed to have achieved peace with honor, a phrase he instantly regretted using, for honor was something he discovered a bit later, after he had ditched the quest for peace. His face broke into toothy smiles as crowds cheered, Good old Neville, outside Buckingham Palace and along Downing Street, where he spoke to the multitudes from a window with the BBC in fawning attendance. Duff Cooper thought the crowd was more like a mob. Daladier was similarly feted by enthusiastic crowds when he returned to Paris. He is supposed to have muttered, Les cons, the polite translation of which is, the fools, if they only knew what they were cheering. Another skeptic was Pope Pius XI. The French ambassador to the Vatican was taken aback when the pontiff declared, A very fine thing, this peace, botched together at the cost of a weak country that was not even consulted. Oblivious, Chamberlain took an all-too-apparent delight in gifts that flowed into the man whose name had become a synonym of peace. Defenders of Chamberlain argue that at Munich he won a year's grace, during which Britain strengthened its fighter and radar defenses. Critics claim that, had he stood firm, Hitler's domestic conservative opponents might have essayed a coup with better chances of success than the one they undertook in 1944, or, more tellingly, that Germany was in a far weaker position in 1938 than in 1939. These are imponderables. What is unambiguous is that the policy of appeasement failed in its wider ambition of a general resolution of European conflicts proof being that Hitler elected to press ahead with aggression against Poland, now confident that, even if the men of Munich stirred, he could defeat them. And the Czechs, who had lost about twenty percent of their territory? When the Labour Party's Hugh Dalton rang Masaryk at the height of the crisis to inquire whether Britain and France were being more resolute on the Czechs' behalf, Masaryk exclaimed, Firm? About as firm as the erection of an old man of seventy. In Prague, people milled around dazed, as if their spirits had been crushed. The justice minister broke down and sobbed several times as he tried to talk to the Czechs on the radio about what he referred to as a diktat from his country's allies. The newly appointed propaganda minister, Hugo Vareka, the grandfather of future Czech president Václav Havel, said that Poland and Hungary had taken Hitler's side, while Romania and Yugoslavia had abandoned their little entente ally. The Russian card was not one to play. Both Britain and France would have considered such a war to be a battle between Bolshevism and Europe. Probably all Europe would have turned against Russia, and thus against us, too. Within a matter of days, the Poles, aggressors rather than victims in this context, had realized their own claims on Czechoslovakia. After Benish's resignation on 5 October, Slovak and Ruthenian separatists proclaimed their own right to self-determination. In November, at Vienna, the Hungarians were granted nearly 4,000 square miles of territory, ironically stripped from the newly autonomous Slovak and Ruthenian federal states. An independent Czechoslovakia survived into the new year under a government that at Christmas decided to dissolve all political parties while striking at the Slovak separatists. It also exerted a tighter grip on the state broadcaster, 
which entered into an agreement with the German propaganda ministry to eschew politics. In February, the Czechs signed a deal exchanging radio programs, in whose fine print the Czechs averred, We are totally loyal and are not employing any non-Aryans. For their government, to appease the Germans, had decided to reduce the number of Jews in public employ. In the interim, the Nazis had given massive public evidence of their barbarity. Just as the Anschluss had resulted in a huge surge of anti-Semitic violence in Vienna, so the incorporation of the Sudetenland saw a number of Jews either murdered or so despairing that they leaped from roofs or turned on the gas taps. Hitler personally gave the Sudeten German Freikorps a three-day period of grace to hunt down Jews and political opponents. In October, he wanted to know whether it would be possible to deport the 27,000 Czech Jews living in Vienna. The policy of forcing German Jews to emigrate by removing their rights had run into the manifest unwillingness of foreign governments to take any more of them. In Berlin, the chief of police, Graf Heldorf, encouraged his subordinates to turn a blind eye towards those who systematically defaced synagogues and Jewish-owned businesses, while his policemen simultaneously raided cafes and other places where Jewish people still managed to associate. On 7 November 1938, the fatal wounding in Paris of the German legation official Ernst vom Rath by a 17-year-old Polish Jew called Herschel Grinchpan unfortunately coincided with the high point of the Nazis' ritual calendar in Munich where they commemorated their own martyrs from the 1923 Munich Beer Hall Putsch attempt. That evening, party members and SA men devastated Jewish businesses and a synagogue in Kassel, and other towns in Kurhessen and Magdeburg-Anhalt. Arson and violence spread to Hessen as a whole the following night. The reason why this was extended into a nationwide pogrom, to live in infamy as Kristallnacht, was that Hitler ordered it after he was called, probably by his personal emergency physician, Karl Brandt, whom he had sent to Paris, and told that Rott had died of his wounds in hospital before Brandt could save him. That evening, Hitler attended his annual reunion with the old fighters, veterans of the days of barroom brawls. In the course of the evening, he instructed Goebbels to allow the demonstrations to run their course. Goebbels gave a speech later that evening, which amounted to further incitement. Among those who sprang into action were the nearly forty members of Julius Schaub's Adolf Hitler shock troop, that is, men who had acted as Hitler's bodyguards in 1923, and who had an especially esteemed role in the Munich ceremonies. They sat very close to the dictator at a comradely meal that evening, before venturing out wearing their caps with the distinctive death's head symbol which the SS had adopted. At around midnight, they set fire to the Ohel Jakob and Reichenbachstrasse synagogues in Munich. Meanwhile, Goebbels telephoned his head of propaganda in the Gau of Berlin and ordered him to burn down the imposing synagogue on the Fasenenstrasse. Werner Wechter replied, an honorable task. As if ninety-one people murdered and one hundred one synagogues destroyed were not enough, in the days following the pogrom, the Nazi regime introduced a series of measures which made the Jews collectively responsible for Roth's death, while excluding them from both economic activity and public places. Without much exaggeration, on 5 January 1939, Hitler told the Czech foreign minister, The Jews are being destroyed, while inquiring what steps the Czechs were taking to deal with the Jews themselves. Throughout the winter months, Chamberlain was desperate for signs from either Mussolini or Hitler, that the Munich Agreement would develop into a wider peace settlement. In January 1939, Old Chamberlain, as Ciano called him, visited Rome for a round of desultory talks with the Italians. After a session in which effective contact had not been made, the Duce remarked to Ciano, These men are not made of the same stuff as the Francis Drakes and the other magnificent adventurers who created the Empire. These, after all, are the tired sons of a long line of rich men, and they will lose their empire. There was some truth in that, although it underestimated the eighteen-hour days the sons of rich men were putting in at the foreign office and elsewhere in Whitehall. Mussolini defended Germany strongly. Chano telephoned Ribbentrop to report that the visit had been a huge farce. Chamberlain had tears in his eyes when British expatriates sang for He's a Jolly Good Fellow as his train pulled out of Rome's Terme station. 
the upper lip, so stiff when disposing of Czechoslovakia, easily succumbed to pathetic sentiment. The British convinced themselves that a German balance of payments crisis might force Hitler to relax his breakneck rearmament program in order to put more food on German tables. But the same crisis could, of course, fuel his desire to control Czechoslovakia's industry and gold reserves. In March, the Slovak leader Monsignor Josef Tiso fled to Berlin, where Hitler invited him to demand German intervention, warning him that since Germany had no interest in this Carpathian agricultural backwater, he might otherwise let the Hungarians gobble it up entirely. He was not finished with the Czechs themselves, despite their manifest willingness to accommodate him in a matter close to his heart. In January, they took steps to expel 96,000 German victims of political or racial persecution who had sought shelter in Czechoslovakia. In February, they agreed to dismiss all Jews from German schools, preparatory to dismissing Jews from the civil service and reducing their presence in law and medicine. On 15 March, President Emil Hascha, Benesch's successor, dashed to Berlin to plead his country's case. Hitler kept him waiting until after midnight before receiving him. According to Goebbels, this was a tactic the Allies had used against the Germans at Versailles. Hitler resorted to the extraordinary argument that the new regime had not succeeded in making the old one disappear psychologically. Why did Czechoslovakia need a large army? Since the Czechoslovak state no longer had a role in foreign affairs, such an army had no justification. As the night wore on and Goering threatened to bomb Prague, the elderly Hasha's health failed. He had to be given emergency medical injections, lest anyone think his heart attack was a further example of murder. This was the reality of politics in Central Europe that Chamberlain, Halifax, and the rest of them could never grasp. An exultant Hitler announced that, The machine is on the move. Nothing can stop it now and told Hasha to call Prague and order the Czechs not to resist. At nearly four o'clock in the morning, Hasha signed away Czech independence on a paper Hitler had prepared for him. The order for German troops to move had been given an hour earlier. Advanced troops arrived in Prague by 9.15 a.m. A Czech radio reporter, Franta Kukuric, had to report the enormous German victory parade in Wenceslas Square. A Wehrmacht officer stood beside him as he said, from somewhere far away, a huge black crow has flown into Prague. I have seen it spread its wings and sweep down above the square over the searchlights and loudspeakers being paraded here by the German army. It must be surprised at the noise and all that is going on beneath it. Kukuric was arrested and died in 1942 in Auschwitz. That same night, Hitler slept in Benesch's former bed in Prague's Hradzian Castle, as Hradzani became overnight. In an annex to the Munich Agreement, Britain and France had guaranteed the new boundaries of the Czechoslovak state against unprovoked aggression. At a cabinet meeting on 15 March 1939, Chamberlain and Halifax claimed that this German invasion was merely symbolic, and that the Anglo-French guarantee of Czechoslovakia was only of an interim nature, and in any event was not a guarantee against the exercise of moral pressure an odd way of describing German subversion of its neighbor. Rather than admitting the failure of his policy, the British Prime Minister resolved to press on with it, while making half-hearted concessions to the strategies advocated by his critics. That March, even he adopted a different tone, partly because public opinion was so hostile about the rape of Prague, partly because representatives of Romania arrived in London seeking help in resisting Hitler's importunate demands for privileged access to grain and oil, and finally because of the noises Hitler began making about ethnic Germans in Poland. Having doggedly sought to diminish the number of potential enemies, Chamberlain now, belatedly and fitfully, sought to increase Britain's potential allies, although the priority given to the first endeavor meant a less than wholehearted commitment to the second. For example, the Treasury systematically blocked Polish and Romanian attempts to secure loans to buy arms giving them £8 million in export credit guarantees, rather than the £24 million they had requested. Nor were effective steps taken to combat steady German economic penetration of the Balkans, whose agrarian produce was not vital to Britain in any case. The net effect of these restrictions was to drive those countries into dependence upon Germany. 
Chamberlain proposed a joint declaration by Britain, France, the USSR, and Poland that they would consult in the event of further aggression by the dictators. Neither the Poles nor the Soviets were enthusiastic that the other had been invited to the party. Since helping themselves to the coal-rich Teschen district and the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia, Poland's ruling military junta could not decide whether they were Germany's partner or its next victim. About all the Poles and Romanians could agree on was their joint desire to expel the Jews. Mounting German clamor about and from within the free city enclave of Danzig, and Hitler's personal voyage to Memel, retrieving this German-dominated area from Lithuania, resolved Polish doubts. Instead of the four-power declaration, the Poles asked for a secret understanding with Britain. On 31 March, Chamberlain announced a British guarantee of Poland's independence. Although, like the French, the British aim was to oppose German hegemony rather than to save Poland, a lost cause they were powerless to effect. Alexander Cadogan compared it with putting up a signpost, not to halt Hitler's swift succession of surprises, but as a means of sparing Chamberlain the agonizing doubts and indecisions inherent in his own policy. No sooner had this agreement been announced than the Times tried to qualify it to accommodate further appeasement. It did not guarantee every inch of Poland, which might be the subject of future negotiations, the article groveled. Nor was it directed against Germany. It was more of an appeal to their better nature. Halifax thought this article just right. Polish objections ensured that Russia was not encouraged to join the guarantee. Consequently, in August 1939, Hitler would complete the encirclement and isolation of Poland by making a deal with Russia. Chamberlain's belief that Mussolini might soften the impact of this guarantee upon Hitler came to naught in April, when the Italian dictator invaded Albania, cynically offering the British Corfu as a consolation prize. Chamberlain was forced to issue further guarantees to Greece and Romania, in the first case to prevent the Prime Minister General Ioannis Metaxas joining the Axis camp, and in the second in an effort to deny Germany oil. Characteristically, he persisted in the belief that Mussolini might restrain Hitler, even though it was now Mussolini who was on the march. Defying calls for an alliance with Russia from the Labour opposition and from Churchill, Chamberlain put forth every objection, enumerating the countries this would annoy not just Germany or Poland and Romania, but also Spain and Portugal, even though his own cabinet had come round to the view that such an alliance was necessary. Soviet counterproposals in April for a triple alliance with Britain and France were treated with dilatory skepticism in London, despite dim awareness that the Russians might seek an alternative alliance with Germany. Having failed to prize apart the dictators or to curb their predations, Chamberlain was instrumental in ensuring that the main alternative policy was never pursued with any vigor. As Anglo-French military talks with Marshal Clement Voroshilov petered out, Hitler saw his chance, as did Stalin, who had been watching developments with keen interest. Hitler had no moral scruples, so an alliance with Stalin was merely an ideological obstacle. But the nature of the Soviet Union raised a large question mark over democratic politicians who would ally with it. Having convinced himself of the righteousness of his war on behalf of the ethnic Germans, Hitler decided that the little worms he had met at Munich would not go to war over something so vacuously intangible as their national honor. In fact, that is what the British and French did do, as exhaustion and impatience narrowed down their psychological options to this one conviction. On 25 August, war was on, and then suddenly called off. On 1 September, Hitler chanced a local war, which on the 3rd, Chamberlain and Daladier converted into a European war. What now? a vexed Hitler asked Ribbentrop, as they stared out of the right chancellery windows. Chapter 3 Brotherly Enemies 1. Family Resemblances the advent of the Nazi regime inevitably raised the question of how the Soviet Union should respond to it, especially as Hitler had vowed to secure the Germans' future living space at Russia's expense. If the Western powers offered Hitler membership of the club, in exchange for scaling down his demands to what they regarded as reasonable, how did Stalin respond to the Nazi challenge? Before we can answer that, it may be helpful to examine what these two regimes had in common. 
for some fundamental identities conditioned how in turn Western leaders regarded the offer of an alliance with Russia. On 25 January 1937, Winston Churchill addressed the annual dinner of the Chamber of Commerce in Leeds. In a talk devoted to the need for robust rearmament against Germany, he touched on what communism and national socialism had in common. There are those non-God religions, Nazism and Communism. We are urged from the continent and from different quarters that we must choose which side we are on. I repudiate both, and will have nothing to do with either. As a matter of fact, they are like two peas. Tweedledum and Tweedledee were violently contrasted compared with them. You leave out God, and you substitute the devil. You leave out love, and you substitute hate. I have made a resolve. I am getting on now in life. I have made a resolve that I will never go to the Arctic or the Antarctic regions in geography or in politics. Give me the temperate zone. Give me London, Paris, or New York. Let us keep to our faith and let us go somewhere and stay there where your breath is not frozen on your lips by the secret police. Let us not wander away from the broad fields of freedom into those gaunt, grim, dismal, gloomy regions. Within three years, Churchill had revised this view, expressing a pragmatic willingness to sup with the devil in hell to defeat Nazism, a figure of speech that retained his abhorrence for the Soviet system. He had identified some of the key elements which Nazism and Communism had in common, an antipathy towards transcendental religion, the vicious role of the secret police, and ideologies that organized mass hatreds, whether of capitalism, liberal democracy, or entire races and social classes. This moral discourse, which, out of national necessity, Churchill had to put into suspended animation after June 1941, gives us a valuable starting point in considering what communism and Nazism shared, and where they differed, although a few thoughts need to be aired about comparison itself. Comparison should not be confused with equivalence or identity, nor be used to condemn or exculpate one historic horror with the aid of the other, especially by insinuating some otherwise tenuous causality. Although the Soviet gulags antedated Nazi concentration camps, Kolyma and Vorkuta did not cause or inspire Dachau, let alone Auschwitz, although the SS were aware of the Arctic gulag and toyed with re-employing it for their own purposes. It is important to emphasize that the history of German anti-Semitism anteceded anti-Bolshevism, for Jews were also blamed for liberalism, democracy, and various economic crises long before Bolshevism came to power. Time has played a role in distorting posterity's perspectives. Nazi crimes were overwhelmingly committed in 1941 through 5, and were then examined and judged at Nuremberg by the victors in the Second World War, whereas the crimes of the Bolsheviks came in waves over a twenty-five-year period of violence, and were only fully exposed when communism itself collapsed in 1991. Most Nazi crimes involved non-German nationals, whereas the majority of victims of communism were citizens of the multi-ethnic and polyglot Soviet Union. Since many of them were killed because of their nationality, we should dispense with the notion that one regime killed races while the other murdered social classes. On the other hand, it is important to note that whereas Nazism expressed an extreme form of ethnic egoism, in which Germans would always be on top, the polyglot Soviet Union was effectively posited on the artificial suppression of dominant nationality, in fact obliging ethnic Russians, with greater or lesser sincerity, to celebrate the colorful folkways of Tajiks and Uzbeks. Any decent person should respect the sensitivities of victims, although that is a relatively recent addition to the criteria relevant to writing history. Victims of mass political or religious violence do not appreciate being told that others suffer, any more than the parents of a murdered child derive comfort from being informed that many other children have been killed too. This is particularly so when the victims belong to a national or religious group rather than a social class which inherently lacks such intense common feeling, and is not a recognized category in international law. The suffering of Chinese, Poles, or Jews is more focused and enduring than that of Russian aristocrats, bourgeois, or kulaks, 
a derogatory term for farmers who owned a few cows. But the ineffable uniqueness of suffering can also mutate into its sacralization, a finite quantum that it is forbidden to subtract from, or to diminish through revised totals or lateral comparisons. This is so when the sacral memory of suffering, or in the case of Germany, guilt about having perpetrated such horrors, becomes adjunct to, or a substitute for, transcendental religious identity, or part of a state's legitimacy, as evident in Poland or Ukraine as it is in Israel. Not all victims are equal, either. Europeans and North Americans, living in predominantly urban societies, find it difficult to empathize with victims of state violence if they were anonymous millions of peasants from cultures they do not comprehend, rather than the sort of people who share their own culture and could be living next door. Our eyes have become our primary sense, too. The relative dearth of visual evidence of Soviet atrocities, in contrast to the superabundance of film and photographic material from Nazi Germany, has also conditioned how the two regimes are perceived. Although there is no footage and almost no photographs from the major Nazi extermination camps, most of us have images of the entrance to Auschwitz printed on our minds in a way that is not true of Kolyma or other Soviet labor camps, which have disappeared rather than being preserved for posterity. While the motives of Soviet mass murderers have not attracted sophisticated speculative scrutiny, we know much about civilized Nazi killers and their individuated civilized victims, with whom they shared German high culture. That some loved Schubert is a cliché that masks sadistic violence by men and women who preferred yodel music played on accordions to Beethoven, as well as being an excuse for the arabesques of literary critics, which often strategically distract from what the killers shared with Western society as a whole. One might almost imagine that the universe of Nazi cruelty revolves around as precious a figure as the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Hitler is our monster, in a way that Stalin or Mao are for others. Nazi crimes against the Jews drew on an ancient mulch of Christian Judeophobia that gives the Nazi crimes psychological traction among Western audiences because its modern mutation of anti-Semitism is part of their more or less conscious heritage. The evocation of Nazi crimes rubs a collective scar in Western societies. No such shared cultural heritage exists for our perception of what was done to Chechens, Chinese, Kazakhs, or Koreans, and our common humanity seems too weak to stimulate sustained attention beyond the isn't-it-dreadful reaction to starving Africans shown on television. Perhaps we feel we can afford to ignore the fate of communism's victims, largely because of a guiltless certainty that nothing about us was responsible for it. The comparison of communism and Nazism also has political and cultural aspects, which shape historical perceptions of the two regimes. Critics of the concept of totalitarianism invariably contrast the ideals of communism with the grim practices of National Socialism to exculpate the former. This is sleight of hand, akin to contrasting the Sermon on the Mount with the depredations of the Emperor Nero in order to calumnify Roman paganism while exalting Christianity. Communism shared the legacy of the Enlightenment and Socialism with entire swaths of liberal and socialist opinion in the Western democracies. The ideals of universal equality and fraternity appealed to larger constituencies than the elitist doctrines of fascist groups— who were the demotic legatees of the anti-Jacobin counter-revolution, even if fascists and Nazis considered themselves revolutionaries too. Moreover, for four years the Soviet Union was a major ally of the democratic opponents of Hitler, with the deeds of the Red Army making even inveterate conservatives misty-eyed. Churchill's chief military assistant, General Hastings Pug Ismay, tells a revealing story about his first trip to Moscow in October 1941. A British soldier, captured at Calais by the Germans, had escaped from a prisoner-of-war camp and made his way to Poland. After fleeing to then-non-belligerent Russia, he was accused of being a spy, thrown into solitary confinement on a starvation diet, and beaten almost daily. We took him back to England with us, and he was eventually awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal. But the citation of the deeds which earned him this distinction was not published. The courageous endurance of devilries perpetrated on a British soldier by an ally of his country could not have been divulged at the time. 
Communism had any number of Western fellow travelers, most of them individuals who matter little or nothing today, like Sidney and Beatrice Webb or the upper-class traders who infested Oxbridge, and from their vantage points in the Foreign Office or MI6, kept Stalin abreast of sensitive developments. From foreign ambassadors to notable writers and journalists, they came, they saw, and they denied everything. It became bad form to denounce communism in bien-pensant society, the mark of a Cold War warrior or his rabid progeny, a McCarthyite. All were agreed, except for neo-Nazis and Alan Clark, M.P., that Nazism was uniquely abhorrent, and by comparison it did not matter that communism was never equal or universal in practice. Unlike the Nazi Führerprinzip, nothing in theoretical Marxism could be construed as justifying quasi-religious personality cults, yet that is what resulted in the cases of Lenin and Stalin, not to speak of Mao or Castro. The nomenclatura, or those named to senior appointments, were an unelected elite with another name, from which its members derived enormous benefits and privileges, as did the wider new class of men and women who realized their ambitions through the system. The Oxbridge elite traders imagined they would have thrived in such a setup. The Communist International, common turn, so successful in recruiting spies among the privileged elites of the West, was not a vehicle of international revolution, but a subsidiary instrument of Soviet foreign policy, whose line was set by Moscow. One year social democrats were social fascists, the next they were allies in anti-fascist popular fronts. Self-denial was a communist virtue, and a number of Western intellectuals like G.D.H. Cole and Eric Hobsbawm found a strange fulfillment in suppressing their individuality in its service. All of which is to say that communism had a network of strategically positioned apologists and supporters in place long after Nazism was vanquished. 2. On Police States the cause they served was responsible for the arrest, torture, imprisonment, or execution of vast numbers of people because of their class or national origin, with the lucky merely having their lives ruined. Under such a system, class or ethnic origin was a hereditary taint as pernicious, if not as pervasive, as one based on race, although only the Nazis set to work with an exterminatory frenzy. The Soviets preferred to use forced labor to decimate those who were not shot. Although it is vaguely distasteful to compare the ways in which people died, the NKVD secret police constructed special shooting galleries comparable with those used in Nazi concentration camps to murder their victims more efficiently. But they did not create industrial-sized gas chambers to kill people in their daily tens of thousands. Both communism and Nazism claim to be scientifically founded ideologies. Since their pretensions to such status had no legitimate foundations, it is customary to refer to them as scientizing, meaning that these creeds mimic the methods and vocabulary of biology in the way that kitsch mimics art. But this was also linked to visions of their future societies that were of a millenarian utopian variety. In that respect, they resembled the dreams of human perfectibility that had inspired the more heretical streams in the Western Christian tradition. Communists thought they were creating a universal golden age, for by definition the creed believed in the perfectibility of the masses. Nazis looked forward to a heroic age, for their doctrines were more elitist and accorded greater importance to warrior virtues. In both cases, this quest for heaven on earth, with which mundane reality never conformed, meant hell for large numbers of people who were deemed to obstruct the road to the brave new world. That hell is everlastingly associated with concentration camps. These had common origins, but the institutional spectrum was larger in the Soviet case, just as the Gulag had a far longer history than its Nazi counterpart. Both the Bolshevik Kunstlager and the Nazi Konzentrationslager, KZ, derived their names from the Spanish original, used in Cuba to intern and isolate populations sympathetic to guerrillas a practice copied by the British during the Boer War. Tsarist Russia also had its forced labor camps, which at their zenith contained about 26,000 persons, although the imperial regime preferred remote exile for political opponents. 
accounts of Stalin's own experience of exile to Siberia and of the number of times he simply walked away, leaving his indigenous hunter friends behind, suggest this was not life-destroying in the manner of the gulag he created. It also reflected what people had done, rather than who they were, a major distinction between authoritarian systems like Tsarist Russia and the later totalitarian regimes. The young Stalin was a notorious bank robber who fully deserved to be in prison. Lenin's and Felix Dzerzhinsky's All-Russian Extraordinary Commission for Combating Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, the Cheka, later OGPU, and later still the NKVD, was primarily responsible for the Red Terror against political opponents and members of prescribed and persecuted former classes, such as the bourgeoisie. The best they could hope for was to be robbed blind or publicly humiliated through the demeaning tasks akin to the ones the Nazis imposed on middle-class Jews. Most were either shot or sent to a network of concentration camps which commenced with a former Orthodox monastery on the remote Solovetsky Islands within the Arctic Circle. There, an enterprising prisoner called Naftali Frankel rose to guard and then commandant. By converting the camp into a unit of production, a transformation enthusiastically adopted by Stalin. As we shall see, collectivization and hysterical industrialization generated a host of kulaks, wreckers, and saboteurs, coincident with the regime's need for more labor. The underlying principle in the gulag was brutally simple. Fit prisoners who worked hard received more to eat, while the weak were starved to death. A further refinement was to abandon the traditional Tsarist distinction, which the Bolsheviks initially observed by way of fellow-feeling, between the treatment of ordinary criminals and honorable political detainees. In fact, as in Nazi Germany, this hierarchy was deliberately and perversely inverted, partly because mere criminals were thought redeemable in ways that class or racial enemies and political opponents were not. Stalin's Soviet Union contained an immense spectrum of camps, best described by the novelist survivor Alexander Solzhenitsyn, as an archipelago spreading across the country's vastness. People could be spirited away and forgotten. During the early 1930s, huge complexes of satellite camps were established like those around Verkuta in Komi province, or the most notorious, those studded along the Kolyma River in the remote northeastern corner of the country. If the three-month journey locked in cattle trucks and the holds of freighters did not kill you, regulations that forbade outside work only when the temperature fell to minus sixty degrees Celsius invariably would. Over the gates of each individual camp was inscribed, Labor is a matter of honor, courage, and heroism, an exhortation which parallels throughout the SS camp system from Dachau onwards, whose inmates were enjoined, Work sets you free. Yet there were differences that are not trivial. If there was not much to choose between the casual brutalization and humiliation of the inmates by their guards, the Soviet gulag system was part of the modernization of remote regions, a process so ambitious that the skills of prisoners simply could not be ignored. The absence of a surrounding society in such inhospitable climes meant that the Soviet regime had to let a hierarchical inmate society evolve, in which those with skills— and some zeks or inmates were trained in the camps to occupy skilled and professional positions, assumed non-manual functions. As Solzhenitsyn's first circle showed, there were camps for scientists, working on voice recognition technology for telephones, which did not resemble Siberian lumber camps, where if the cold did not kill, the mosquitoes and heat of summer would. Nothing like this existed in the early Nazi camps, were in so far as there was work, it was of a mindless treadmill variety, like men pointlessly pushing a huge roller up and down Dachau's gravel parade ground, although that, too, would change. Nazi camps evolved from the initial wave of ad hoc and primitive detention facilities, which activist packs of SA men established in barracks and factories so that they could rough up and torture political opponents. The secret police of both the Nazi and the Soviet regimes, it should be emphasized, routinized torture, in contrast to the long-harbored aversion to it of the liberal democracies. The locations of 160 such places are known, 
but there were many more. An estimated 25,000 people, most of them communists, were held in these centers in Prussia alone in the spring of 1933, following the Nazi seizure of power. That figure rose by 2,000 in the summer as the national and local leadership of other parties were also interned. The historian Robert Jellatley estimates that, by the end of 1933, 100,000 people had spent brief periods in such camps, with a similar number subjected to brutality or harassment without being held in custody. The majority of these camps were soon disbanded, leaving some six to 7,000 detainees throughout Germany. There was even talk of abandoning camps entirely, so thoroughly had opposition been crushed. Many people seem to have believed newspaper reports that the function of these camps was re-educative, with an emphasis upon discipline, hygiene, and hard work. Following two amnesties, one at Christmas 1933 and the other the following August, by the end of 1934, there were only 3,000 camp inmates in the country. SS Empire Building explained why the camp system was regularized and gradually expanded. Part of a prerogative state that placed people beyond the protection, such as it was, of the law. In April 1934, Himmler appointed Theodor Eicke as inspector of concentration camps. Eicke was the commandant of Dachau, a camp in a munitions factory located in a satellite town of Munich. He developed the Dachau Regiment for inmates and for guards, drawn from the SS Death's Head Brigades, which became paradigmatic for the entire camp system since all guards were trained at Dachau. Corporal punishment was normal, and prisoners who tried to escape or who simply displeased the guards in some way were shot. Ica reduced the number of camps from seven to four, and from April 1936 their costs were assumed by the Reich budget. Although these camps were supposed to be an improvement on the earlier ad hoc arrangements, they were riddled with corruption as incoming inmates were robbed by the guards and every scam operated in the stores and kitchens. Prison labor was routinely used for entirely private ends, such as manufacturing furniture. As ordinary communist detainees were released, so these camps took increasing numbers of the antisocial or recidivist criminals together with smaller numbers of Jews convicted of race defilement under the 1935 Nuremberg Laws, which had criminalized miscegenation. By late 1936, there were 4,761 camp inmates, a figure that nearly doubled in early 1938, the year in which three new camps were opened at Buchenwald, Flossenburg, and Mauthausen in the Austrian Ostmark. These were adjuncts to brickworks and stone quarries owned by the SS German Earth and Stone Works, whose major function was to supply monumental building projects. The number of camps expanded again after the outbreak of war, adding Grossrosen in Silesia, and then Notzweiler in newly reconquered Alsace. 3. Living Gods the comparison between communism and Nazism is not exhausted by the subtle differences that were evident in how both regimes went about the unsubtle business of mass murder, although that is surely what lends them enduring historical significance. It may be fascinating that ordinary Germans and Russians still purchased bread, milk, and petrol and slept with each other, but that is not why anyone remains interested in this type of regime. The totalitarian dictators represented a regression to what Churchill called one-man power a form of idol-worship alien and odious to Anglo-Saxon civilization, and more akin to that of the ancient Egyptians and Aztecs, with their monumental structures and idols demanding perpetual human sacrifice. Both were based on something that in softer forms perennially threatens liberal societies. They were anti-individualist, with the Nazis' slogan, The Common Good Before Your Own Good, being as heroically collectivist as anything in Bolshevism. That at least was how the Dresden philologist Victor Klemperer saw things when on 31 December 1933 he wrote in his diary, National Socialism and Communism. Both are materialistic and tyrannical. Both disregard and negate the freedom of spirit and of the individual. Terms one rarely finds in the work of modern historians, for whom freedom, unlike identity, seems to have gone out of fashion. In Stalin's case, the emergence of a full-blown personality cult was more protracted than in the case of Hitler. 
whose charismatic dominance of the Nazi movement was established by the mid-1920s, before assuming godlike proportions in the following decade. Both men converted character flaws and social maladroitness into political assets. Hitler made the transition from being an awkward ranting bore into a compelling public orator with a story, indivisible from his own everyman's odyssey, which resonated powerfully with enough of his adoptive countrymen to make his rise irresistible in the view of the elites who jigged him into power. The Nazi party was nothing without him, and was itself structured around the leadership principle. For us the idea is the Führer, and each party member has only to obey the Führer, Hitler informed the left-wing Nazi Otto Strasser in 1930. Although Hitler's world view, as he grandiloquently called it, was a mishmash of ideas from the anti-Semitic Fulkish right, his personal synthesis of it was the Fons et Origo of Nazi doctrine. Heterodox tendencies, especially those that sought to elevate issues of class over race, were marginalized along with their exponents at an early stage. Violence was used sparingly against senior comrades, and only when Hitler's power was at stake. The 1934 Ruhm Purge was not a clash about ideas, but a power struggle between the SA and the army, with Hitler using his SS to destroy the less useful organization. Commenting on the Night of the Long Knives to his external trade commissar Anastas Mikoyan, Stalin exclaimed, What a great fellow! How well he pulled this off! Actually, Hitler had not pulled off much more than securing his own position. While he had smashed the German left and his own party militia, until 1944 he never struck at the political right, and came to regard that tactical omission as one of his few failings. Unlike Hitler, Stalin was not the originator of a doctrine, although there was a theory and practice called Stalinism, and had to work within a vast corpus of Marxist thought, as well as Lenin's adaptations of it, to the requirements of the Bolshevik party. He was one of the minor paladins of the revolution and civil war, overshadowed by the more charismatic Lenin and Trotsky in the oligarchic leadership. His public persona was modest and stiff, and his oratory ponderous and simple, using mantra-like repetitions and a jabbing forefinger for emphasis. It has been remarked, with justice, that Stalin's real Nazi analog was the slow and heavy party bureaucrat Martin Bormann, rather than the more erratic Führer, whose aversion to a day's paperwork was notorious. Although Stalin was less assiduous than is often claimed, he was in his element manipulating committees, the preferred format of Bolshevik party government, while building up a loyal clientele like a latter-day boyar. Among these lackeys he relaxed into a sinister camaraderie, watchful for personal foibles that might emerge during epic drinking sessions. Above all, he was a vengeful man with an accumulation of resentments for obscure slights. Occasionally he let the mask slip, as when, in 1923, he explained his chief pleasure in life to two associates. The greatest delight is to pick out one's enemy, prepare all the details of the blow, to slake one's thirst for a cruel revenge, and then go home to bed. With Lenin's patronage, Stalin became a not especially distinguished member of the Soviet collective leadership although he had belonged to the Central Committee since 1912. While not without intellectual pretensions as both poet and theorist, he hated the flashier intellectuals among his comrades, many of them Jews, or men whose role in the Revolution and Civil War was more distinguished than his own. He had the reputation of being a practical man, a pragmatist who supported the partial privatization of the new economic policy, NEP, while eschewing Trotsky's dream of world revolution. The only major area in which he differed from Lenin was his reluctance to accord non-Russian nationalities the degree of autonomy represented by the proclamation of the USSR. Like his colleagues, Stalin undertook a wide variety of roles, so many that in 1922 he had to be instructed to work a four-day week. In that year, he was appointed to the relatively insignificant post of General Secretary of the Party Secretariat. In December that same year, when Lenin contemplated potential successors, he enumerated the flaws of both Trotsky and Stalin in his Letter to the Congress, or as it became known, his Testament. 
In Stalin he detected a remorseless meanness of spirit beyond the hardness of heart common among the comrades, for Lenin himself had been no shrinking violet in terrorizing rivals. Following Lenin's incapacitating stroke, Stalin made himself indispensable to the factions jostling to replace the Bolshevik leader, the left oppositionists and right deviationists, factions that differed as to the way forward. He attracted to himself such loyalists as Koganovich, Kirov, Mikoyan, Molotov, Ojinik Yidza, and Voroshilov, who became his personal cronies. He used his position on the Org Bureau, which controlled party appointments to favor supporters with key positions throughout the Communist Party apparat. The little Stalins, who, obviously enough, were not without ambitions of their own. Ambitious young fellows like Nikolai Yezhov also knew the value of becoming experts in what is nowadays called HR, human resources, because that was the boss's own expertise. The oligarch-in-chief had dexterously destroyed all his rivals by the late 1920s, although at that time it was still not bon ton to shoot fellow leaders. What he had achieved was to create a disciplined party of the type that Lenin had aspired to. The inner party debates and discussions and the factions that resulted were replaced by an organization that put discipline above revolutionary idealism, even as the party's strategic decision-making Politburo itself became the cipher of one man and his immediate cronies, practicing a highly informal manner of government. After a seven years period of relative grace associated with the NEP, in which Marxist-Leninist dogma was relaxed to enable the economy to recover to its pre-1914 levels, comparison with the advanced Western world and strategic fear of Britain, France, and Japan led to the fateful decisions in favor of agricultural collectivization. In Stalin's reasoning, enhanced grain exports from factory-like farms would generate credits for the imported capital plant needed for crash state-planned industrialization which in turn would yield enhanced military security. The systematic exploitation of convict labor would also build the symbols of heroic modernity that the regime would present to itself, its people, and the outside world in a ferocious drive to catch up with the West in ten years. This endeavor was symbolized by the 140-mile-long White Sea Canal, a project begun in September 1931 and completed 21 months later, four weeks ahead of schedule. Some 175,000 convicts worked on this project day and night with their bare hands at a cost of 25,000 of their lives. Finally, the frenzied pace also enabled the regime to remobilize the energies and enthusiasms of the party itself, as an era of pragmatic compromise gave way to the aggressive resumption of the quest for social utopia. All these things came together— to produce mass death on a previously unimaginable scale. Collectivization enabled the party, its secret police, and young enthusiastic urban volunteers to penetrate the countryside in depth, making short work of a residual private sector, Orthodox Christianity, and the vestiges of several nationalisms. Peasants, with their weather-beaten idiosyncrasy and hide-bound superstitious religiosity, were to be remade into muscular adjuncts to machines. Combine harvesters and tractors were to transform the face of the countryside, which would be illuminated with the miracle of electrification that brought light bulbs into the remotest hovels. Force and surprise were used to coerce peasants into new collective farms, where they either worked as laborers employed by the state, or had to surrender a portion of their product from land they rented. An internal passport system in the cities ensured they were not free to migrate there. The Kulaks were excluded from this process and dispatched in fulfillment of arrest quotas to remote concentration camps devoted to gold mining or lumbering. The dragooning of the peasantry encountered resistance in various parts of the empire, notably in the Ukraine, where farmers ceased to deliver grain to meet the exorbitant quotas demanded by the state. It is likely that the hardness of heart Stalin showed towards the Ukraine was also connected to the persistence of nationalist sentiment there. The countryside was reduced to a resentful shambles where starvation threatened. In July 1932, Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars Molotov reported to the Politburo after a visit to the Ukraine, We definitely face the specter of famine, especially in the rich bread areas. 
the Politburo, or rather Stalin himself, decided, whatever the cost, the confirmed plan for grain requisition must be fulfilled. As a direct result of these policies, at least six million people starved to death after their diet had been reduced to bark, berries, and rats, while countless others were sentenced to death or terms in the gulag for withholding pitiful quantities of grain. This heroically irrational attempt to conform reality to an ideology, all dissenting economists were simply shot, was increasingly attributed to the vision of one man who emerged from what had been a collective leadership. Stalin deftly assumed the mantle of the dead Lenin. The loyal mourner, already the authoritative voice at Lenin's funeral, underwent a merger with the myth of the dead leader, the embalmed embodiment of the October Revolutionary Moment. The Lenin cult included a red icon corner in many homes, although the zealot who placed a photo of Lenin in his baby's pram to influence its future development was probably overly optimistic. By the late 1920s, Stalin was represented as Lenin's heir. Retroactively, his propagandists inflated Stalin's role as Lenin's trusty advisor, gradually giving Stalin greater prominence while Lenin was reduced to a name on the spine of a book Stalin held in his hands. As in the case of Hitler, Stalin's image was omnipresent and the object of hysterical adulation. Such images, especially when children were used for reasons of sentimentality, usefully distracted from the highly dysfunctional nature of both dictators' domestic arrangements, coincidentally involving the suicide of women they had been intimate with, Geli Raubal and Stalin's wife Nadja. Both leaders were bombarded with flattery and gifts from all sides although in Stalin's case the Red Empire was sufficiently vast and multicultural to take this to extremes of Asiatic fawning that even Nazis could not match. The accidents and setbacks that accompanied crash industrialization required a search for saboteurs and wreckers, which developed into a much more extensive reckoning with the Bolshevik Old Guard, and with any individual or category of persons who attracted Stalin's malevolence. Defense was the best form of attack, although this developed into what amounted to a giant blood transfusion within the party, to secure for Stalin more compliant tools than he had. The fortuitous assassination by a jealous husband of the Leningrad party boss Sergei Kirov in December 1934, a year after there had been rumblings of discontent regarding Stalin's erratic conduct aired at the 17th Party Congress, gave the dictator the opportunity to strike at past and prospective opponents. He did this with documented relish, since at the height of the terror he personally combed through nearly four hundred albums containing forty-four thousand names, ticking each with his endorsement of Purge Commission boss Yezhov's provisional sentence. His face flickered into view when light flashed into a shadowy recess during show trials whose high point was invariably the confession. Bolshevik political culture had assimilated an older peasant mentality of us and them, as well as a secularized belief in ambient demons, and the Civil War had acculturated them to colossal violence. In Stalin's own case, and he was manifestly the driving force behind the Great Terror of 1936 through 8, a vast exercise in purposive paranoia directed at the Communist Party, and an early propensity to psychopathic violence, well attested by Simon Seabag Montefiore, was combined with a thoroughly unmarxist admiration for Ivan the Terrible dark scourge of Moscow's boyars. His iron-fisted henchman, Yezhov's maxims for his subordinates were beat, destroy, without sorting out, and better too far than not enough. This political culture ensured that Stalin had many willing executioners, who spoke and thought like thugs, and advertised the blood spatters on their shirts after an interrogation. There were also hundreds of thousands of younger cadres who sought to move into the shoes of dead men, although only those who seek some vestige of progress, even in the terror, regard social mobility as its most salient feature. The chosen instrument was the NKVD, the self-styled unsheathed sword of the revolution, with its Lubyanka headquarters, a network of national and regional offices, and the extrajudicial gulag empire of NKVD-controlled concentration camps. Stalin's choice for the head of the NKVD at this time was Yezhov, a pint-sized individual he nicknamed Blackberry. Although Yezhov was not a career policeman, 
He had angled for the post with a stream of indirect criticisms of his predecessor Gengrich Yagoda's professional shortcomings, the oblique manner the Bolsheviks preferred for ousting an enemy or rival. Lev Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev were the first targets, arrested and tried for alleged involvement in the killing of Kirov. Conveniently, the assassin, Nikolaev, had already been shot, and a key witness, Kirov's bodyguard, had suffered a fatal accident while in police custody. Kamenev and Zinoviev admitted their moral culpability for Kirov's murder and were given five- and ten-year jail sentences. After more arrests had been effected, they and the exiled Trotsky were next accused of collusion with foreign powers, a charge that also leached towards people involved in industrial accidents that were viewed as willful sabotage. At their show trial in Moscow in the autumn of 1936, they confessed to membership of an anti-Soviet Trotskyist Zinoviavite center that had conspired to kill top Soviet leaders and were shot the following morning. Torture and the ensuing faked confessions were used to ramify putative plots endlessly throughout the ranks of the party. Stalin personally issued instructions to have people beaten to a pulp. By lowering the age of eligibility for execution to twelve-year-olds, it was possible to threaten the accused person's children to secure compliance. This threat was decisive in the case of the revisionist Marxist Nikolai Bukharin, who had fathered a much-loved child at an advanced age. Broken men and women humiliated themselves in court, with a few plucking up the courage to recant their confessions, only to reappear more broken and ready to confess again after further sessions with chair legs and iron bars. Judges and prosecutors sneered and vituperated at the defendants, while mob-like meetings were organized to urge the courts to greater rigors. Bukharin and fellow right deviationists were linked to the so-called Trotskyist Zinoviev Center, itself linked in turn to foreign intelligence agencies. The web of putative conspiracy spread to include Yagoda and senior NKVD figures, together with Red Army commanders, for the Army, military intelligence, and secret police had themselves been infiltrated by what was surreally called the Center of Centers. Yagoda and some 2,273 state security officers were arrested, including many of the commandants of gulags, and accused of corruption and incompetence, as well as membership of right Trotskyist terrorist and sabotage organizations. Most of them were shot. So were large numbers of political prisoners, and especially Trotskyites, already held in the camps, who were shot with or without the benefit of a perfunctory hearing by an NKVD troika. Among the false charges against Yagoda was that he had sprayed a mercury-based poison on the windows of his deputy and successor's office. In the real world, at this time, Yezhov ordered the killing of Abram Slutsk, the head of the NKVD's own foreign intelligence directorate. He was lured to an appointment, subdued with chloroform, and injected with lethal poison in his right arm. The death certificate claimed he had had a heart attack. In July 1937, the focus on high-profile individuals was replaced by blanket categories of suspects. Under the so-called Kulak Order, 268,500 people were slated for arrest, of whom 75,000 were to be shot, and 194,000 sent to camps. By the time Yezhov had finished, 385,000 had been shot, and 316,000 sent to the camps. Entire ethnic groups were falsely accused of anti-Soviet activity, to which the only response was a series of national operations that resulted in the murder of 42,000 ethnic Germans and the arrest of 112,000 Poles, of whom half were shot. Even the citizens of Outer Mongolia were not safe, with 11,000 arrested and 6,000 shot. In early 1938, Bukharin, Alexei Rykov, Yagoda, and others were tried and shot, while their families were either murdered too or exiled to the camps, the fate of Yagoda's wife, parents, sisters, nephews, and nieces. As Yagoda's example suggests, leadership of the NKVD was a dangerous occupation, giving a new meaning to the metaphor of knowing where the bodies were buried. Despite Yezhov's abject prostration before him, Stalin suspected that his NKVD chief reserved special information for himself. In April 1938, Yezhov was made Commissar of Water Transport, 
a post Yagoda had also held, as convict-built canals were part of the NKVD's remit. In August, one of his key aides in the Far East fled to Japanese-controlled Manchuria. Stalin moved Lavrenti Bieria from Georgia to act as Yezhov's deputy, just as Yezhov had been brought in to shadow Yagoda. In a characteristic ploy that Stalin used to distance himself from what he had instigated, the NKVD was corporately accused of excesses in the previous two years, in which 750,000 people had been shot and buried in mass pits surrounding the big cities. A further 750,000 were deported to the gulags in slow trains that clanked to the frozen peripheries of empire. Yezhov knew the signs and started drinking more heavily than he habitually did, and failing to turn up for duty with his customary zeal. Bieria began arresting Yezhov's subordinates and sent the interrogation protocols to Stalin. Yezhov's second wife, Evgenia, committed suicide after she had been unsettled by arrests of those near to her. Two days before she killed herself, with Varanol tablets supplied by her husband, she wrote a desperate plea to Stalin, which went unanswered. In November 1938, Yezhov resigned as head of the NKVD. He still entertained hopes of election to the Central Committee when he attended a meeting of party elders in February 1939. When his name was mentioned, Stalin rose and, puffing on his Dunhill pipe, left his corner and summoned Yezhov to the front of the meeting. Well, what do you think of yourself? he asked. Yezhov desperately pleaded his loyalty to Stalin and the party, only to be cut off with sharp questions about his associates, men whom Yezhov had already reported for conspiracy. Stalin again interjected, Yes, yes, yes. When you felt you were about to be caught, then you came in a hurry. But what about before that? Were you organizing a conspiracy? Did you want to kill Stalin? Top officials of the NKVD are plotting, but you supposedly are not involved. You think I don't see anything? Do you remember who sent you on a certain date for duty with Stalin? Who? With revolvers? Why revolvers near Stalin? Why? To kill Stalin? And if I hadn't noticed? What then? Each sentence interlocked precisely in a relentless steel trap of paranoia from which there was no way out except through the door in response to Stalin's dismissal. Well, go on, get out of here. Yezhov was arrested in April and interrogated throughout a year of incarceration. His life story was transformed from a Russian Bolshevik with impeccable proletarian and revolutionary credentials into that of a promiscuous Lithuanian bisexual whose factory worker father had been a brothel keeper before he married Yezhov's mother, a barroom dancer. At his trial, Yezhov struck a defiant note, shouting, I have fought honorably against enemies and have exterminated them. His only sin, he said, was that he had purged too few of them. Yezhov was shot on 2 February 1940. As an industrial society based on market capitalism with huge nationalized elements, Nazi Germany underwent no equivalent to Soviet collectivization of agriculture. German farmers were not benighted superstitious illiterates who had to be dragged screaming into the twentieth century, but rather the nation's finest biological stock with an honorable place in an ideology that mystified soil as well as blood. Whereas Soviet artistic propaganda celebrated the mechanization of the countryside, machines hardly figured in Nazi-era depictions of farmers— who seemed to belong to a previous age. The law sought to protect family-owned individual farms from the baleful influence of mortgage debt or partible inheritance, although the rate of industrialization ensured that the secular drift from land to city accelerated. Both regimes extolled the virtues of the industrial worker, whose heroic nobility was celebrated at every opportunity, as well as through public art. But neither did much to disturb the boss classes— who in the Nazi economy continued to make private profits for themselves and their shareholders, while Soviet managers were tools of the state, doomed if their businesses underperformed. 4. Party Men Both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union were one-party states, with membership being a ticket to privilege and preferment that had no analogue in democratic countries. In Britain, membership of the Labour Party might mean access to a cooperative funeral scheme, 
for a conservative admission to a garden fete, but not much more. Much the same applied to Democrats and Republicans in the U.S., with such local refinements as open primaries. By 1921, the Bolshevik bureaucracy was ten times greater than that of the Tsars, employing two and a half million people, or twice the numbers working in industry. For all the differences in ideology, the Nazi party performed many similar functions to the communists. Both parties concealed complex personal networks based on patron-client relations that cut across the meritocracy they formerly espoused. In theory, members were activist elites that communicated the will of the leadership to the mass of the population, while exercising a vigilant tutelage over them. For both systems, informing on others was a duty at the cellular level, where the party came really close to life as it was lived. Membership of the Nazi party, however, did not entail the remorseless self-scrutiny that was integral to being a communist, which had more in common with the world of monks and priests. There was no Nazi equivalent to the formal course of study or the confessional autobiographies that communists had to prepare for regular control commission purges, which served to contract the party after periods of indiscriminate expansion. After June 1934, when he settled accounts with under a hundred opponents in the Night of the Long Knives, Hitler never undertook anything even approximating to the Great Terror, which, as we have seen, resulted in the deaths of three-quarters of a million people, the majority of them communists. By Soviet standards, the Great Terror was not even a major event, if one compares it with the Ukrainian terror famine, or with what came later. Corruption was also common to regimes where personal whim became law, and the party stood above normal legal scrutiny. Boorish and delinquent behavior had been one of the minor forms of Bolshevik subversion of authority under the Tsarist regime. In the 1920s, the Bolsheviks advertised their personal asceticism, avoiding jewelry, gold teeth, and smart clothes in favor of military boots, crumpled uniforms, and scuffed leather jackets. The ideologist Aaron Soltz thought it best to look like a big slob, such as he was himself. These outward signs betokened proletarian identity, or rather identification with the proletariat, and revolutionary commitment, for the fashion was derived from the Civil War. Bad habits, notably alcoholism, resulted in black marks in a party that regarded such conduct as symptomatic of the social order it was eradicating. Vodka was like religion in creating a fuzzy world view. Yet the new man described by Bolshevik moralists and writers was a sober, rational being, with the soullessness of an engineer. Here again there is a parallel with the generation that came after the founders of Nazism. The founders still paid lip service to the European values of their parents' and grandparents' generations, from which they represented a sort of grand apostasy. These self-styled revolutionaries were conspirators and buccaneers, who knew enough about great paintings to want to steal them. The next generation, the one that Nazism forged, was described by the exiled Sebastian Hoffner in the following terms. What inspires and excites them is the vision, already quite undisguised, of the vast uniform establishment for work, procreation, and recreation, to which they will shape the conquered world, the dream of tabula rasa. The intelligent among them read Jünger and Nikish, and the saying of Soviet Marshal Tukhachevsky that the world must become naked again draws forth a deep response from them. To them, murder, torture, and destruction are no more a voluptuous disorder, but the new order. Hoffner called them prize scholars of inhumanity or what a contemporary historian calls the generation of the unbounded. There was a similar transition from the old bank-robber Bolshevik generation, epitomized by Stalin himself, to the technicians of power who ran the secret police empire. In both systems, there was a dichotomy between the official public morality and the private squalor beneath it. Soviet reality did not resemble the ideal image created by such professional moralists as Soltz for the benefit of communist youth or Komsomol members, although Soltz did volunteer, We are the ruling class here in our country, and life will be constructed according to us, which proved horribly true. 
Inequalities between the animals on the farm were as incremental and insidious as George Orwell was to depict them. The senior leadership occupied high-ceiling departments in the Kremlin, where they had the benefits of a communal kitchen, domestic servants, and a carpool stocked with imported black Cadillacs. The leaders and their families lived in each other's pockets as a tight-knit group. Although until the late 1920s even Stalin could walk unaccompanied to and from his offices, by the end of the decade he had a full complement of OGPU bodyguards and an armored luxury train for his trips out of the capital. The leadership also shared imposing mansions, built for an oil tycoon at Zubalovo, about twenty miles from Moscow, which were equipped with libraries, billiard rooms, and later a cinema. Holidays grew longer and more luxurious. Instead of taking a week here and there, Stalin and his inner circle took a month or two off in the semi-tropical south, in dacha complexes in the Crimea, or around the coast of the Black Sea. Although Stalin was personally puritanical and mean with money, like Hitler he had an artistic and literary clientele, led by the writer Maxim Gorky, who was given an Art Deco mansion in Moscow, a country dacha and cash gifts. Other potentates lived extremely well, too. The OGPU-slash-NKVD boss Genrich Yagoda was a notorious Sybarite, with an enormous collection of pornographic images, women's lingerie, and French wines, distributed around the four houses he used. He spent four million rubles decorating them, and his favorite dacha had two thousand orchids and roses. By the time Yezhov moved into his executed predecessor's Kremlin apartment, leather jackets were a thing of the past. In 1935, Stalin restored the title of Marshal for the Armed Forces, with an equivalent title for the head of the NKVD. Resplendent uniforms came back into fashion, along with lavish parties where the wives of the leadership engaged in competitive display. Naked self-interest was as evident in Russia as in Nazi Germany. On 29 August 1936, Professor Andrei Vyshinsky, rector of Moscow University, wrote to the board of the cooperative in which was located the dacha of Leonid Serebriakov, a close friend of Lenin's and head of the Directorate of Roadways. Vyshinsky himself had a modest one-story house in the same complex, but had long admired Serebriakov's grander establishment. You are a lucky man, Leonid Petrovich. Everything you have is wonderful. Your life and your dacha. Serebriakov was arrested on 17 August 1936 and tortured into confessing espionage, wrecking, and so forth. As prosecutor general, rather than professor, Vyshinsky had a very personal interest in the outcome of the trial. By October, he had obtained the house while receiving 38,990 rubles for the one he vacated, together with a 20,000-ruble grant to obliterate every trace of Serebriakov from the new residence. Even as Vyshinsky rose in court to ask of Serebriakov, please tell me when it was that you renewed your anti-Soviet criminal activity, he was engaged in appropriating, as state property, the latter's home, which passed out of the hands of the cooperative thanks to Vyshinsky's lawyerly cunning. The 17,500 rubles which the late Serebriakov had paid for it, he was shot on 30 January 1937, went into Vyshinsky's pockets, although some bold soul deducted 2,574 rubles for eight sets of curtains. Zoria Serebriakov, author of the best-selling Women of the French Revolution, was sent to a concentration camp. Vyshinsky had the old house torn down, despite having refurbished it, and then with the aid of 600,000 rubles from the state treasury, had a new dacha built, which duly acquired a pool, tennis court, volleyball court, and a large area of fenced-off private riverside. Although the Nazis had spent a decade denouncing the snouts in the troughs, Bunsen and Wirtschaft, bossocracy, of the Weimar Republic, they made the maxim enrichissez-vous the cardinal rule of political life. Because the party's last lap en route to power coincided with the Depression, Members routinely depicted themselves as hardly done by victims of a rotten system who were entitled to compensation. Although many of them had made themselves unemployed through their extreme activities and opinions, almost to a man they claimed that before 1933 they had been persecuted and victimized. 
They were unemployed because they had become Nazis, rather than, as is often assumed, the other way round. Still, they managed a good living because those who jangled the ubiquitous collection tins in front of donors to various Nazi causes were entitled to pocket a quarter of the take, a limit respected by few. The compensation culture swung into high gear after January 1933. A law was passed to waive all fines and penalties imposed on Nazis convicted of assault, theft, or vandalism, with the time limit brought forward to August 1934 to cover crimes committed against opponents after Hitler had come to power. An SS man even had his teeth fixed at public expense after he had lost a few brawling with communists. Nazis who lived in public housing found that the rent was significantly reduced, while there were one-off annual payments to help them celebrate a happy Christmas. Since so many Nazi rank and file were unemployed, strenuous efforts were made to find them decent jobs in either the public or private sectors. The Postal Service, for example, took on more than 30,000 deserving National Socialists between 1933 and 1937. Some private firms had to employ so many needy old fighters that they faced bankruptcy. Other firms with Nazi owners got the lion's share of publicly awarded contracts, regardless of whether they had put in the most competitive bid. Opportunities for this sort of corruption multiplied with the exponential growth of huge Nazi sectoral formations such as the German Labor Front or German Womanhood, which in turn awarded lucrative private sector contracts. In addition to the prodigious membership dues these vast organizations accrued, they also benefited from the property and equipment they purloined from prohibited political rivals and trades unions. Many of the benefits they offered ordinary working-class Germans, such as strength through joy cruises to Madeira, were disproportionately occupied by party fat cats and their families. Meanwhile, the head of the Labor Front's Contracts Department used bribery to secure building contracts for its construction arm. In 1936 through 7, he handed out some 580,000 Reichsmarks for this purpose. He went to some lengths to cultivate Zepp Dietrich, the head of SS Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler, the dictator's personal bodyguards. Dietrich received gold cigarette cases, hunting rifles, paintings, silk shirts and ties, while he and his SS men enjoyed lavish labor front hospitality. Each Christmas, Labor Front Chief Robert Lai also gave Dietrich a gratuity of 20,000 Reichsmarks. In 1934, Dietrich received a 50,000 Reichsmarks loan from the Labor Front's own bank, which he used to purchase a villa. Two years later, he sold the house back to the bank for twice its purchase price. In return for such generosity, the Labor Front was awarded the contract to remodel Leibstandarte's barracks at berlin lichterfelde the ostentation of these political nouveau riches, with their Mercedes and fur-coated wives, grated on the moral sense of many ordinary Germans who, doubtless, had frowned at overdressed Jews. Paradoxically, none of this opprobrium attached to the ascetic bachelor Führer, brooding for Germany on his mountaintop Erie. In fact, he benefited through the widespread belief that, if only the Führer knew, he would descend on the culprits like Christ among the money-changers in the temple. Jobbing old fighters into posts with the municipal gas or waterworks was not the only form of political patronage. Starting at the top, Nazi paladins disposed of huge secret funds from which they dispensed largesse to their clients. Although he made much of taking no salary, Hitler's private expenses were defrayed by the state while he had first options at art sales, building up a personal collection of 5,000 works. He could also dip into a personal fund, through which the enormous sum of 700 million Reichsmarks had passed by 1945. This was partly made up of royalties from Mein Kampf, a copy of which was presented to every married couple, while revenues from stamps bearing his portrait yielded 52 million Reichsmarks. Legacies to the Führer from supporters were exempt from inheritance tax. Hitler used this largesse to buy a loyalty or reward those he took an interest in. Beneficiaries included senior Wehrmacht commanders such as Wilhelm Keitel, 764,000 Reichsmarks, Leib, 888,000 Reichsmarks, and the tank expert Heinz Guderian, who used 1,240,000 Reichsmarks 
to purchase the appropriately named Villa Panzer. Favored artists, like the actor Emil Jannings, or the monumental sculptor Josef Torak, received country houses. Hitler also paid off senior Nazis who had fallen from grace. Stalin would have shot them. Such private slush funds were common among senior Nazi figures. Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler had two special accounts with the Dresdener and Steinbanks called Special Accounts S and R, primarily used to pay off the debts of favored SS subordinates or as subventions towards their holidays and house purchases. The accounts were also used to secure larger loans for the SS's own economic enterprises. The weird products of the SS porcelain works, yuletide lights and figurines of SS men, provided the Reichsfuhrer with a range of birthday and seasonal presents for subordinates or such foreign admirers as Lord Londonderry. Command of a concentration camp empire enabled him to loan Max Amann, the head of the party's Eyre Verlach publishing empire, the services of prisoners as gardeners, bricklayers, and roofers. Ilse Hess, wife of the Führer's deputy Rudolf, similarly had Jehovah's Witnesses from the Sachsenhausen and Ravensbruch camps, tending her plants and vegetables. Goering was probably the most avaricious. His pseudo-aristocratic lifestyle involving hunting and collecting paintings became paradigmatic for the rest, with even a working-class drunk like Labour Front Chief Robert Lai obsessed with filling his walls with old masters. The annual running costs of Goering's magnificent hunting lodge, Karenhall, at Schorfheide were nearly half a million Reichsmarks, on top of the fifteen million Reichsmarks the complex had already cost the taxpayer. Goering had another hunting establishment at Romanten, a villa in the air ministry complex in Berlin, an alpine residence on the Obersalzberg, a castle and five more hunting lodges scattered across Pomerania and throughout East Prussia. Then there was the special train, with its bakery and wagons for ten luxury automobiles. The two residential carriages alone cost the taxpayer 1,320,000 Reichsmarks per annum. The German car industry threw in a yacht called Karin II to complement Karin Hall, named after his wife, worth another 750,000 Reichsmarks. His personal art collection, mostly stolen from Jews and others, had 1,375 paintings, 250 sculptures, and 168 tapestries worth a total of several hundred million marks. His declared taxable income was 15,795 Reichsmarks, on which he paid 190 Reichsmarks tax. Compared to Goering, Propaganda Minister Josef Goebbels was austere. In 1932, his income as Berlin's Gauleiter was a modest 619 Reichsmarks. A year later, he was receiving an annual ministerial salary of 38,000 Reichsmarks, still fairly modest, but supplemented by another 300,000 Reichsmarks in fees for his weekly editorial in Das Reich, his own ministry's newspaper. In 1936, he acquired a villa on the exclusive island of Schwanenwerder in the lakeside Wannsee suburb of Berlin. It had been compulsorily purchased for 117,500 Reichsmarks from a Jewish doctor. In 1939, Goebbels sold it to an industrialist, but continued to live there rent-free. The Berlin municipality also gave him usufruct of a piece of land on Bogensee, where he spent 2,200,000 Reichsmarks building a splendid house. Later it would gift him a neighboring 500 acres of woods where he could frolic with his many mistresses. The party's regional bosses, the Gauleiters, were supposed to epitomize the genial populist face of the movement, but were known as golden pheasants or pashas. They created their own foundations, with which they built up major industrial operations, and rewarded their clientels. The initial capital came from the revenue of regional party newspapers, money diverted from public drives to help the unemployed, or commercial enterprises expropriated from Jews. These black accounts, as they were collectively known, were not audited by the Nazi party's Reich treasurer, who was powerless to intervene in what was seen as a matter of political patronage. The tax affairs of senior Nazis were also deemed so sensitive that they all had to be centrally filed at an office in Berlin, 
where all the obvious instances of tax evasion and fraud went unnoticed. 5. New Moral Beings It is important to grasp the grubby realities of both the Nazi and the communist systems because they claim to have instituted reigns of public virtue through such slogans as healthy popular instinct. Both dictatorships abandoned traditional moral norms based on transcendental authority or natural law to institute the regimes of hate rather than love that Churchill spoke of. They were contemptuous of what, during the Civil War, Trotsky dismissed as papist Quaker babble about the sanctity of human life, a view he backed up with machine guns pointing at the backs of his own troops. For Marxists, ethics were a branch of metaphysics, superstructural flim-flam that camouflaged an iniquitous social order. Bukharin once wrote that building communism was akin to a carpenter making a bench, with whatever was expedient being necessary. Ethics transforms itself for the proletariat step by step into simple and comprehensible rules of conduct necessary for communism, and in point of fact, ceases to be ethics. Communism and Nazism claim to be agents of vast historic processes, which serve to diminish the individual moral agency of leaders and subordinates. There were a few subtle differences, for Hitler still invoked providence as his guide and paid lip service to the Almighty, references which were off-limits for the atheist ex-seminarian Stalin, even if he occasionally referred to a god he thought did not exist, and would relicense orthodoxy when his regime faced defeat in 1941. For Bolshevism, the supreme moral value was represented by the party as motor force of the class struggle. Whatever obstructed or resisted the onward march of progress was, a priori, evil. Everything is moral that serves the world revolution, and everything is immoral that serves to split the ranks of the proletariat, to disorganize and weaken it. The concepts of murder and theft were replaced by liquidation and expropriation, words that petty bourgeois apologists continue to use to show how progressive they are. Nazism similarly abandoned any notion of a universal morality. It saw the preservation and propagation of the Aryan-Germanic race as the ultimate good, with the operation of allegedly natural laws being evidence of divine inspiration. In this cosmology, the Jews occupied the diabolic role of Satan, as any moral, social, or political evil, however improbable, could be blamed on their pernicious influence. To fight the Jew was doing the Lord's work, as Hitler put it. While few Germans probably shared the fully developed messianic mania which that statement reflects, anti-Semitism could not have been other than pervasive. Many reasons may explain why Germans disliked Jews, from material envy to provincial resentment of their coruscating urban wit. But they may also have included subconscious resentment towards the moral sobriety even secular Jews espoused, which was why Nazism found such a ready audience for propaganda that generalized onto the group the excesses or misconduct of a few Jews. In both political creeds, entire categories of people were removed from the orbit of reciprocal moral obligation through the use of egregious stereotypes that converted individuals into members of demonized categories. Both totalitarian parties used zoomorphic imagery to associate their opponents with insects, rats, and other vermin, but it was their ability to substitute categories for individuals that was especially pernicious. A man with a Jewish best friend saw him being arrested for deportation by the Gestapo. He recalled that at the time he had not thought how terrible they are arresting Jews, but instead, what a misfortune Heinz is Jewish. This reduction of moral universalism and a gangster-like disdain for sentimental humanitarianism was accompanied by efforts to curb or eliminate alternative sources of moral authority. Long before Stalin, the Bolsheviks aggressively sought to destroy the Orthodox Church, and not simply because it was one of the major pillars of Tsarism and the Old Order with its own extensive landholdings. Its monks and priests obstructed the party's access to the minds of the peasant majority, and provided them with an account of human existence and a moral code that were diametrically opposed to the progressive narrative of Marxism. 
It is not necessary to rehearse the story of the Church's persecution at the hands of such organizations of fanatics as the League of the Militant Godless. While the Nazis included a generous representation of militant anti-clericals, with an admixture of cranks who subscribed to forms of neo-paganism, in many respects, Lutheranism shared their anti-Semitism, nationalism, and hatred of the Weimar Republic, and many of its adherents were well disposed towards the Führer as an agent of moral restoration. About a million of them joined the German Christians, a sect that sought to conform Christianity to the tenets of National Socialism. Inevitably, this resulted in schism, as those who refused to go this far broke away to form the Confessing Church. This made it impossible for the Nazis to gather Protestants into a single Reich Church. Although in history's retrospect, Italian regimes are associated with millions of people murdered or imprisoned, youthful enthusiasm was their preferred image at the time. Like the German communists, the Nazis were a conspicuously youthful party, who used the battle cry, Make room, you old ones, against the Weimar Republic. The average age of members of Hitler's cabinet was forty, in comparison with fifty-three years of age in Chamberlain's government, and fifty-six in that of the USA. In 1934, Nazi party members were on average seven years younger than members of other parties, and five years younger than the average age of the German male population. Their politics had something of Peter Pan about them. Hitler said in September 1935, I believe the German folk will not grow older in the next few years, but will create the impression that it remains forever young. Because of its racial, biological fixations, Nazism was negligent of the interests of the elderly, concentrating instead on transforming young men from beer-swilling students into men swift as greyhounds, tough as leather, and hard as Krupp steel, as Hitler had it. All totalitarian societies seek to capture and manipulate children and adolescents, whom they regarded as blank slates or malleable clay to be shaped at will. To control them was to control the future, forging a new type of moral personality with each successive generation, bereft of the Jewish and Christian codes that had inhibited or shamed previous generations. The totalitarian aspirations of both the Bolsheviks and Nazis were remarkably similar. A Congress of Bolshevik Educational Workers announced in 1918, We must create out of the younger generation a generation of communists. We must turn children, who can be shaped like wax, into real good communists. We must remove the children from the crude influence of their families. We must take them over and, to speak frankly, nationalize them. From the first days of their lives, they will be under the healthy influence of communist children's nurseries and schools. There they will grow up to be real communists. Hitler was also concerned to involve the little racial comrades in a succession of Nazi organizations, which culminated in service in the armed forces or police. These boys join our organization at the age of ten and get a breath of fresh air for the first time. Then four years later they move from the Jungfolk to the Hitler Youth, and here we keep them for another four years, and then we are even less prepared to give them back into the hands of those who create our class and status barriers. Rather we take them into the SA or into the SS, into the NSKK, the National Socialist Motor Corps, and so on. And if they are there for eighteen months or two years and have not become real National Socialists, then they go into the labor service and are polished there for six or seven months and all of this under a single symbol, the German spade. And if, after six or seven months, there are still remnants of class consciousness or pride in status, then the Wehrmacht will take over the further treatment for two years, and when they return, we take them immediately into the SA, SS, etc., and they will not be free again for the rest of their lives. In both cases, existing youth organizations were banned or subsumed into the new totalitarian arrangements. In Russia, this meant that the imperialist Boy Scouts, whose founder was British, were suppressed to give a monopoly to the party's Commissal organization for 15 to 21 year olds, which in 1922 spawned the young pioneers for those aged 10 to 15. By 1925, a million young men and women were Commissal members. In Germany, the rude arrival of the Hitler Youth for Boys and the League of German Maidens for Girls 
signified the end of a rich heritage of voluntary associations of young people connected with the churches and political parties. Those devoted to fresh air and nature were readily subsumed by Nazism. These organizations were designed to fashion new moral personalities and future party cadres. The Hitler Youth and the Commissal undertook anti-religious activities, although only in the Soviet Union were they part of an aggressive campaign of atheism, rather than, as in Germany, a periodic manifestation of anti-clericalism against the despised priests or Pfaffen in the absence of any Jews to persecute. Having a pioneer or Commissal member in the home exerted a chilling effect on family conversation, perhaps especially on still religious grandparents, to the point where the older generations fell to whispering when their offspring were about. Anything of a remotely subversive nature was likely to be denounced. Both regimes also experimented, more or less disastrously, with education. Lenin insisted on retaining a traditional system, albeit one in which class-based affirmative action governed access, and such things as religion had been stripped out. Others favored different types of anti-authoritarian experimental schools, which quickly degenerated into pseudo-democratic shambles. From 1929 onwards, a purely vocational approach became more important, with young people sent to work in factories and mines or to run literacy campaigns in the countryside. Later, they became cheap labor for the five-year plan. Resentment against educational privilege as an obstacle to upward social mobility was evident in Germany, too. As in Russia, where every professor of over ten years' standing was simply sacked, venerable German university professors were hounded out by fanatic Nazi students and opportunistic younger faculty members. Jews were peremptorily expelled in line with laws that purged the civil service of political opponents. Both Britain and the U.S. benefited immeasurably from the influx of over a thousand men and women trained in what had been one of the world's most respected higher education systems. The Nazis endeavored to circumvent the existing class-based secondary system in favor of a series of experimental institutions, such as the Adolf Hitler schools, the National Political Educational Institutions, and the pseudo-medieval Ordensburgen. Established by rival factions of the Nazi leadership, these sought to manufacture a new elite to replace those who merely had the benefit of brute experience. The enterprise was doomed to fail because their emphasis was on physical fitness and a series of subjects corrupted by ideology, taught by a new class of academic hacks. In both Germany and Russia, the content of education was debased with an ideological spin on even neutral subjects like mathematics. A typical Soviet exam question was, the proletariat of Paris rose up and seized power on 18 March 1871, and the Paris Commune fell on 27 May of the same year. How long did it exist? Nazi textbooks invited pupils to calculate the net cost of caring for disabled or psychologically damaged people. In any free and mostly merely authoritarian societies, the state stops short of the family except in egregious cases of abuse or neglect. Life in totalitarian states is different. The Bolsheviks actively subverted the bourgeois family, notably by relaxing divorce laws to the point that it sufficed for one partner to send notification of intent to a registrar to dissolve a marriage. Chronic housing shortages and belief that communal living was inherently virtuous further disrupted the family by forcing strangers into close proximity in apartments with communal kitchens and washrooms. All social classes had to breathe and exude the same smells, while distinctive personal possessions were sold or chopped up as firewood. The generous representation of emancipated women in the Communist Party meant that Bolshevism at least contemplated liberating lifestyles in ways the male-dominated Nazis never considered. Whatever glamour attached to such individuals as the actress and film director Leni Riefenstahl. The first Soviet women's minister, Alexandra Kolontai, was a keen proponent of the view that in a collective society, which explicitly sought to abandon traditional orthodox morality, sex should be of no greater moment than drinking a glass of water. Both Lenin and Stalin were sufficiently old-fashioned to deplore such views, although Bolsheviks seem to have been more promiscuous than other classes. Of course, this did not mean abandoning selection of partners based on social class, although the bias was now in favor of proletarian partners— in line with the general maxim of proletarisez-vous. 
Marrying a bourgeois had the same stigma as an aristocrat falling for a chambermaid in the pre-revolutionary past. As hard-working activists, Bolshevik parents had a correspondingly greater entitlement to the use of nannies, one of several respects in which they replicated the lifestyle of the former aristocracy they otherwise denounced. The Nazis did not leave the family as a private sphere either. It was the germ cell of the Aryan-Germanic race and nation. They sought to reverse secular trends towards smaller or childless families through policies that penalized bachelors and rewarded those who reverted to the large family of the previous century. Divorce was made easier from 1936 onwards, notably through recognition of the relatively modern concept of irretrievable marital breakdown, which in this case meant encouraging couples who had not reproduced within three years to try their luck elsewhere. Marriage loans, introduced in 1933, were to be amortized through each successful childbirth up to a maximum of four, although a system of medals and other rewards, introduced five years later, were designed to make four to eight children normative. Such child-rich large families were expected to orientate themselves outwards to party and state in the sense that working men joined the German labor front, women the Nazi womanhood, and children the youth organizations. These large families were not the same as indiscriminately big, worthless families, whose tendency to disorder and delinquency meant that they were categorized as antisocial. They were subjected to the coercions of welfare, or worse, negative eugenic policies that licensed their voluntary and involuntary sterilization. For selection, based on eugenic and racial criteria, was at the heart of Nazi attempts to control human relations and reproduction to improve the Aryan-Germanic race. Positive eugenic measures would help the racially sound reproduce without secular constraint, while negative steps would curb the rest. Racial laws, backed up by public violence, would prevent intimate relations between Aryan-Germans and Jews. The more advanced-minded Nazis, including Heinrich Himmler and Martin Bormann, regarded polygamy favorably to enable eugenically exceptional men, including themselves, to breed at an enhanced rate. Their furtive infidelities were as nothing compared with the sexual athleticism of their colleague Josef Goebbels on the Babelsberg casting couches with would-be starlets. Both dictatorships lauded the sacrifices of such emblematic youths as Herbert Norkus, killed in a brawl with communists, or Pavel Morozov, the prototypical Soviet enthusiastic narc. They were key figures in their respective parties' martyrologies, stars on the honor roll of those who sacrificed their lives for ideological ends. The Hitler Youth, from 1931 onwards, under Balder von Schirach, was intended to inculcate unswerving devotion to the man whose name it bore, while training the bodies and minds that Germany needed to wage war. Although membership was liberating, in the sense of enabling young adults to be among themselves, there was no mistaking the military nature of its activities, or the existence of a command structure based on seniority. Camping trips were replete with bugle calls and flag parades, and frequently involved war games with rival units from other regions or towns. Orienteering hikes often led to the borders of countries that Hitler subsequently invaded. Practice with air guns gave way to the use of small-caliber rifles while specialist courses were available in piloting gliders, sailing, truck driving, Morse code, and operating radios. Less athletic types could beat and blast out martial music on drums and trumpets. The attractions of membership were obvious, even to critics. Parents and school teachers were relatively powerless vis-a-vis -vis these children in uniform. Indeed, children and young people demand of their parents that they be good Nazis that they give up Marxism, reaction, and contact with Jews. In this way, a little tyrant was introduced to the home hearth, and the little tyrants looked forward to the economic paths that have opened up to them due to the persecution of Jews and Marxists. For social mobility was as characteristic of the German dictatorship as it was of Russia. Of course, the formal recitation of Hitler Youth activities does not preclude the bullying and homosexuality that were also part of this world— nor does it deny that many young people were bored by the relentless physical exercise and ideological indoctrination. Even the major attraction, namely great times without danger, diminished as Hitler took ever more bolder risks. 
After the introduction of mass conscription, the military connection was made explicit with the appointment in 1937 of Lieutenant Colonel Erwin Rommel, the future field marshal and Desert Fox, as the Wehrmacht's liaison officer to the Hitler Youth. 6. Abroad in the World If this serves to highlight the similarities and subtle differences between the two totalitarian regimes, their diplomatic relations deserve discussion. Attitudes to time distinguish the ways the two leaders viewed the world. Contrary to popular belief, Stalin did not abandon the goal of world revolution. He merely realized that such a thing would be a very long time coming, and worked accordingly to consolidate its Soviet foundation. History, or the Marxist-Leninist prophetic version of it, would take its course. Hitler had a much more developed sense of his own mortality, being a hypochondriac prone to morbid thoughts, and of his own world-historical uniqueness as a prophet, whereas Stalin was more like a mafia boss dispensing rewards and punishments. Moreover, unlike Stalin, who inherited and completed a long process of violence that pulverized the old social order, Hitler had come to power through accommodation with it, an arrangement that limited what he could undertake in Germany itself. Realpolitik meant that many latent reckonings were deferred. Acts of heroic willpower were also intrinsic to National Socialism, with Hitler setting the pace. While Stalin pursued anything other than a revolutionary foreign policy, Hitler made a series of calculated gambles in the increasing certainty that only he could implement his own vision, and that his time on earth was running out, a feeling that grew more intense after he had turned fifty, the age when the end lap comes into clear view. He brought much the same last-chance mentality to his frenzied attempt to exterminate Europe's Jews. German-Soviet relations in the 1930s were strained at the public level, where competing ideologies clashed, but diplomatic, economic, and military relations were more tortuous in practice. The advent of Hitler led to a sharp deterioration of the rhetorical climate. How could it be otherwise, as his movement's triumph over a murderous domestic communist opposition was part of the regime's foundational mythology, something he reverted to time and again as he magnified the numbers of Nazi victims. There was also the matter of what he said about Germany's eastern destiny in Mein Kampf, the relevant pages being copied and translated for the Soviet leadership, and his unshakable belief that communism was a Jewish-inspired revolt of lesser beings against the Aryan remnant that had ruled Tsarist Russia. German anti-Soviet propagandists merely had to identify Jews all over the place in the Soviet Union. They did not need to demonstrate that the Soviet Union was a nightmare, because Stalin did that for them. There was indeed an ethnic element to the Great Terror, as from late 1934 Stalin began persecuting Germans in the Volga region and Siberia as spies connected to vaster anti-Soviet fascist Japanese Trotskyite conspiracies. In July 1937, some 42,000 ethnic Germans were shot by the NKVD in one of several national operations that cost the lives of 247,000 men and women with foreign ancestry. The Germans mounted a Brothers in Need campaign, which duped such people as Cosmo Lang, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and was run by the anti turn, an organization based in Goebbels' Propaganda and Popular Enlightenment Ministry from 1933. The anti turn ably publicized the evils of communism to both domestic and foreign audiences, primarily to incline Western countries towards Germany as the bulwark against world communism, until 1939, when it was wound up in honor of the German-Soviet pact. As for the Soviets, they were tough-minded enough to ignore the Nazis' crushing of their German comrades. Many who fled to Moscow were later shot by Stalin as ideological deviants. But in analyzing National Socialism, the Soviets were hindered rather than helped by Marxism, or what Konrad Haydn memorably called a small child's version of world history. In this, a figure like Fritz Thyssen, the steel magnate, who was so stupid that Hitler would not have employed him as a valet, became a monopolist puppet master of sinister proportions. Much of the Soviets' intellectual energy went into identifying which precise faction of monopoly capitalism had engineered Hitler into power, an approach they had applied to his immediate Weimar predecessors. As they also regarded the opposition social democrats as social fascists, 
They conspicuously failed to identify the irrational mythic elements that made Hitler so dangerous an opponent. But it was what Stalin thought that counted. We are far from feeling elated about the fascist regime in Germany. But what counts here is not fascism, if only because fascism in Italy, for example, has not prevented the USSR from establishing excellent relations with that country. Beneath the rhetoric, relations were more complicated. Russia and Germany were historic enemies, but during the 1920s they were drawn together as fellow pariah nations. On 16 April 1922, they concluded a treaty at the Italian town of Rapallo, in which each renounced all territorial and financial claims against the other, and agreed to normalize their diplomatic relations and to cooperate in a spirit of mutual goodwill in meeting the economic needs of both countries. A secret annex, signed on 29 July, allowed Germany to train its military in Soviet territory, thus violating the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. The leaders of the Red Army, fatally for themselves, sought to maintain cordial relations with the German Reichswehr after Hitler came to power. Even though Hitler closed German bases in Russia in 1934, leaving substantial kit behind, Red Army leaders hoped that they could still send officers for training in Germany, under Reichswehr officers they prized as mentors. Although both sides had proponents of improved economic cooperation, trade between the two countries steadily declined throughout the 1930s until it was almost non-existent by 1938 through 9. In the mid-1930s, there was a minor attempt to translate trade talks into broader political discussions, but Stalin was more focused on the pursuit of collective security and wiping out his own putative enemies at home, while Hitler's attention was absorbed by rearmament and the Rhineland, and used strident anti-communism to reassure Germany's Western neighbors. In his New Year address in January 1936, Hitler defined Nazi Germany as a bulwark of national European discipline and culture, against the Bolshevist enemy to mankind. Then Stalin struck at the Red Army Officer Corps, perhaps the single greatest supporters of a rapprochement with Germany. Using documents planted by German intelligence, Yezhov's NKVD claimed that Marshal Tukhachevsky and other senior commanders were engaged in a Trotskyite conspiracy against Soviet authority, financed and instigated by German fascists and the Reichswehr, which had actually been renamed Wehrmacht in 1935. Some 34,301 officers were arrested by the NKVD, and 22,705 of them were shot or disappeared. They included 91 of the 101 members of the top military leadership, of whom 80 were shot. Tukhachevsky, who had criticized Stalin during the Russo-Polish War nearly two decades before, was tortured and shot, along with his wife, daughter, and other family members. The purges wiped out the main Russian advocates of German-Soviet cooperation, but greatly lessened the potential value of Russia in any military alliance that might be contemplated by Western powers. Munich transformed the situation. After the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia, Hitler regained the Memel land from Lithuania in March 1939, the last bloodless conquest he made. German military planners turned their attention to Poland, notwithstanding a ten-year non-aggression pact, and the complicity of the military regime in Warsaw in the destruction of Czechoslovakia. German rhetoric about the plight of ethnic Germans in Poland was ratcheted up, although Hitler's object was not merely to retrieve Danzig, Posen, Poznan, Upper Silesia and West Prussia, but to liquidate the Polish state for all time. As he said, this is not about Danzig. There was a corresponding shift, at first glacier-like, in the Kremlin. On 10 March 1939, Stalin gave a wide-ranging speech, which reflected his dismay at appeasement. He claimed that Britain and France had adopted a position of neutrality or non-intervention towards fascist aggression. He said they were encouraging Japanese ambitions in China and those of Germany and Japan against the Soviet Union. Cautioning them that Germany might turn on the West instead, Stalin used the homely metaphor that they should not seek to rake over the fire with someone else's hands to warn them not to rely on Soviet support. Some historians claim that this speech was a signal to Germany from Stalin that he wanted to talk. If so, few in Berlin noticed. 
What was about to happen mightily contributed to the notion that beneath the skin, the two totalitarian regimes were like twin brothers, lining up for aggression and violence, regardless of their superficial ideological dissimilarities. On 3 May 1939, Stalin replaced Maxim Litvinov, his Jewish foreign minister, with the ethnically Russian Vacheslav Molotov, a nom de guerre meaning hammer, since 1930 the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars, entrusted by Stalin with the task of removing all the Jews in the commissariat. Litvinov was allegedly dismissed for failing to report unauthorized talks held by Ivan Maisky, the Soviet ambassador to Britain, with the Finnish foreign minister. Whether the dismissal was part of a decision to downgrade the pursuit of collective security is disputed. Hitler certainly regarded the dismissal of Litvinov as a decisive signal, since he attached such inordinate importance to Jews everywhere. While he continued to inveigh against Russia, his foreign minister, who had failed to deliver the Anglo-German alliance during his time in London, used personnel from his private fiefdom, the Dienststella Ribbentrop, for exploratory talks with Russian diplomats. The latter assured them that ideological differences or subtleties were no obstacle to an eventual rapprochement. Experts from the German embassy in Moscow were brought to Berchtesgaden to explain to Hitler the significance of this changing of the Kremlin guard. The Germans convinced themselves that the Soviets were fundamentally Russian nationalists, pursuing their interests much like any other great power. A series of meetings designed to clear up the contractual obligations of the Czech Skoda arms works to Russia, which had been affected by the German invasion, mutated into wider exchanges about economic relations in general. At some point in the summer of 1939, the sights were raised towards the prospect of talks about political matters. This seems to have been an initiative of the negotiators themselves, although since both Georgi Astrakov and his German interlocutor Karl Schnurra gave contradictory accounts of who first made the running, it is difficult to decide who was most keen to extend the boundaries of their talks. At the highest levels, there was intense suspicion. Stalin thought that Germany was exploiting the contacts to induce the Japanese to draw closer to the Axis, while Hitler suspected that Stalin was merely playing him to strike a harder bargain with Britain and France, who were dithering over his Triple Alliance proposals. The chief obstacle was that the Western powers were not prepared to accord Stalin the right to protect the Baltic. This was despite having allowed Hitler to dismantle Czechoslovakia without even consulting the Soviets, who were also allies of the Czechs. Throughout June and most of July, it was the Germans who most explicitly revealed their desire for a political settlement. Molotov did not take the bait until 29 July, when he authorized Astrakhov to listen to what the Germans were proposing. During the ensuing talks, the negotiators exchanged heady opinions on several subjects, including Stalin's resurrection of Russian nationalism from within the defunct doctrine of world communist revolution, or the common hostility of communism and fascism, towards capitalist democracy. News of these discussions was relayed to Hitler and Ribbentrop, just as the former was having doubts about the strength of Germany's western defenses, when he toured them near Saarbrücken. His economic experts were also simultaneously reporting that in the event of a British blockade, Germany would have no alternative other than to get raw materials from Russia. Ribbentrop instructed Ambassador Friedrich Graf von der Schulenburg in Moscow to pursue political talks, urging him on in the face of Molotov's apparent reluctance. By contrast, the British and French were almost nonchalant in their approach to talks with the Russians, taking weeks to respond to each communication. One of the reasons was that they were divided. Whereas the French were prepared to sacrifice Polish interests to reach a deal with Moscow, the British insisted on respecting Warsaw's acute sensitivities towards Russia. The imminent arrival of an Anglo-French military mission in Moscow added urgency to Hitler's desire for an agreement, for he had already decided to carry out his attack on Poland. In Soviet eyes, the mission was more evidence that the policy of collective security had been destroyed at Munich. The Anglo-French mission was also not empowered to agree anything without referring back to London or Paris where further communications had to be made with Romanians and Poles. General Aimé Dumanc and the improbably named Admiral Reginald Plunkett Ernley Earl Drax left London on 5 August on a slow-moving freighter, the city of Exeter, 
which had a top speed of thirteen knots. They arrived in Leningrad on 10 August. In talks a few days later, it soon became apparent that the British and French had no coordinated military strategy for meeting a German onslaught, which hardly filled the Russians with confidence, any more than did guarded intelligence about the Maginot Line and the tiny force Britain proposed to land on the continent. In addition, and as always, Polish Foreign Minister Josef Beck adamantly refused to countenance the passage of Soviet troops through his country. By contrast, the Germans were already talking about secret protocols and expressing a lack of interest in the Baltic states and Bessarabia, provided Stalin would give Germany a free hand in Poland. The term German Poland was employed, clearly implying that there was a Russian Poland up for grabs. As the talks with the British and French petered out, the Russians indicated that, provided the economic negotiations were satisfactorily concluded, they would proceed to political talks with Germany. Now the Germans began serious importuning, seeking to send Ribbentrop to clinch a deal before their armies moved into Poland. The Russians wanted the terms of the secret protocol copper-bottomed in advance and insisted that Germany commit to restraining Japan in the Far East. In dictatorships, diplomats are glorified errand boys. Gangster types savor reminding these fuddy-duddy survivors of the old order who has the power of command. Knowing the date for his invasion of Poland, Hitler personally wrote to Stalin to ensure that Ribbentrop would be received earlier than the more leisurely dates Molotov had stipulated. Stalin waited twenty-four hours before responding, but he said that Ribbentrop could come on 23 August. Hitler was jubilant. Stalin has agreed, I have the world in my pocket, and loaned Ribbentrop his personal Fokker Wolf Condor aircraft for the journey to Moscow. Ribbentrop arrived with his large entourage at 1 p.m. at a central aerodrome, decked out with swastikas, hurriedly purloined from the props of anti-fascist films. At 3 p.m., he and two aides set off for the Kremlin. He was surprised to be welcomed by Stalin in person as well as his foreign minister. Stalin's presence ensured the negotiations were both focused and serious. They concluded a ten-year non-aggression pact, from which Stalin personally expunged some flowery verbiage Ribbentrop had included, on the grounds that the two dictatorships had been pouring buckets of shit over each other for years. In a secret protocol, they decided to partition Poland along the Narev, San, and Vistula rivers, with the final borders to be determined in line with future political developments. Stalin was to retrieve Bessarabia from Romania with no demur. The only disagreements were over the Baltic states, where Hitler wanted Lithuania, agreed easily enough, but also Kurland, the mainly German-speaking part of Latvia. Stalin sought the whole of Latvia, along with Estonia and Finland. Ribbentrop retired to speak with Hitler from the German embassy. After two hours, a telegram arrived from Berlin, Yes, Agreed that was relayed to Stalin at 10 p.m. The Soviet dictator trembled slightly before shaking Ribbentrop's hand on a deal done. Ribbentrop relaxed into a preposterous estimation of how news of the pact would be greeted by the Italians and Japanese, knowing full well that his old friend Hiroshi Oshima, the Japanese ambassador to Germany, had already resigned over the issue. He assured Stalin that the anti comintern pact had always been directed against the British. A lavish banquet at which the vodka flowed continued until 2 a.m., although the Germans noted that Stalin drank only water from a hip flask. At that late hour, Ribbentrop and Molotov were able to sign the finished documents, including the highly secret protocol carving up Eastern Europe in the war they all knew was coming. Ribbentrop telephoned his master at around 4 a.m. The Fuhrer was so ecstatic that he allowed himself a rare glass of champagne, exclaiming, now Europe is mine. The others can have Asia. Germany's second Bismarck arrived back to a hero's welcome on 24 August. He told Hitler that, because of the pact, the British and French would not now go to war over Poland, which was due to be attacked on the morning of Saturday the 26th, in less than 48 hours. Pravda celebrated the agreement as an instrument of peace, but one of its key architects, Trade negotiator Georgi Astrakov was recalled from Berlin and died while under arrest. Ribbentrop merely swore his aides to secrecy about what had taken place on that Moscow night. The agreements made the German invasion of Poland inevitable. 
although strictly speaking by then, it had become a joint project. Chapter 4 The Rape of Poland 1. Between a Hammer and Anvil The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact confirmed Hitler's calculation that he could conquer Poland with impunity. Britain and France would not dare to fight. Last-minute Italian suggestions of a further conference to dismember Poland diplomatically were not seriously entertained. Hitler and Ribbentrop, however, failed to appreciate that the pact had nullified one of the implicit arguments for Western appeasement, namely the Führer's claim that he was a bulwark against Soviet communism. They also underestimated the extent to which they had exhausted British willingness to tolerate Hitler, now fully revealed as an insatiable aggressor as well as a liar. Addressing his armed forces commanders the night before the deal in the Kremlin was struck, Hitler twice expressed fears for his own mortality. My existence is therefore a factor of great value, but I can be eliminated at any time by a criminal or a lunatic, and no one knows how long I may live. Therefore, better a conflict now. Everything revolved around personalities. His, Mussolini's, Stalin's, even the Spaniard Franco's. There were no personalities, in the sense of great men, on the Anglo-French side, merely little worms. He made the object of the forthcoming life-and-death struggle explicit. Annihilation of Poland in foreground. Goal is elimination of vital forces, not the attainment of a specific line. His mind was locked on war, and his staccato peroration was grim. Close your hearts to pity. Act brutally. Eighty million people must obtain what is their right. Their existence must be made secure. The stronger man is right. The greatest harshness. British and French attempts to mediate between Germany and Poland were stymied by outrageous German demands, which the Poles rejected. A last-minute intervention by Mussolini was brushed aside. Josef Lipski, Poland's ambassador in Berlin, commenced closing down his legation. German troops moved eastwards from June 1939, ostensibly to participate in defensive maneuvers, including the strengthening of frontier fortifications they had no intention of using. The Reich Party Day of Peace was used to cover substantially increased domestic rail traffic, although the assembly had been cancelled on 15 August 1939. Two waves of troops were successively put in place so that by the final days of August they were no more than a day's journey from the Polish border. There was no formal declaration of war. At 5.45 a.m. on 1 September, German radio broadcast a proclamation by Hitler to the German armed forces. Ethnic Germans in Poland had been persecuted by bloody terror and are being driven from their homesteads. To put an end to this lunacy, there remains no other recourse for me but to meet force with force. Hostilities had commenced an hour earlier with salvos from a German cruiser stationed off Danzig's Westerplatte, although terrorist and border incidents, notably at Tarnuf Railway Station and the Gleiwitz Radio Station, had been fabricated by the SS to give substance to Hitler's outrage over alleged Polish violations of German territorial sovereignty. On 28 August, two suitcase bombs planted by German agents exploded in Tarnuf Railway Station, killing 22 people and wounding 35 more. On the 31st, the head of the SS Security Police, Reinhard Heydrich, telephoned a code message, Grandmother Has Died, which resulted in SS men disguised in Polish uniforms storming a radio transmission room near the tall Larchwood antenna at Gleiwitz, four miles inside the German-Polish border. They brought along the war's first casualty, Franciszek Honiok, an ethnic German tractor salesman known for his pro-Polish sympathies, who had been abducted the previous day. He was drugged and then shot after the SS had broadcast inflammatory statements in Polish to the accompaniment of their own gunfire. The key line was, Uwaga, tu Glavica, rozgloznia zenajduje ze w rekach Polska, or, Attention, this is Glavica, the broadcasting station is in Polish hands. This message was in turn relayed by the BBC, as the Germans hoped it would be, 
as Western decision-makers grappled with the odd idea of Poland attacking Germany. Elsewhere, more SS men dressed as Poles stormed a German customs post at Hochlinden, shouting, Long live Poland and Down with the Teutons in Polish. After the gunfire had died down, the frightened customs men stumbled out and tripped over six corpses dressed in Polish uniforms. They noted their shaven heads, actually acquired in Dachau rather than the Polish army, for these were tin cans, as the code dismissively dubbed them, killed to order. The corpses were quickly photographed and then buried. To dramatize these incidents for the world's press, the SS had a model made on which the location of alleged instances of Polish aggression were lit up by touching a button. Heydrich loved this toy, repeatedly pressing the button and exclaiming, This is how the war started. On the morning of the invasion, the chief of staff of the Luftwaffe telegraphed the Soviet telecommunications commissariat to request that Radio Minsk punctuate its broadcasts with the call sign Richard Wilhelm 1.0 as well as taking every opportunity to announce Minsk. The Soviets refused to broadcast the call sign, but they obliged with the repeated Minsks, which were used by German pilots for navigational purposes as they bombed Poland. At 10 a.m. on 1 September, Hitler was driven through Berlin's sparsely populated streets to the Reichstag, which since being destroyed by fire in 1933 had convened in the Kroll Opera. About one hundred deputies failed to appear because transport was disrupted by troop movements. Their places were taken by unelected Nazi functionaries bussed in by Goering. Someone forgot to install loudspeakers outside and to shut down a noisy construction site, while throughout the capital bars continued to serve customers, with Hitler's broadcast voice competing with barroom chat and chinking glasses. Dressed in simple field grey with his lone iron cross, Hitler wallowed in the alleged persecutions visited by the Poles upon ethnic Germans, who had allegedly been sadistically and bestially tortured, only to be murdered in the end. This was followed by his now standard attempt at damage limitation in the form of assurances to Britain and France that he harbored no aggressive intentions toward the West. Italy was politely informed that its offer of assistance was unnecessary. He said his war aims were modest, to resolve the status of Danzig, and the Pomeranian Corridor, which separated West from East Prussia, and a change of tone in German-Polish relations, to warrant peaceful coexistence. This was a lie, as he wished to erase Poland from the map. So too was his expressed desire to limit the damage bombing might inflict on civilians. The night before, twelve hundred Poles had died in a single raid on one town but still he threatened that if unlawful weapons like poison gas were used, he would respond in kind. All of this was the prelude to a series of solipsistic remarks that seemed to imply the war was about Hitler himself. I am asking of no German man more than I was ready to do through four years. I now wish to be nothing other than the first soldier of the German Reich. Therefore I have put on that tunic which has always been the most holy and dear to me. I shall not take it off again until victory is ours, or I shall not live to see the day. He mused, plangently, about a possible successor, and compared himself with Frederick the Great, the warrior Prussian king. Vehement, exhortatory slogans ensued. No surrender, no more November 1918s. Iron discipline, strong will. Deutschland, Sieg Heil. In London, Chamberlain had decided upon the arbitrament of war after the House of Commons had met his last-minute procrastinations with outrage. At 9 a.m. on Sunday, 3 September, Henderson went to the German Foreign Ministry and handed over a British ultimatum that would expire two hours later. Hitler's interpreter, Paul Schmidt, took it to the Chancellery where, after pushing his way through the bustling throng, he reached the calm of Hitler's office. When he had finished translating this communication— he studied the reactions of Hitler and of Ribbentrop. After a long silence, during which Hitler stared into space, he asked Ribbentrop, What now? Ribbentrop, who had reassured Hitler that such an outcome was unlikely, replied that a French ultimatum was probably imminent. Although some call this the outbreak of the last European war, which became global only in 1941, in fact far-flung places were engaged once Britain was involved. 
It is still moving to recall the process seventy years later. While none of the Dominions had been signatories to the Munich Agreement, nor to the guarantees Britain gave Poland, and Romania, and Greece, in the words of the New Zealand Prime Minister, they would range ourselves without fear besides Britain. Where she goes, we go. Where she stands, we stand. The Cabinet in Wellington even backdated the declaration of war to coincide with Britain's, symbolically ignoring the time difference. From Canberra, the Australians pitched in under the slogan, One King, One Cause, One Flag. So did Ottawa and Pretoria, this last apparently causing Hitler to laugh. In Britain itself, only a few communist intellectuals, like the historian Eric Hobsbawm, would go into print supporting the Stalinist line that Anglo-French imperialism was a greater menace than the fascists who were now allied with Moscow. 2. The First Blitzkrieg The German invasion of Poland had land, sea, and air superiority underpinning it, and came from almost every point of the compass, with the Soviets invading from the east once the German incursion was a fortnight underway. Case White, the invasion plan, committed sixty German divisions against Poland, or about one and a half million troops, leaving only a token screening force in the west. Although the German army depended heavily on 40,000 horses, the spearhead of the invasion force were five tank divisions, consisting of about 300 panzers each, with eight more lightly armored but fully motorized formations. It also used artillery to devastating effect. With 1,500 aircraft versus 400, the Luftwaffe quickly gained air superiority over Poland's generally obsolete machines, which, contrary to myth, were mainly destroyed in aerial combat rather than on the ground. German aircraft bombed and strafed concentrations of Polish troops, interdicted road and rail transport, and used dive bombers to terrify the inhabitants of Warsaw and other cities. Two German army groups, under Fedor von Bock and Gerd von Rundstedt, with a stellar supporting cast of generals, fought their way past Polish forces, which for economic and political reasons were massed near the western frontier defense in strategic depth would have presumed Soviet cooperation, which the Poles did not have. Moreover, the western regions of Poland were the most industrialized and populous part of the country, which could not be abandoned in case the British and French achieved a ceasefire and forced Poland into a Munich-style settlement with Germany. Although the Poles fought bravely, mounting various counteroffensives, they were outfought by superior German generals in a series of battles of encirclement. They hoped the West would move against Germany, but this was to hope in vain. Nonetheless, they resisted the German onslaught for only one week less than the combined and well-armed Anglo-French armies were to do the following year. Any hope of tactical retreat eastwards was abandoned when, on 17 September, the Red Army invaded eastern Poland, allegedly to protect ethnic Ruthenians and Ukrainians from the ambient chaos, after the collapse of Poland's government, which fled to Romania the following day. This line had been worked out in repeated discussions between Stalin, Molotov, and the German ambassador, Schulenburg. Negotiations that eventually involved Ribbentrop in a further flying visit to Moscow. Definitive adjustments to the conquest were made at a Kremlin conference in the last week of September, where the Soviets relinquished the province of Lublin and parts of the province of Warsaw in return for control of Lithuania. In order to avoid a clash between the German and Soviet armies, as the Germans were 125 miles east of the demarcation lines agreed by Molotov and Ribbentrop, the Germans began an orderly withdrawal as the Russians moved in to replace them. Meanwhile, artillery and air bombardment crushed the last major centers of Polish resistance around Maudlin and Warsaw. The capital had been heavily bombed from the first day of the campaign, with 17 consecutive raids on Sunday, 5 September. Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov sent the German government a congratulatory telegram when German forces reached Warsaw's suburbs. Armored assaults through the suburbs on the 8th were twice repulsed by anti-tank guns and by such tactics as emptying the stock of a turpentine factory over the streets and igniting it as the tanks crossed. A major counter-thrust, which resulted in the Battle of Burza, also delayed the German advance. 
From 15 September onwards, Warsaw was besieged, with 175,000 German troops ranged against 120,000 Polish defenders. The Germans brought up massive railway-mounted artillery and sent in waves of bombers. The destruction of the city's main waterworks meant that there was no potable water, nor anything to extinguish the extensive fires caused by German use of incendiary bombs, showered from transport planes as well as bombers. Hospitals and Red Cross stations were also hit, regardless of any identifying symbols. Warsaw capitulated on 27 September. By the time the fighting stopped in early October, 70,000 Polish troops had died, with a further 130,000 wounded. 400,000 were taken prisoner. German losses included about 11,000 killed, 30,000 wounded, and another 3,500 missing in action. Russia suffered 700 killed and 1,900 wounded. On 5 October, after 12 high-ranking hostages had been held and the streets cleared at gunpoint, Hitler arrived to inspect his troops and to drive through the deserted streets of Warsaw. Many German officers had a hazy understanding of the rules governing captured enemy troops. In mid-September, General Walter von Brauchitsch issued an order that explicitly associated all Polish POWs with the localized murder of ethnic Germans in Bromberg. This opened the door to systematic mistreatment of prisoners, while the reasoning behind the order set a precedent for the infamous Commissar Order, issued two years later in Russia. In a significant number of cases, prisoners were simply not taken. They were shot or herded into barns, which were then torched with pitch and petrol. After an intense firefight in a wood near Siapialuf on 8 September, in which a Wehrmacht captain was shot in the head, the monocle-wearing colonel commanding a motorized infantry unit ordered 300 Polish soldiers to remove their uniforms and then machine-gun them as insurgents. Prisoners of war were corralled in primitive circumstances, often in fields ringed with barbed wire. Food and sanitation were inadequate. At night, the Poles were ordered to remain seated on the ground as their mass was swept with searchlights. Inevitably, some stood up or moved when a fight or panic broke out, which at Zambruf on 11 September resulted in 200 killed by machine-gun fire and a 100 wounded who were left untreated. Another violation of the laws of war involved the separation of some 50,000 Jews from the mass of Polish prisoners of war, by means of interrogation or based on circumcision or names. They were held in separate ghetto POW camps and used for forced labor. By early 1940, half of them, or 25,000 presumably fit young men, had perished. 3. No Civilized Restraint this brief recapitulation of the five-week military campaign does not convey the bestiality of the German assault on Poland, which was accompanied by drunkenness, looting, and murder. A joke quickly made the rounds in Warsaw that the Orbis Travel Agency was offering trips to Berlin under the slogan, See Your Furniture Again. The incidence of rape was not high, for the laws on race defilement promulgated at Nuremberg four years earlier were a deterrent. Although the occasional protest by regular soldiers was once used to disguise that fact, the German army was as much to blame for atrocities as the various SS units that accompanied them. For most of the young German soldiers, this was their first experience of a foreign country, where people looked alien and spoke incomprehensible languages, factors which easily inclined men towards violence when, for example, communication was through easily misunderstood hand signals rather than speech. But it was what these troops had in their heads, from their time in the Hitler Youth or in the Reich Labor Service, that partly explains why they disregarded war's important moral aspect, namely not to squander whatever moral capital one's own side possesses through gratuitous violence. Germany lost that intangible battle within five weeks in Poland, through indiscriminate aggression that arose from a combination of ideological and situational causes. The ideological precipitators are easily stated. Prussia-Germany harbored a superiority complex towards the Poles, who were a byword for feckless muddle, or Polnische Wirtschaft, as Germans contemptuously called it. They believed in the existence of a West-East cultural gradient, 
in which the supposedly ideal orderliness of rural Germany itself abruptly tapered off into a chaos of dingy, straw-covered hovels, ambient squalor, and ill-tended livestock that allegedly characterized the Polish countryside. The only orderly exceptions were places inhabited by ethnic Germans, for Kultur had indelibly racist accents. Anything of any value in Poland, from the astronomer Copernicus and the sculptor Weitstoss onwards, had been the product of German rather than Polish Kultur. Then there were the Jews, who comprised ten percent of Poland's population, the first large concentrations of Jews these young troops had ever encountered as Germany's own diminishing Jewish population constituted half of one percent of eighty millions. Letters written by German soldiers serving in Poland again and again reported that these Jews were worse than even those crudely caricatured in Der Stürmer, the most prurient and viciously anti-Semitic Nazi publication, where all the Jewish noses resembled number six as they lasciviously ogled innocent-looking blonde Aryan girls. These were Jews unlike the assimilated Jews that German troops may have encountered at home, and readily identifiable as such by dress, names, or beards. Their poverty seems to have incited as much animosity as the alleged wealth of the German Jews. These Jews spoke Yiddish, sometimes cravenly shouting Heil Hitler, their pronunciation of Heil Hitler, as the Germans arrived. These terrified people were subjected to public torments, such as having their beards burned, cut, or tugged off, scenes captured in countless photos that show them surrounded by jeering German soldiers. In other places, Jews were forced to sweep out German billets, or to tow carts filled with their own stolen possessions, or to clean latrines with their bare hands, all actions intended to rub their noses in their allegedly genetic aversion to manual labor. Only the widespread acceptance of anti-Semitism in German society under the Nazis can explain how ordinary young men indulged in such extraordinarily aberrant conduct. Contempt for the Poles was combined with an exaggerated fear of civilian resistance, which, historically, the Prussian-German army always met with a mailed fist. Interwar Poland was home to a number of ultra-nationalist organizations— some of which tried to combat the subversive activities of the ethnic German minority and the Nazi organizations that supported them. The membership of the Polish chauvinist organizations had been carefully monitored by the Reich Main Security Office of the SS, often aided by ethnic German academics who fingered their Polish colleagues for the secret police. As usual, a false, or at best a wildly exaggerated threat, gave Hitler the pretext he liked to adduce in order to justify what he wanted to do anyway. The intention was not simply to crush any resistance the Germans encountered, or imagined they had encountered, but to wipe out those classes who, from the time of the partitions, 1792 through 95, until Poland was restored in 1919, had maintained an enduring sense of Polish national identity, which in practice meant landowners, Catholic priests, and teachers. The front-loaded, highly mobile German campaign meant that few military resources were devoted to securing rear areas behind the advancing troops. This partly explains the extraordinary viciousness German troops exhibited towards the civilian population. The invading force moved so swiftly that large numbers of Polish troops were left at large in the Germans' rear, including the usual quotient of deserters and stragglers. Since they sometimes continued or resumed combat, occasionally in civilian clothes, this gave the invaders the feeling that they were being attacked in an underhand way by opponents who had forfeited the right to be treated as regular combatants. Although the Wehrmacht High Command did not issue anything analogous to the murderous orders that preceded the invasion of the Soviet Union, Hitler's intentions were clear enough from what he had said to his generals. During a conference at the Berghof, with senior army commanders on 22 August, he assigned the task of pacification and policing behind German lines to the SS. According to some of the generals present, including Bock and Franz Halder, the chief of the general staff, Hitler spoke of his desire to depopulate parts of Poland to resettle them with Germans, and expressed his intention of eliminating Poland's elites to make Poland disappear. 4. The False SS Army Dichotomy 
The decision to deploy the SS had been taken in April. SS and Gestapo personnel had accompanied German troops into Austria, the Sudetenland, and Bohemia Moravia. Under orders restricting them to arresting rather than shooting political opponents, during the period before fixed Gestapo posts were established. In May, the head of the SS security police, Reinhard Heydrich, was given responsibility for forming four task forces, or Einsatzgruppen, for the Polish campaign, a role he devolved upon Werner Best, a thirty-six-year-old lawyer who was both a senior security police and Gestapo officer. Best had to select and deliver two thousand officers and men suited to the tasks Hitler envisaged. All but four of the commanding officers of these task forces and their thirteen subsidiary Einsatzkommandos were also graduate lawyers in their thirties. By July, these units had grown to seven, augmented by two thousand two hundred fifty order police to bring the total available manpower to forty two hundred fifty. This included a large special purpose task force under SS Obergruppenführer Udo von Voyersch, a Silesian aristocrat who had served on Himmler's personal staff. Three battalions of the SS Death's Head Division, which guarded concentration camps and was utterly wedded to the necessity of annihilating Germany's enemies come what may, along with Hitler's bodyguard, the Leibstand Arta SS, were also deployed to Poland. Their signature approach to pacification was to hang people from lamp posts. Finally, within a week of the invasion, Himmler's adjutant, Ludolf Hermann von Alfensleben, assumed SS responsibility for ad hoc ethnic German self-defense forces, numbering about 18,000 men, who it is estimated were responsible for killing between 20 and 30,000 Polish civilians during this campaign. Personnel for the SS task forces were selected because of their prior experience of Poland or its border regions, so that they knew the lie of the land and had views about the inhabitants. Many of them were veterans of the ferocious intercommunal strife that had characterized ethnic German-Polish relations in the aftermath of the Great War, when the Poles had risen to overturn the results of a plebiscite in Upper Silesia. While the categories were not mutually exclusive, Eleven of the twenty-eight officers were veterans of the Great War, who had sufficient military credibility to interact with the regular army units they were attached to. Lastly, the troopers' SS personnel records testified to their unconditional ideological commitment. Although only Dr. Hans Trumler was formally described by his superiors as a psychopath, albeit one with the erect bearing of a Prussian officer— the common denominator for selection was evidence of involvement in extreme right-wing paramilitary organizations before joining the SS, police, or Gestapo, where in turn they had demonstrated ideological soundness and steadiness. These were the missionary elite of National Socialism, with a dualistic view of the world and no vestiges of the Christian upbringing or humanistic education many of them had passed through, before acquiring a more compelling and narrower set of values. In June, the leaders of these groups underwent a two-week training period at the SD or SS Security Service School at Bernau, near Berlin. The instructors included Hauptsturmführer Herbert Hagen, chief of the SD's Jewish desk, who talked about Jewry as a universal political opponent and its significance in Poland. At a meeting held at the Berlin Gestapo headquarters on 18 August, these leaders were told that their mission was to combat saboteurs, partisans, Jews, and the Polish intelligentsia, and to mete out punishment for the persecution of ethnic Germans. Then there were bonding sessions, usually involving much alcohol, exercise, and swimming, as well as group cinema visits. On 27 August, they saw a sentimental piece set in Hungary. In this film, a Teutonic wanderer was stabbed in the back by a treacherous gypsy, and then nursed back to health by simple Hungarian fisherfolk. The wanderer then got his revenge on the gypsy by killing him. A week later, members of that audience shot their first victims, three cutthroat razor heroes, in Lublinitz, as Lublinitz became, in Poland, although for all one knows, they may have still been in an imaginary Hungary. By the end of August, these task forces have been given special wanted persons lists, which had been compiled jointly by the security police and the Abwehr, German military counterintelligence. These lists consisted of ten ledgers containing over 60,000 names, 
who were the targets of Operation Tonnenberg. Tonnenberg being the name of a famous defeat the Teutonic Knights suffered in 1410 at the hands of the Poles, as well as the location of General Paul von Hindenburg's victory over the Russians in 1914, for the liquidation of Poland's elites. There was no doubt from where the order came. Writing to a colleague, Heydrich said that Hitler had given him the extraordinarily radical order for the liquidation of various circles of the Polish leadership, killings that ran into the thousands. These particular orders were not shared with the Army Command, whose view of the role in theater of these SS formations was confined to rear-area pacification and did not include liquidating Poland's elites or, as it transpired, killing 7,000 Jews before the year was out. Army officers, coming as they did from a culture based on hierarchy, were naturally obsessed with the question of who was in charge. They assumed that the Nazi formations would be under the authority of army field commanders, but in practice, they took their orders from Himmler and Heydrich, invariably backed by Hitler in the event of conflict. Judging from their pre-invasion briefings to their troops, the army leadership fully anticipated guerrilla-type resistance from a population they regarded as cruel, hostile, and sneaky by nature. German intelligence assumed there were 12,000 members of Polish paramilitary organizations in the corridor alone, simply by extrapolating fighters from membership roles of ultranationalist organizations. Individual army commanders issued orders that were plainly illegal under treaties to which Germany was a signatory. On 4 September, 8th Army decreed that civilians who were suspected of having shot at German troops, or who were inside buildings from which fire had come, or who had weapons at home, were to be summarily shot without any legal proceedings. Walter von Reichenau, the commander of 10th Army, issued similar orders the same day, augmented by instructions to shoot three hostages for every German soldier killed. On 10 September, Feder von Bock decreed that, in the event of his troops taking fire from a house, it was to be burned down. If no specific house could be located, then the entire village should be burned down. Further orders lowered the age at which captured resistors could be shot to cover those younger than eighteen, although in practice such orders were academic, as the entire campaign was characterized by massive violence that only firm and repeated intervention by officers at all levels could have stopped. It was never forthcoming because commanders at the highest level were cowed by the Führer's adamantine views. Military violence is usually kept in check by military policemen, but in Poland, the army's own police forces, including the secret field police, were unlikely to prevent atrocities as they were busy carrying them out themselves. A typical incident occurred on 2 September in the village of Vyshanów. The day before, German troops had rounded up a few Polish army stragglers and had taken them away. On the 2nd, newly arriving German troops who had run into desultory sniper fire demanded that the villagers should give up any Polish soldiers they were harboring. On being told, truthfully, that there were none, they set up firing positions and started shooting into the village, setting part of it aflame. While mopping up, the German troops encountered villagers hiding in cellars. One cellar held twenty-one people, including eight women and thirteen children. Ignoring the sounds of crying children, the soldiers dropped three hand grenades into the cellar, which killed all but three of the villagers. The culprits were not SS men, but members of an army motorized pioneer battalion, whose motto was Swift and Hard. Army commanders had no objections to nipping the operations of active Polish insurgents in the bud by arresting and shooting them, especially when they were caught gun in hand. Although the practice was forbidden by the Hague laws of land warfare, they also resorted to seizing and shooting civilian hostages to deter others as their predecessors had during the Franco-Prussian War, and in France and Belgium during the Great War, whenever civilian resistance had been encountered. By the conclusion of the Polish campaign in early October, the army had summarily executed 16,000 Poles, sometimes by firing squad, but more often by less formal executions. Since the hostages were usually selected from local worthies, the practice did part of the SS's work for them in the liquidation of the country's elite. It may be useful to look a little closer at how specific incidents evolved within the fluid and foggy chaos of battle and its tense aftermath. 
Some German officers had fought in the Great War, and some troops were veterans of interracial struggle. Volkstumskampf against Poles in the early 1920s. But the majority had never been in combat before. Consequently, they were extremely jittery, imagining that any noise was gunfire directed at them, even weapons they themselves had discharged. It was rather telling that one German commander ensured that his troops had no ammunition when they marched into the town of Chenstakova, lest they react to some minor event by shooting down curious bystanders. German army training included neither fighting in the dimness of forests and woods, of which there were many in northern Poland, nor, more importantly, close-quarter combat in urban centers where fighting could come from any alleyway or window. In addition, the Germans had been told to expect the enemy to use underhand irregular tactics, and so every incident was seen through that conceptual prism, even if the bang they heard was a car backfiring. But there was something more, born of the contempt they felt toward the Poles. Letters from German soldiers reveled in the power to destroy, with almost lyrical accounts of the burning sails of a windmill turning like the Germanic sunwheel in the dark sky. Five. Bromberg. Scenes that were perhaps inevitable in a handful of places where there was bad blood between Poles and ethnic Germans were deliberately generalized and used to legitimize the wholesale commission of atrocities that served a wider agenda. Bromberg, or Bidgosch, was a particular flashpoint used for this purpose. Between 1 and 5 September, Polish troops killed about 1,100 ethnic Germans in the city, figures multiplied fivefold on Hitler's insistence, before they were published in the German press under the headline, Bromberg's Bloody Sunday. As the Polish troops retreated, order was maintained by a civil defense committee consisting of local worthies, while about 2,200 Boy Scouts, laborers, Railway men and students joined an urban militia which set up defensive positions at the city hall and in a neighborhood called Schwedenhöhe. Barricades and firing positions in apartment blocks were set up in anticipation of the German arrival. Gun battles erupted between these militias and soldiers of the 122nd and 123rd Infantry Regiments of the regular army. Superior German firepower soon prevailed, and after the defenders had surrendered, they were kicked and battered with rifle butts. Sporadic sniper fire throughout the city led the local German commander to order searches for weapons, and the arrest of anyone fingered by the ethnic Germans who had attached themselves to the army as local guides. Those found in possession of weapons, even antiquated muskets inoffensively displayed on a sitting-room wall, or accused of killing ethnic Germans, were led away and shot, as were civil servants, lawyers, teachers, and priests. When the sniping continued, 4th Army Command ordered the taking of civilian hostages, who were paraded on the old market square. Four hundred of them were shot in reprisal for an unknown but small number of Germans who may have been hit by random gunfire. Meanwhile, the free-ranging subunits of SS Task Force 4 had regrouped in the city on 5 September under Helmut Bischoff. He reported to Berlin that, since many ethnic Germans were unaccounted for, it was likely that large numbers of them had been murdered. This report sent Hitler into a rage, and he ordered Himmler to carry out savage reprisals. Bischoff claimed that what he and his men saw in Bromberg resulted in an inner transformation in which they became hard as steel. They swore bloody vengeance and determined that they would radically do away with this riffraff. On the 8th, when a bullet fired from the Copernicus Secondary School hit a German army officer, Fifty pupils were executed despite the gunman having bravely surrendered himself. Five hundred imprisoned communists were shot on 9 September, with a further twenty hostages shot on Old Market Square after a further night of gunfire. On the 10th, the task force and an army motorized battalion combed a district of Schwedenhöhe, favored by insurgents, or bandits, as the task force commander called them, although the resistors had surrendered. Brandishing lurid German newspaper accounts of Bloody Sunday, he told his men to shoot anyone who even looked suspicious. The units went from door to door, driving out the inhabitants and shooting sixty men in the street as they fled. Another nine hundred were taken prisoner, 
and 120 of them, identified as hostile by ethnic German informers, were shot in a field. Those on the special wanted persons list were taken away and killed in a forest outside Bromberg. Far from protesting about these massacres, the army helped organize them and welcomed them as reprisals for crimes committed against ethnic Germans and as part of the general pacification of the city. An Einsatzgruppen report dated 14 November declared that there is no longer a Jewish problem in Bromberg, as the town is entirely free of Jews. In the course of the cleansing measures, all those Jews who did not have the foresight to flee have been eliminated. The Sicherheitspolizei, security police, known as Zippo, reported three days later that there are no longer any Polish intellectuals present in Bromberg. Fierce Polish resistance in the industrial cities of Upper Silesia, which revived memories of fierce intercommunal violence in the early 1920s, resulted in a similar pattern of hostage-taking and summary executions. Army commanders suspended the rule under which captured snipers were to be court-martialed. Instead, they were to be shot on the spot. SS Task Force 1-I arrived to contribute its own higher level of brutality. Splitting up into smaller teams, its members combed Karavitsa street by street, either killing suspected insurgents on the spot or taking them to a series of courtyards behind factories. A Boy Scout fighter, detained by ethnic Germans as he tried to flee, ended up in a mixed group of prisoners that included women and young girls. He was among forty people separated out and marched to a government building, where supposed terrorists such as he were put to one side, away from Polish soldiers with military identification papers. His group were again marched off, kicked and beaten en route, before being delivered to an ethnic German paramilitary group, which opened fire on them within a gated courtyard. The boy had the presence of mind to feign death and to lie inert under the corpses that tumbled around him. When more prisoners arrived to be shot, the boy began to shake. The killers noticed movement and shot him in the chest, arm, and back. He came round, surrounded by about a hundred dead, and slipped away despite his wounds. In that courtyard alone, 250 people were killed, while another 500 were shot into mass graves in the Karavitsa Municipal Gardens. None of these incidents prompted any protests from the regular army. 6. Bad for Morale At least one of the SS task forces was plainly not a happy ship. Subunit 3-1 was commanded by Dr. Alfred Hasselberg, a thirty-one-year-old graduate lawyer. He had already irritated his subordinates by reserving more comfortable quarters for himself in the weeks before the invasion and ordering his non-commissioned officers to perform ordinary sentry duty. He made himself more unpopular by regularly commenting that some of his troopers were unsuitable for the SS and should be shot. A large number of them began to plead sickness, usually stress-related stomach disorders. A prime cause of complaint was that Hasselberg insisted that his men should shoot people in the neck while staying away from the execution pits himself. Others complained about such sadistic practices as forcing a Jewish cantor to sing out the names of people slated for execution, and Hasselberg's mistreatment of a handsome English setter dog he had appropriated. They began to drink heavily, often smashing their glasses after each round. Although Heydrich had recommended Hasselberg as Zippo chief in Krakow, Within a few months, his staff were sniffing around in SS records in search of a mentally defective Hasselberg forebear, before the problem of his poor leadership was solved by accepting his request for transfer to the regular army. Although the overall picture was of army and SS cooperation, there were some instances of friction. In Lublinitz, the secret field police handed over nearly 200 captives to the SS security police when they left for another assignment. Before leaving, they reported their opinion that these people would be shot in defiance of Army Group South's intelligence officers who wished to hold them for questioning. A Major Rudolf Langhäuser had a row with Emanuel Schaefer, the SS task force commander, when he demanded that the prisoners be transferred to Chenstakova for safekeeping. The reason for his intervention was that eighty of the prisoners were Polish reservists, surrendered to Langhäuser by the town mayor to prevent violence erupting as the Germans entered. Langhäuser had given his word that they would be unharmed, but Schaefer referred him to orders from Himmler that insurgents should be shot, although these men had not been insurgents at all. General von Rundstedt, 
The group commander insisted on confirmation that such a directive existed. Senior police figures in Berlin reported to Army High Command that the instructions had come directly from the Führer's campaign train, and Rundstedt pursued the matter no further. All the reservists were shot. The Army also fitfully clashed with the SS task forces over the treatment of Jews, not because the Army had any moral qualms, but because SS depredations were infectious and threatened to undermine military discipline. By the end of the second week of September, SS policy had become to terrorize the Jews sufficiently to force them to flee, the intention being to drive them across the Naraf and San rivers before the German-Soviet demarcation line was consolidated. SS Hauptsturmführer Adolf Eichmann also seized the opportunity to deport some of the Reich's Jews to the same general area, under what was called the Nisko Plan, after a town across the San River. Udo von Voyersch's special task force was one of the units deputed for the task of terror and expulsion. He used flamethrowers to murder Jews in Benjin, before moving on to Peshemishal on 16 September, murdering between five and six hundred Jews within days of his arrival. Some regular soldiers joined in the shootings, but others scorned Voyersch's men, jeering that they should be fighting at the front rather than massacring old men and women. Next, Voyersch's unit moved to the Jewish quarters of towns in the Lublin area to ferret out valuables before their owners were herded eastwards. Brutal scenes followed, with SS men bursting into homes barking, Your gold or your life, while carrying out strip searches and cavity inspections of Jewish women, some of whom had their fingers smashed when they refused to surrender wedding rings. The appalled army commander at Kelm protested, and some senior officers tried to get Voyersch's men withdrawn, but others of equal seniority insisted that Voyersch was doing a vital job in crushing Polish insurgents. German soldiers were joined by Russian soldiers on the other side in shooting at the Jewish men who were obliged to ford or swim the San River, while their women and children crossed over bridges. Further north, trouble erupted between General Georg von Kuchler, commander of Third Army, and marauding SS units, intent on burning synagogues and murdering helpless and totally unthreatening Jews. A Waffen-SS, or militarized SS artillery regiment, ran amok after a member of the Reich Labor Service was shot in Govorovo, killing fifty Jews and herding the rest into a synagogue which they sprayed with petrol. At that point they were stopped by a passing army officer who insisted the survivors be released. When reports of such incidents reached Kuchler, he protested forcefully to the SS, employing words like beastly, barbaric, dishonorable, and wicked. When an SS military court handed down predictably mild sentences, Kuchler refused to confirm them in his capacity as theater commander, and ordered a second court-martial under a presiding officer he picked himself. This resulted in a visit from Himmler, who requested the process be stopped. Kuchler ignored this intervention. The proceedings were rendered moot after Hitler issued a general amnesty. There was a large element of personal animus in Kuchler's stand, for he had been a protégé of General Werner von Fritsch, victim of an SS smear campaign in February 1938, who had been killed in the front line outside Warsaw. Kuchler had delivered Fritsch's funeral oration. Yet it was this same General von Kuchler who instructed his officers in July 1940 to stop criticizing the ethnic struggle being waged in occupied Poland, specifically the treatment of the Polish minority, the Jews, and church things. In such a centuries-old conflict between races, Kuchler explained, sharp interventions were necessary. Soldiers should not intervene or criticize those organs of state and party responsible for carrying out these tasks. 7. Vestiges of Shame Unease about these atrocities in Poland was evident among the German elite. In October 1939, the conservative diplomat Ulrich von Hassel wrote in his diary of The Feeling of Being Led by Criminal Adventurers and the disgrace that has sullied the German name through the conduct of the war in Poland. Namely, the brutal use of air power and the shocking bestialities of the SS, especially towards the Jews. The cruelties of the Poles against the German minority are a fact, too, but somehow excusable psychologically. 
When people use their revolvers to shoot down a group of Jews herded into a synagogue, one is filled with shame. Another complainant was the Abwehr Supremo, Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, who had returned from Warsaw a shaken man after seeing the shattered city. He relayed the concerns of several generals about SS atrocities to Wilhelm Keitel, the head of the Wehrmacht High Command. Keitel replied that because the army had turned down such tasks, Hitler had decreed that the SS should do them. Ideally, such activities would be postponed until the army had relinquished power in Poland to civil administrators. In the meantime, while military commanders were to be kept informed about such actions, the responsible authorities were Himmler and Heydrich. The army also relinquished the right to hear appeals from SS court-martial proceedings against Polish civilians. A cryptic communication to senior field commanders from the High Command explained that the SS task forces were carrying out special projects for the Führer, which were exclusively the concern of the SS. In other words, the army was fully aware of what Hitler and the SS were doing, but sought to abdicate moral responsibility as rapidly as possible. On 4 October 1939, Hitler issued a general amnesty for any German army or SS personnel convicted of offenses against civilians in Poland. Three days later, he recognized Himmler's claim to be the Reich Commissar for the strengthening of ethnic Germandom, confirming SS responsibility for the vast processes of expulsion and repatriation that Himmler and Hitler envisaged. On 17 October, Hitler decreed that the SS and police were no longer subject to military jurisdiction when engaged in special tasks. The same day he held a conference at which Keitel represented the army, during which the Führer used broad brush strokes to outline Poland's future. An autonomous rump state was to be ruled by Germans, but without being integrated into the administration of the Reich. Unlike any other administration, the object was to retard the country culturally, economically, and financially, so that it was merely a source of cheap labor. There were to be no Polish political parties and no independent high culture. Polish model was to be encouraged. It was to become a dumping ground for Jews and Polacks from the Reich itself. Hard ethnic struggle would entail methods which will be incompatible with the principles which we otherwise adhere to. An interesting insight into Hitler's undemanding scale of values. In a parting shot to Keitel, Hitler said the army should welcome offloading the administration of Poland onto others. Chapter 5 Trampling the Remains 1. The King and Queen of Poland Although formal hostilities with Poland ended on 6 October 1939, there was an increase in violence against civilians in the lawless vacuum between the army's relinquishing of authority and the establishment of civilian administrations in the areas annexed to the Reich. Or worse, in the legal indeterminacy of the general government, which encompassed what was left. The last three months of 1939 were especially grim. October proved a bloody month for Poland's elites, as the SS task forces pressed ahead with carrying out their orders to liquidate them. In that month, Polish teachers in West Prussian towns were arrested and imprisoned in Deutsch Krona. It was not necessary to shoot many more priests, since the survivors of the initial massacre of clergy were too cowed to resist. Other shootings took place throughout the wooded lowlands of the newly created Wartegau, where the head of the forestry administration was disturbed to learn that the SS intended to kill all Polish forestry officials. In Königsberg, in early November, SS Brigadefuhrer Dr. Otto Rasch took captive Polish intellectuals out to a wood where they were shot after signing a paper saying they did not object to their relocation to the general government. A transit camp at Zoldau was also used to concentrate and kill the learned. North of Warsaw, in November, a police regiment staged a show trial of Jews for arson after which 159 Jewish men and 196 women and children were shot. Although the SS task forces did not keep the sort of precise records they would maintain after the invasion of the Soviet Union, it has been estimated that they murdered 47,000 Poles, of whom 7,000 were Polish Jews, before the year ended. Poland suffered the dual plight of having extensive territories incorporated into the German Reich, 
while a remnant homeland for Poles, and, as it transpired, a transit to eternity for millions of Jews, was created in the general government. On 15 September 1939, Hitler had summoned Hans Frank to his HQ at Gogolin in Silesia, where he appointed him head of a future Polish civil administration, initially subject to Gerd von Rundstedt, the commander of Army Group South, who would hand over to Frank on 25 October. After selecting future administrative cadres in Berlin, Frank outlined the gist of what Hitler wanted for Poland at a meeting in Posen on 3 October. The country was to be stripped of anything useful to the German war economy. Economically and culturally, Poland was to be throttled back to the bare essentials. Poland should be treated like a colony, with the Poles becoming the slaves of the greater German World Reich. Labor and plant were to be dispatched to Germany, while Poland would be an agricultural tributary, importing manufactured goods from Germany. Following a Hitler decree on 8 October 1939, the Reichsgau Posen was established in north-central Poland, encompassing far more territory than had belonged to the German-ruled part of Poland before 1918. Frank was not allowed to retain the textile city of Luj, renamed Litzmannstadt in 1940, which had been in the Russian-ruled part of Poland before the Great War. The city was handed over to Arthur Greiser, party boss of what became the Wartegau, after the river that was this flatland's principal topographical feature. Other parts of Poland were absorbed into the Reich by expanding existing East Prussia and Silesia, or in the newly forged Gau of Danzig, West Prussia, the fiefdom of Albert Forster. Severally, these territories were said to have been recovered for the Reich. They were never described as being occupied. On 12 October, Hitler decreed the creation of a new general government for the occupied Polish territories. The third clause declared that Frank was directly accountable only to Hitler. Frank divided his realm into four districts, based on the cities of Krakow, Radom, Lublin, and Warsaw with Krakow becoming his administrative capital in a further bid to nullify Polish statehood. Hitler would have preferred to erase Warsaw from the map. As it was, over 15% of the buildings were already ruined shells as a result of bombing, including 66,000 homes. The general government encompassed 37% of pre-war Poland, with around 17 million inhabitants. In August 1941, following the invasion of the Soviet Union, it acquired a fifth district, Galicia, with 300,000 people in the city of Lemberg, Lvov, and a further six million in the surrounding countryside. At its maximum extent, the general government was roughly the size of Belgium. These administrative arrangements barely hint at the moral morass they were intended to create in occupied Poland. Hitler elaborated his policy towards Poland at a key meeting on 18 October 1939, after his brief visit there had confirmed his existing...